Rounds of the 2014 European Le Mans series. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name's Simon Hill, and we will be bringing you all the action from this race, which contains three separate classes for the LMP2 categories, the cars that will be running at the front of the pack, the fastest cars in qualifying. Then we have two GT classes, the LMG, LMP GT E class and the LMG GTC class, uh, basically cars that would run in what you would be familiar with as GT2 in the case of GTE. So there's the cars you would have sun, run and seen running as GT cars at the Le Mans 24 hours, for example. And then the cars that you will see part of the GTC category, which are cars that effectively are GT3 uh, cars. So three different classes, three very, very closely competing classes as well in terms of the lap times and the points position coming into this fourth of fifth <laughs> rounds of the championship you see drivers and team members uh, taking in the beautiful sunshine it's up to just over 27 degrees in terms of the air temperature on the left you just saw the uh, alpine team drivers of uh, oliver webb and also of uh, nelson pantiatici who are sitting there ready to go and they currently lead the championship so you detect Alpine, as do uh, Nelson Panchatici and uh, Oliver Webb, plus uh, Paul Chatin as well. As uh, team members, uh, just uh, consulting one another and discussing the various different permutations that we have of drivers and teams. And as you can see, the temperatures have got up uh, 22 degrees, uh, 25 degrees track. Um, so roughly similar conditions to those that we saw in free practice on Saturday but uh, a little bit warmer than we saw for qualifying and qualifying was uh, an impressive performance for the Murphy prototypes team for um, Nathaniel Berton the GP2 driver who has been running with this team for part of the season this year and Berton put in a lap time 147.8 which was significantly faster than anything we'd seen all weekend a really outstanding lap i spoke to him briefly after qualifying he said the car's working brilliantly i hooked up a good lap i got a clear run and i made the most of the tires that we were running uh, so he's very very confident but it won't be berton who starts the car on the right you can see the pole position uh of board being uh, displayed by the young lady there on the grid and that pole position uh will be taken by Pipo Durrani, there's Nelson Panciatici, currently leads the Drivers' Championship with his compatriot uh, Pulep Chatin and with also Britain's Oliver Webb. That is the pole position car and uh, just close to the shot there you can see the guy in the red cap is Rodolfo Gonzalez who is one of the three drivers that will be taking part in the number 48 car and it will be very very interesting to see what Murphy prototypes can do. They've had a, a very uh, prestigious roster of drivers and we're going to get a chance to get a little bit of a flavour of Paul Ricard in just a moment. outside of Marseille, uh, around about 100 k's from Marseille, uh, absolutely uh, classic circuit, been part of the motorsport environment since 1970 and of course held Formula One events from 1971 right the way up until 1990, some 
truly awesome races have taken place at this uh, fabulous circuit. And it's got a number of the original characteristics. A couple of the circuit uh, layouts have changed. There's an infinite variety of layouts that can be run here. And, of course, it's still very much part of the World Championship uh, program for a number of, uh, of top-line race series and, and uh, race drivers. Uh, Gregoire de Moustier, we can see on board the ART entered McLaren. He will be starting the GTC category from second in class and uh, a total of 22nd overall. See the ART engineers looking at the data and working out various different bits of information that they're going to need. The 71 car that we see there, Kirill Ladigin, part of the SMP racing, a Russian Bears as it was known for a long time. And what an outstanding contribution to motorsport the SMP organisation have made. We've seen not just a number of Russian drivers uh, come into top-line motorsport as a result of their involvement and their uh, support, but also um, some other drivers that are very well known to the world of motorsport have uh, flourished and continued their careers. They're drivers like Mika Salo, for example, and of course Andrea Bertolini, who has been absolutely outstanding with the S&P racing team for this year. Speaking of Bertolini, this is the car that he put on pole position. And uh, that, as you can see, will be started by Sergei Zlobin and uh, we'll also be sharing that with Viktor Scheiter. And Scheiter has been one of those drivers that has really made a massive impression on the European Le Mans series and the international level because very uh, little was known about his background. He'd been racing uh, in uh, on home soil and various other little ser series that had uh, developed him into uh, getting the experience and then made a big bang and a big impression and has been very, very impressive, lapping uh, within a second of the uh, outstanding performances that we've seen by Andrea Bertolini. So speaking of Russians, uh, Mark Shulzitsky came to motorsport, a very different route to the SMP drivers, was one of the drivers to win the PlayStation GT Academy a couple of years ago, winning the uh, Russian element of that and has been promoted through the ranks of racing in GT cars into racing prototypes and Shulzitsky will be sharing the car with British driver Luciano Bacchetta, former FIA Formula 2 champion, as we look at the unique, to this race anyway, uh, Ligier prototype. Uh, Ludovic Badet will be in that car, and it will be started uh, this time for this particular race by uh, Pierre Thierrier. So we have a total of 10 of the LMP2 cars that will compete here the grid takes us to 37 cars uh, the highest uh, number of which are the GTC category cars here is the championship leader for the LMP2 class and Paul Loup Chatin helping his co-driver Oliver Webb get himself strapped in Webb of course uh, familiar to British fans of having started his racing in uh, Formula Renault in the UK Formula BMW before that and then racing across the globe into the States and also raced in uh, things like Formula 3 and World Series by Renault. Uh, very, very quick, very talented driver. And no doubt that Ollie Webb will be right in the mix of uh, the f early part of the race, starting fifth on the grid. And the championship battle for the LMP2 class really goes between the two cars that uh, we're going to be focusing on, which are on the front row of the grid is a Jota Sport car a number 38 car which of course was victorious at Le Mans in the LMP2 class and that will be started by Harry Tinknell a young man from Exeter as we look at Michel Frey on board the uh, racing performance car going back to take a look at some of the uh, supporters of the Murphy prototypes team spoke to Greg Murphy a little bit earlier on and uh, really a very enthusiastic and passionate team um, Hertz supporting the car and uh, looking like they will be um, enjoying the first part of this race, starting from pole position. Durrani, I think, feeling the pressure a little bit, but uh, he to be able to take it and deal with it quite carefully. Pierre Rags will start on board the car that was fastest in free practice no, two yesterday. Johnny Molan wanders past there. Uh, he will be 
sharing a car with uh, young Matt McMurray. We'll talk about them a little bit later on. But this is the new blood by Moran Racing and has uh, been qualified and, and put very, very high up on the grid by uh, Christian Klein. The Austrian driver, of course, familiar from being Red Bull Formula One driver and uh, race for HRT as well. So, uh, Christian, no stranger to sports car racing either, having raced in uh, as part of the factory Peugeot team for three seasons. Can be very, very competitive in that, of course, moving across to prototypes and has been right on the pace in the Moran team. And it, as I said, you'll share with uh, Gary Hirsch as well as Pierre Rags. Now, the grid's starting to be cleared in anticipation for the race start, which will take place in just under 10 minutes' time here at Paul Ricard. Spectators enjoying the sunshine. A really fabulous initiative by the organisers to make the entry to, to the races here free of charge. And uh, that means that we've got a much bigger attendance then we'll see at some race meetings that get held around the world. And uh, Durrani, well, just 20 years old still. Remember the young Brazilian you'd be familiar with from British Formula 3. It's probably where he's best known. Was on the podium at uh, Macau last year in Formula 3. And anybody who can do that has obviously clearly got an awful lot of talent. He's been working on getting a deal together to try and get out with Murphy prototypes for a little while. Finally has come together in time for us here at Paul Ricard. And it may well be that we see Pipo in the car for the final round of the championship next month at uh, Estoril. And that is going to be a nail-biter. And I know certainly I was talking to uh, talking to Philippe Albuquerque a little bit earlier, who, of course, will share the Jota Sport car with Harry Tinkle and Simon Dolan. And the home ground for him, of course, for the final round. And it could well be that Jota Sport are still very much in with a shout of the championship. Just four points between... The Alpine team and Jota Sport, 50 points for Alpine Sport, 46 for Jota Sport. There is Tinknell, has made such an impressive transition to sports car racing, having been part of the British Formula 3 Championship for the and European Formula 3, for that matter, for the past few years. A race winner in those series previously, a champion in the Graduate Cup in Formula Renault in the UK and raced in the main series as well, uh, with great success with CRS Racing. His dad, Mark, his mum, Carol, always big supporters of his racing. And the BRDC member is a very, very strong driver. So let's have a little look and see where we are in terms of the championship position to P2. As you can see, it's Panchatici, Webb and Shatan all in the Alpine car on 50 points out of Albuquerque, Tinkle and Dolan. Then a further seven points behind Mayor and Frey in the race performance car ahead of Badet, Thierry and Gomendi. And then further down the order, you can see some of the other drivers who, some of whom have not competed in the full championship drivers like uh, James Littlejohn, a friend of mine, who I was uh, pleased to see him racing one of these things at the start of the year. And uh, Christian, Chris, uh, Luciano Bacchetta, or others, he said, nearly said uh, Cristiano for some reason. <laughs> that got me confused. And uh, Luciano, who's been here um, for the last couple of races. So Cameron and Griffin lead Bertolini, Zlobin and Scheitar. And then Rigolo, a further four points behind ahead of Dan McKenzie and George Richardson in a G JMW car. And a much bigger and more varied selection of drivers throughout the order, as you can see. Uh, from lots of different nationalities as well. And on to the GTC category. Well, as with the others, equally very, very close. Ladigan, Markozov and Beretta lead the championship, the SMP car, ahead of the Formula car of Larson and Mikkel Mack. So uh, that's going to be very interesting to see how that one plays out. The pole position for GTC has been taken by uh, the car that Carol Ladigan will be sharing and uh, it will be very interesting to see uh, the Ladigan, Basov and Persiani car what they're able to do, Persiani set the time in that car so we're almost ready to go racing of course as with most forms of sports car racing it will be a rolling start it's going to be a four hour race as you know and it's going to be uh, a mixture of uh, drivers using the strategies to double or possibly even triple stint and that means uh, in terms of how many times they are stopping for fuel uh, before they actually make a driver change most of the teams electing 
probably not to change tyres during the race, the simple reason being, or certainly only once during the race, uh, and the simple reason being is that the setup in terms of changing tyres is that you will come in and make the fuel stop, and then once the fueling is finished, then they can do the drive ch the tyre change rather. So there can be quite an additional amount of time between 20 and 25 seconds, depending on how good the crew are. The gaining performance can sometimes be balanced out, sometimes not. So as we come through, you can see there the uh, golf racing Porsche that uh, will be started in this particular section of the race by Ben Barker, the uh, very tall Englishman who, of course, those of you who follow the Porsche Super Cup will know has been racing in that category for the last couple of years. Was on the podium at the start of the year in the opening round. So let's have a look at the grid. And the first row of the grid is the Murphy Prototypes Cup, Pippa Durrani and Pierre Rags ahead of Tinknell, uh, sorry, ahead Tinknell and then Frey. And then Webb and Peak on row three, ahead of Thierry and Schulzitzky, Lightweiler for Pegasus and McMurray in the Greaves Motorsport car. First, the GTN goes lobbing, and then further down, Cameron Park and Lions, McKenzie, Malagon, Kevin Arta, Bartes, yes, that Fabian Bartes, the world famous World Cup winning Grand Prix, uh, World Cup winning uh, footballer, Makitsky. Further down the order, Vanille, Merlin, Lawson, and Gonzalez, ahead of Ladigan, Rasmussen, Cordoni, and Gibbon. That will round out the grid just ahead of Roald Gotha. Uh, problems for the golf racing team, meaning that they miss most of the uh, Saturday time after some dramas. So hopefully they will have everything running well for the race today. So the tyres already relatively warm when they came out of the uh, tyre stacks. And the tyres are heated up in uh, what looks like effectively a, a great big kind of cupboard that they have heat being blown through, so it's not like the tyre warmers where they have blankets wrapped around them and then heated up. Different way of doing it, but it does put quite a lot of heat in it. But obviously, once they go to the grid, that heat starts to disperse and there's a, a lot of frantic weaving going on. Come down in the long Mistral straight and into Sim. Fast right-hander at the end here. Last of the prototypes there, that is Matt McMurray. He's just 16 years old, is Matt McMurray. His father, Chris, has been racing in sports car racing in the US for a long time and has been good friends with Johnny Milam. And Johnny, of course, is pairing with Matt this weekend. We've seen some really, really strong drivers in that car over the year. And these guys will be doing a fabulous job as well, I'm sure. And further down the order, as you can see, the mixture of Porsches and Ferraris and McLarens in the GTC category. And then right at the very back, you'll see a GTE Aston just coming through there of Roald Gotha. Uh, one of those uh, drivers who's absolutely passionate about his motorsport has the largest collection of golf liveried racing cars um, in the world, I believe. A mixture of Golf Mirages, uh, Golf 917. Golf Astons, uh, including, uh, of course, the Le Mans winning car from uh, the GT days. So now the drivers will be jockeying for position just before the start. Pippo Durrani and Harry Tinkle on the front row. Pierre Rags and Michel Frey on the second row. Oli Webb, Artyar Pick, who we haven't had a chance to talk about. Yes, Arthur Pick of GP2 fame. His first race weekend with Sebastian Leb racing. They're all starting to line up. There's a gap, as you can see, between the prototypes and the GTE cars. Then there'll be a gap back to the GTC cars. Let's watch the lights go green. And we are racing at Port Ricard for the four hours of the ALMS. It's a great start by Durrani. There's lots of jostling for position going on behind it. It's contact. Matt McMurray is put into the wall right at the start of the race. Some damage to the front of the car. I don't think it's too serious, fortunately, for Matt. Hopefully not anyway. <laughs> Certainly sent the uh, marshals and photographers scattering. Let's hope everybody's OK. Didn't look like any um, debris flew over the wall, but it's Durrani from Tingnall from 
Ah, Pierre Rags. And I think Michel Frey still in fourth position. No, up into fourth has come Ollie Webb. And ahead of me here, Michel Frey. There we go at the end of sector one. You see that's the situation. The top six, the low racing car, the number six car. That is up to your pick. And then Thierry Brees, Pegasus. And then we go into... Mikhail Bronozewski for Kessel Racing. He was leading the GTL cat GTE category. Going further down the order. Leader for GTC's Kirill Adigan. There's a challenge there from Oli Webb or Pierre Rags. And now a challenge for the leaders. Tinkler already starting to put pressure on Durrani. I think the mission from Tinkler's point of view is to get past Durrani so that he can potentially try to pull away and put a gap between him and the Alpine of Oliver Webb because they are the two teams at the top of the championship for this category. Meanwhile, further down, it's Bronozewski's Lobin and Barker that are the top three as we finish lap one. And then McMurray has stopped the car, so huge frustration for Matt McMurray, the young man from America. Being turned round by the looks of things on the run down to the first corner, clattering into the wall and picking up obviously a significant enough amount of damage that he felt it necessary to stop the car. But now Durrani's starting to look like he's getting into a little bit more of a rhythm. Tignall much more familiar with these cars. So it's the Orica chassis, the 03R Nissan engine, as most of the cars in this category are. People are running leading down the long strip, being charged after by Harry Team. Of course, these guys will have raced against each other in Formula 3. But Murray is still in the car on the left of our shot, as we saw it just at the end of the Mistral Straight. Yellow flags being waved just to warn the drivers of that. Great run by Tinkle, got a lot more momentum through the senior curve there. Good defending from Durrani just to keep the man from Exeter behind. But that's allowed Pierre Rags to get a bit closer. And this is going to be interesting to see whether Durrani takes a bit too much out of his tyres in this early part of the race. Just working so hard to keep Tinknell behind. But he's clearly very determined to try and have go at the earliest opportunity Oliver Webb sets the fastest first sector Michelle Frey the fastest second sector as the Murphy prototypes guys watch on with interest I saw Rodolfo Gonzalez in the middle of the garage there looking calmly on at his uh, co-driver the third driver of course being Nathaniel Berton who qualified the car on pole position Further down the order, it's now Ben Barker who's taken the lead in the GTE category. So in his uh, run in the Gulf Racing Porsche, it's a great performance by Ben. GTC meanwhile is led by Maurizio Mediani, head of Gregoire de Moustier and uh, Liam Akitsky in the BMW in third in the class. So interesting again, see whether again Tinknell can get more momentum through the right hand here. Certainly that's what he did the last couple of laps. And again, he just takes a lot of time out of Durrani, gets to the outside. He's going to try and make this one stick. That could be an inspired move. He can do that. Got to be careful not to risk running out of road. Be interesting to see what the team will be telling Tinknell. Are they asking him to push and get past? Or are they saying, stay where you are, be calm? It's a very, very long race, obviously, from their point of view. So clearly they don't want to be putting the car at any sort of risk. Is that a bit of a lock-up there? 
perhaps some, possibly just a bit of uh, smoke coming from the exhaust on the overrun as the car changed down the top five and four now with Durrani now sets fastest lap of the race on 51.229 at a tenth of a second faster than Tink oh. Pipo has got into the groove nicely and is not uh, struggling at all to maintain that pace. A couple of places on the lap, as we've already seen, where Tinknell is arguably a little bit quicker. Certainly, uh, sector one through here is the, uh, Tinknell's been fastest of anyone in the 33.4. Second sector, that is. Durrani now sets fastest sector nine, but Tinknell matches it. And this is where it's going to be interesting. If Tinknell can stay in the toe a little bit longer, then perhaps he might be in a position to use where he finds the time through that right hander. There's definitely a place where he clearly carries a bit more speed through. Now, McMurray's car has disappeared. Does that mean that he's got it back to the pits, or does it mean that it's been recovered to a place of safety? very good through that second part of the uh, corner running through into Sainz as they come into the last few of the 14 turns here at Paul Ricard. Definitely seems to be seesawing between the two of them. Durrani now sets the fastest sector two as well. I think this could be another fastest lap for Pippo Durrani. Watch to see with interest what he does lap times was. Yeah, he does. 150.614 for Girardi, 150.643. Now here is a replay of an overtake going further back down the order. As you see, the 54 car coming through. That's uh, Michael Lyons getting past uh, Zlobin and then a big, big lock-up from Zlobin. I hope it was a lock-up. I hope it wasn't an engine-related drama at this early stage in the race. out between the, the order of the, the first group of cars for the LMP2 cars. So have a look at the start. Let's see if we can work out what happened to Murray. Well, it, it didn't look like he actually got contact. It looked like it just turned sharp left on him like he had some sort of a problem now we saw him have a spin in qualifying which uh, i spoke to johnny molem his co-driver about it he said he thinks maybe he just got caught out as a 71 car now that's our pole car from uh, the gta class that's the car that kirill ladigan is driving out contact there with him in the 80 car that's uh, currently being driven Zevsky in the 80 car. Just trying to check and find out who was actually starting that car. That car was leading for a moment now. That's interesting to see what happened there. Hopefully we get a replay and see if we can work out whether Zevsky moved down or whether it was the other way around. 10 minutes completed. The gap now up to just over half a second. But then again, looked like um, Tinkler took a bit of time out of Durrani into turn one. Meanwhile, the Tyrion car starting to put a bit of pressure on Hard to pick. As we watch our championship leader, Oli Webb, coming through the infield section at the early part of the lap. Durrani, though, the young Brazilian looking incredibly uh, assured at the head of the pack. And there you can see all the gaps uh, been pretty much constant at half a second. Now, whilst it's nothing significant that they can do in terms of relaxing about the gap they've got for the Murphy prototype team, the fact that they have been able to maintain a, a lead ahead of Tinkle is impressive. Now, in comes Mac Michel Freda. That's a very early stop. And it looked to me like it was just one tyre being changed, perhaps. 
which is most unusual. That's clearly must be because of some kind of a punch or a problem with some sort of a tyre cut or something like that. And the low racing car, the Wattyol Pick, fighting hard with the 46 car of Tyria because they were uh, the team were champions in the European Le Mans series. Go back in, in back to 2012 and we're looking very good for a possible win at Le Mans in class this year. But as the race started to unfold, it was apparent that Harry Tinkle in the Jota car was on an absolute mission and managed to get themselves into the lead. Uh, a tenth slower than Durrani on the overall lap time. Meanwhile, further down the order, looking at uh, who's doing what in terms of lap times and position. It's um, a British one-two at the moment, Barker and Lyons in the GTE class. And in GTC, it's Mediani and De Moustier, ahead of uh, Kiro and Anton Ladigin. Car that's got a bit of momentum there. That is Mark Schulzitzki who is putting pressure now on the Tyrie car. He's got momentum. He's trying to go the long way round into senior at the end of the straight. I don't know if that's going to be doable. If he does it, that's a very impressive move. Of course, announcements relating to GT3 coming. Oh, contact there. That, that is the Formula Racing car. That's the the Danish entered car that we've seen uh, Jan Magnussen amongst others driving and been very successful in thus far this year so that was a pretty dramatic moment now seems to have got our way with it unscathed which is the most important thing and that's Johnny Lawson on board that car I've seen Johnny Racing not just in this series but also things like GT Open with Ken Magnussen last year. So uh, clearly enjoying racing as a combination of Danes on board that car. With Michael Mack, the other driver, of course, who's been racing previously in the uh, Maserati Super Trofeo with success, winning here, in fact, at Paul Ricard last year in one uh, of the races. So as we get into the first 15 minutes competed, Durrani leads still less than a second over Tinkle. It's sort of seesawed between half a second up to a second. Still nothing to speak of in terms of overall lap times. It's about three tenths of a second quicker. As Durrani now says another fastest sector two. Still leading Tinkle, Rags, Webb, Pick, Trier, Shazitsky. And here's your top seven now. There's a couple of the other P2 cars. We saw Michel Frey come in, and we saw the problem we had with Matt McMurray right on the very first lap of the race. But Nicholas Leitweiler as well in the 29 car. He's been in. Now, I think that may have been because there was a technical infringement in free practice that was highlighted to do with engine seals not being in place or been in the, of the, tr the correct ilk and it basically meant that the regulations state that you have to have a, a stop and go as in comes the race performance car again I think that was the race performance car of uh, Michael Frey let's get a chance to see what the problem is take a really good solid last section of the lap there took a good six tenths to Rani. I think must have made a mistake somewhere on that that because he was uh, quite a bit slower by over a second on that uh, last sector I think he might have had a, maybe a bit of a lock up or something and it does look like Tink Tinkle's right back in it again there's a 
come down the back straight and see whether Tinknell can get enough momentum to get himself in that position that he's he's done a couple of times before where he's so quick through the right hander at the end of the straight carries that speed through so well well that is the uh, GTE class leader just gone through first and second that was Barker leading in the Gulf Porsche ahead of um, Michael Arns out comes the Team Russia by Barwell BMW Z4 the GTC car Such a little bit more contact in the middle there. That was between one of the IMSA Matma Performance Porsches and that uh, number 80 Ferrari that we saw had that problem a little bit earlier on. Mikhail Bronaszewski, the Polish driver, who's another driver who raced in the International GT Open with success. And he, of course, um, won the GTS category with uh, Philip Pater. Super GT category for the last few years. Riley, meanwhile, another fastest uh, sector two. 28.8 seconds last time through. As, look at this, three abreast as they come down the back straight. That's a, a very interesting dynamic as they break towards the right hander, and it is a requiring a break. It's a JMW car that's been uh, started by Dan McKenzie, Daniel McKenzie, who's raced last year for the Aston Martin team, previously raced in uh, World Series by Renault Formula 2, European Formula Renault's very, very talented young man. His father Ian's here supporting him as always. And uh, no doubt that as a combination of GM JMW drivers work very very well together George Richardson another young driver who is part of the team very very strong this is getting a bit frantic amongst all the various different traffic in the middle of the race there in the middle of the, the pack rather and it does mean that Tinknell has been able to Use the traffic to his advantage and jump. Pipo Durrani and get himself into the lead. A bit of a lock up there as he comes up behind the 92 Ombra car. Potentially causing him a few problems. But it is a change as you can see. Jota Sport have got what they've been working towards for the first 20 minutes of this race. And got themselves into the lead. One of the interesting comments I had from a couple of the drivers after practice was just how much uh, how dirty the circuit is offline, how they figure it's going to be a real factor as the race unfolds, as more and more rubber starts to go down. But Tinknell's not really getting away from Durrani. He's managed to get that gap, uh, get himself ahead rather, but not get much of a gap. Durrani, if anything, has come back at him as we look at the 85 Delaney golfer. Golf car, Rod Gotha starting the car, sharing with Stuart Hall and Daniel Brown. <laughs> Meanwhile, Gregoire de Moustier, second in class in the GTC, starting to put a little bit of pressure on Maurizio Mediani. 57 Ferrari, the SMP racing car he shares with Boris Rotenberg and Mika Salo. There is that 57 car. We go back to the action with the LMP2 cars. And just as the 28 car goes around a spinner, then I think that was. Possibly the Loeb car. I think that's hard to pick that went round. Couldn't quite see it. Certainly looked like that car. We'll get a chance to see either a replay or get an overview of where everybody is. And that will highlight exactly what, uh, which of the cars has gone round there. But I'm pretty sure because it was in the middle of that scrap just ahead. 
of the, uh, the 24, uh, 28 car rather. But it is still Tinknell leading now by just 0.8 of a second. We crossed the line. Again, this is where it starts to get quite challenging for the all the various drivers, the prototype cars, of course, lapping, although they're lapping faster in terms of overall lap times, they do tend to have um, some trouble overtaking the quicker of the LMGTE cars, as you see Durrani there, lap with the soft rev Ferraris. Yeah, looking down the order, you can see that Pick seems to have disappeared down the order, so I'm pretty certain it was him. And that'd be frustration. And another one like uh, Pippo Durrani, top line single seater driver, moving across into prototypes. Perhaps sees that as a longer term career goal. leader. You know, Le Mans winning combination of uh, Tinknock who normally shares with Albert Kirk and of course with uh, Simon Dolan. It's Tinknock and Dolan who shared with Oliver Turvey at Le Mans. Was due to be Mark Genet because Philippe Albert Kirk was driving with um, Audi Sport in one of the three prototype diesel cars that they were running. Sadly for Albert Kirk the car didn't get to complete much distance overall because uh, uh, an accident in the pouring rain took out the Marco Bonanomi was in the car at the time totally not his fault but kind of had to be retired unfortunately so for Albuquerque Bonanomi and for Britain's Oliver Jarvis a frustrating end to their Le Mans 24 hours especially when you see how much the race changed in the latter part of proceedings it became pretty obvious that uh so we got uh, we got down in the pit lane we have Philippe Albuquerque and uh, Karin is going to catch up with the Portuguese driver now yeah that's right but I'm not speaking in Portuguese right now huh? uh, so it's a great great battle between uh, your team and uh, think help and uh, the second one 40 the car 48 right yeah, it's true. It's, uh, we have been watching a great fight for the lead. Uh, I'm a bit more nervous, of course, but uh, Perry did a good job now on the traffic and managed to go to P1. And now it's important to get uh, a big gap, for, especially for the Alpine car that is uh, on the back. And um, it's on a good way now. Thank you, Felipe Albuquerque. Yeah, and just in the background there is Simon Dolan, the third of the drivers. And the man that's been such an impressive uh, improver I suppose from when he very first started racing in LMP2s was sharing with uh, Sam Hancock was his uh, his good friend and the man who helped develop his experience working with Sam Hignett who of course is the team principal of Jota Sport and Sam Hignett and done as you see the JMW car having a little look McKenzie on the inside of the 72 car putting a little bit of pressure on and uh, Always a difficult situation in the race because you need to try and establish yourself there. So there's a little bit of contact on the IMSA Racing Porsche just further back of Narak. But Zlobin not wanting to uh, understandably give any space to McKenzie. And McKenzie is getting a little bit frustrated. I think he's concerned that Raman Narak may well come back at him. Narak, such an experienced driver, of course, a former class winner at Le Mans. And, uh, of course, uh, the team winning recently at Le Mans as well. Now, let's have a look at what's gone on here. Some contact here in the middle of the pack. The 94 Ferrari and the 67 Porsche getting into each other. The software of car, the 58 car, travelling very, very slowly. And that 58 car is clearly not going to go much further at the moment. The AT racing car of Alexander Telkinista and Pierre Kaffer. 
if we can work out what the, the problem is of Fabian Bartes, sorry, in the 58 car and Pierre Kaffer in the other car that we saw a little bit earlier, one of the RSRs as well, getting caught up in that contact and getting pitched around the Pro GT car. I think that was uh, going on with the, that contact. So I think we may have a bit of info from Karin as to what's happening with Fabian Bartes' car. Hopefully we'll hear from Corinne in just a moment, but uh, I think she's been speaking to the team and uh, trying to find out exactly what the problem is. Bartes was travelling very slowly in the 58 soft rev car as, as Harry Ticknell continues his charge through the traffic. One of the big challenges of endurance racing is the class uh, categories all run at different paces. And one of the extra big challenges for the LMP2 cars is that in terms of top speed, some of the GTE cars and the LMP cars actually don't run that dissimilar type of pace. And obviously with the LMP cars having a much stronger aerodynamic package. So down in the uh, pit lane we have uh, Karina going to talk to Jerome Polycom. Exactly, of course. Uh, Jerome, what happened with the car of uh, uh, 50, 58? Uh, it seems it's a uh, gearbox failure. So. Uh it start to it start to jump. Second gear start to jump, and uh, he heard the noise, so he have to park the car. So it's over now. It's over. Yeah, yeah, it's finished. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, so great frustration in the first uh, half hour of the race here at Paul Ricard, Jerome Policon, a very, very talented driver himself, of course, racing in uh, Formula Two, Formula Three in the 90s and uh, <laughs> racing up until very recently still involved of course very much with the team the Sofrev team and Fabian Bartes has made a fabulous transition from uh, being a World Cup winner in football and a Champions League contender and a championship winner in the Premiership in the UK to being a top line racing driver right in the mix in the French GT Championship and uh, Bartes well Clearly, nothing much he can do. A gearbox issue, putting them out at this early stage. And that's also a great frustration for Soyel Ayari, who shares that car, the hugely talented driver who had been racing in F3000 and F3, amongst other things, and, of course, uh, a sports car champion himself in uh, International GT Open. Uh, pole sitter at the moment in LMP2, Soyel Ayari, back in 2011 in the Signatech team. Sharon with Frank Mayer and of course with uh, Lucas Ordonez. So the JMW car of Daniel McKenzie continues to battle hard for fourth position with Raymond Narak a little bit further up the road. His Mirko Venturi has been called into the car that's been shared with Pierre Kaffer and Alexander Talkanista. Last minute, didn't even get to drive the car and qualify. There is Bartes. Well, a very familiar face. He's actually part of the, he's literally the poster boy of this particular event. Uh, so well known and such a popular figure in France. Uh, that, uh, that mixture of, uh, of being a star in football and of, in, of course now in motorsport has meant that by putting his picture on all the posters, promoting the event, there's been a lot of people who've come down to try and get a glimpse of their uh, national hero they have here. And uh, a thoroughly decent bloke as well. Look very settled through that right hand there, the back of the car hopping around. Pierre Thierry having to ha hang on to that car very, very gamely. Certainly not an easy thing to drive. Meanwhile, the JMW car did that run just wide. Did McKenzie just run wide? Yes, I think so. I think that Narak has got past. Now, did he jump or was he pushed? Is the question. In other words, was there some contact that maybe pushed uh, McKenzie out of the way? Meanwhile, look at this. This is a, an interesting. Uh, dynamic as Ollie Webb is getting caught up in the mix with the IMSA car in the Signatech Alpine car. Now side by side getting back past the Thierry car. Great scrap going on. Between those two drivers there, that could have gone easy either way, couldn't it? Jada Sport now lead by over three and a half seconds. There's a, a lock up there for the fifth place Thierry by TDS Racing car.
Sebastian Loeb racing the seventh position car. Now that was a, a big lock up there. It's unusual. It looked like it was coming from one of the rear tyres as well, which is uh, not that common. So I wonder if there had been a problem there. Just see the second and third place cars overall. You know, is that a change? I was just wondering if that was a change of the lead there, whether Venturi had got himself past Barker. If Barker got a problem maybe? Couldn't quite see which of the cars that was going past. Oh, sorry, it was uh, not Parker, was it? It's Gotha, of course, in the other of the uh, golf cars. My apologies. And uh, apologies to uh, anyone who's a Ben, ben Parker fan. I know his mum, Caroline, is doubtlessly watching with enthusiasm, and she does a very, very fine driver herself. Clearly in the genes for Ben, who's uh, still only racing in the um, Porsche Super Cup, taking podiums this year, but also last year and previously runner-up in the Porsche Carrera Cup Great Britain having also raced in Australia in Formula 3 and in also uh, the Carrera Cup Australia and this year took victory overall in the opening round of Porsche Carrera Cup Great Britain and at Le Mans in the Carrera Cup Great Britain as uh, guest drivers both times but always um, very competitive is Ben whatever he does and we will see whether he's able to bring that car in in the lead of the GTE class, so it's uh, Barker, Lyons and Venturi still leading with Narak now ahead of McKenzie in the GTE, but we are focusing once again on the battle between the Signatech Alpine and that wonderful livery that's become, uh, well, it's been great to see back in the uh, world of top-line motorsport, of course. Came in with a bang last year and won this championship on their debut. Panciatici, Webb and Chatan right uh, in the mix this year as they were last year could be on for a double championship success but I know that the team that are based down in a little place called Frant in Kent in the Jota Sport they will be very very keen to uh, do something about that to try and top off their Le Mans winning year with a European Le Mans series victory in the team's category as well and with that could quite likely be drivers champions as well for Albuquerque, Tinknell and Dolan. What a story that would be if they were able to do that. But this team, so experienced. Such a fabulous uh, set of people. Signature and Signatech, of course, very much part of the same organisation. And there's no doubt uh, it will be fighting right to the end now. A nice little Porsche battle between the number 93 and the 75 cars, Eric Dermont in the 93 and Gilles Vanillet in the 75 car and they of course both fighting in the um, GTC category the Pro GT by Almeres car which is the car of Diamond, Lasser and Pereira that's the 93 car as we look at the 57 car of Maurizio Mediani pushing very very hard to close down now on Duncan Cameron for fifth place in class and as we see one of the McLarens a little bit further than that I think is Demoustier in the 98 car if I'm not mistaken yes it is because it's uh, Ricardo Gonzalez in the 99 car let's look at the recovering uh, peak Michbeel. now again this is this has happened a few laps for the TDS by uh, Thierry car that has been driven currently by Pierre Thierry that Ligier clearly not liking that particular section of the lap for some reason. Locking that right rear, as you can see, Michel Frey trying to get back into the fray, as it were. Way down the order after a very early pit stop. He's been shown as a 35th position overall. And uh, the two cars that have retired, you know, of course, Fabian Barthes with the gearbox issue that we heard from Jerome Policon. And of course, young Matt McMurray not even completing a lap after that co uh, collision with the wall at turn one. A great shame for Johnny Molum. Um, Johnny, of course, was due to take over and come and uh, join in the party. I think the plan had been to for Matt to do the first hour of the race and then, or the first stint rather, and then come in and swap. Johnny would have done a uh, a double stint and then Matt would have finished. That was the conversation I'd had with Johnny. The evergreen Johnny Molum, the former winner at the at Daytona and at Sebring, of course. 
in GT cars and uh, has been part of the professional sports car scene now for many, many years, racing at the very highest level in both prototypes and in GT cars in the UK and in the States. Joda Sport lead by 3.7 seconds ahead of the new blood car. Then Signatech, Thierry and Greaves round out our top six. So no doubt that um, that battle will continue as the driver changes come on. And we're going to be looking to see driver changes potentially happening in within the next sort of 20 minutes or so. Because uh, obviously it's going to be, uh, sorry, you're certainly going to see pit stops rather within the next 20 minutes whether there'll be driver changes or not is questionable it's going to depend on the team as Durrani now lapping the 29 car of uh, further down the order rather of um, Leutweiler who had that stop earlier now I think it was a two minute stop and go that was uh, was put in basically as part of a, uh, a penalty if you like which was to do with um, engine seals not being being in place for that particular car um, and therefore obviously there's uh, issues there in terms of actually getting um, getting that car running without uh, there being any potential questions over its performance Durrani goes through our shots um, 3.8 seconds uh, behind Harry Tinknell Knight Violet sharing with uh, Shell and Coleman. And that car going to have a lot of work to do to run get himself. So a lock up there, big lock up there for the, the 29 car. Not working very well in terms of being able to get the car stopped slowly now. A signal there from Knight Violet to the 43 car on Wags to give him a bit of notice that he's aware that he's there. Very gentlemanly piece of driving, which is great to see. Doesn't always happen, unfortunately, in motorsport. The Pegasus team there, Morgan Nissen, um, run by the German team. Difficult to tell whether the car's working well or not when they're that far out of sequence with everybody. One thing's for sure, though, if we look at what's going on with our other battlers is that Tinknell, Durrani and Rags have definitely got the first three places quite comfortably sorted at the moment. Tinknell now leading by 4.2 seconds and I wonder if perhaps Pippa Durrani, there is Pippa Durrani coming through the shop, has been given the call on the radio just to keep it nice and smooth and calm and not worry too much about what Tinknell's going to do because this early stage in the race with Albuquerque and Dolan to still get back get on board that car and also with Gonzalez of course and um, with uh, Bertrand getting in their respective car there is our GTE leader this is Ben Barker we talked about him a little bit earlier they've made some changes to the car they were discussing things like uh, the settings on the traction control to try and make the car as balanced and easy to drive as possible for uh, the three drivers across the board Carol and Barker, of course, well, of the highest order. They're both experienced guys that uh, lap at a very similar pace. Adam Carroll, the former A1GP champion from 2009 for A1GP Team Ireland. There is what it looks like. It's uh, Gulf Racing leading AF Corsa by just over 10 seconds now. And that AF Corsa car, of, of course, is uh, Michael Lyons, the young Englishman who's uh, been such a superstar in historic and classic racing, racing to success and taking the uh, Gephardt Group C car to success, the Momo sponsored car just uh, the other week. He's also been racing course in the Formula 5000 and uh, Parabred F1 taking a win at Monaco this year did Michael Meadows, um, Michael Meadows, Michael Lyons, <laughs> Michael Meadows of course another driver races in the Porsche Carrera Cup. So we have Karim down in the pit lane and uh, she's going to give us a little bit more of an update of what's been, uh, been happening down there. So I think uh, we've got that coming in just a sec. And hopefully we'll have a chance to find out what's happening uh, in the pit lane as Ben Barker continues on his way. So let's hear from Karim. Uh, car 80 
six. So you start fourth on the grid and now you're leading the race. So. Well, look, it's a strong car and Ben's trying a very nice race. You know, the key was to try to get in front and build a lead. And at the moment, he's slowly, slowly increasing. It's good because the pros behind are battling with each other, which means we can extend a bit. But still, it's a long race. So I have to drive as well and I have to try and try and maintain the lead. It's a new car. Yeah, the car's very nice. It's very different. It's obviously different to the other car. We just need to build the confidence. It's very nice. Thank you. So, mate, Mike Wainwright, who will be uh, taking over that car from Ben Barker, the strategy, I believe, is uh, likely to see Ben staying in the car for a couple of stints and then for Mike taking over and then for Adam Carroll to take over and finish the race and do the last... Uh, portion of the race 54 is Michael Lyons that we were talking about earlier raced of course last year in International GT Open and uh, previously to that raced in the FIA GT3 series that's the final go for example and a number of uh, drivers have basically been uh, commenting on just how competitive it is at this level but uh, it is also very frustrating for drivers on occasion when scenarios will uh, be beyond their control and we've seen that happen to a couple of guys already we talked a little bit about um, Fabian Bartes who was forced to retire with a gearbox issue and uh, the other car that we saw retire early on of course right at the beginning of things was the prototype the uh, Greaves racing car that was being driven by young Matt McMurray at the time. And, uh, of course, what that did deprive us of is a chance to get to see a man who's won Daytona, a man who's won Sebring, and uh, a man who I know is very frustrated. I'm delighted with John Boyd, Johnny Moe. <laughs> Johnny, I bet your head, head absolutely went into your hands when you saw that unfolding. aren't quite up then you're going to be in a situation where you 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 have very grabby brakes and he just locked the rears and i just feel terrible for for, for matt for matt murray because uh, he's uh, trust me i've just seen him he's in the back of the truck he's beating himself up big time but this is what it's this is what it's all about and uh, mistakes happen and we lose as a team and we win as a team and obviously you know yourself with the with years of experience of, of going through the good bad and ugly of what happens in motorsport that young drivers that's part of the learning process you know we were all those young drivers one once upon a time you know absolutely i mean you know simon i mean he's done le mans 24 hours at 16 i mean that's incredible achievement in itself and uh, he's, he's done a great job it's been a pleasure driving with him and i'm I, obviously i'm disappointed i won't get a chance to get in the car and go out there and, and do what i can do for the team but I, I feel terrible for him but it's still a great race i mean as we watch harry tinkle there it's just a, i was watching the start of the race he did a fantastic move on uh, Durrani and you now he's just literally disappearing off into off into the distance and this is looking very strong for the at least our, our, our you know sister Zytec so to speak albeit Jota Sport and then our, our sister Greaves car is actually doing really well up in fifth place uh, uh, the number 28 Greaves car so all is not lost even if we're aiming for our cars out of the race. Now Mark Strzyzewski is on board the car at the moment obviously uh, as we see actually looks like uh, Tinkler's coming in for the first of stops now do you think this is going to just be fuel, Johnny? I think he'll get out. Um, I think uh, that basically they do 45 minutes. It'll be a driver change to, yep, as we can see there. Is that Albuquerque, I think, getting out? Or is that, I, I think that's Simon. It is Simon, yeah. I think, I think so. Yep. I think so, yeah. And that's it. And I think the story with Simon Dolan that, that we've all seen is, is a, a case of somebody who's Set, out, set about with a very specific goal to succeed in sports car racing at a high level and has worked very, very hard over a number of years. It's not been an instant, as you see now, Go uh, Gonzalez, I think, in the car as well. Yes, yeah? that'll be Rodolfo Gonzalez. I heard that Bertan, who put it on pole, is going to finish the race, as will Albuquerque for the Jota. 
for the Jota team. But you're right about Simon Dolan. I mean, you know that obviously we won't go into the bore the, the listeners with the sort of minutiae of the bronze, silver, gold, platinum rankings amongst the drivers to help uh, amateurs be able, as we see somebody taking a bit of a fall there at the front of the Murphy car on live on TV. Um, Simon Dolan is somebody that, if you talk to him about that, doesn't want anything to do with it. He doesn't want to be ranked as a bronze or a silver. He wants to measure himself in the same car against the top professionals and the quickest drivers he can get a hold of. And uh, I admire him for that. And if you look at his lap times, he really is quick, genuinely quick, not just as an amateur. Now, I think there might have been a problem at the back of the Murphy car there. They pulled out the, uh, the air jack pipe and it looked like maybe one of the valves had jammed because the car was sitting up on its jacks much, much longer than you'd expect. Absolutely. That's given Simon Dolan a fantastic lead. I mean, I don't know what he came in with, but it was probably only about four or five seconds. He's now got more like three or four times that. So. Uh, that's nice and healthy for Simon and he'll uh, he'll get his head down and uh, get get into a rhythm and uh it's an early days yet as we see the Murphy car leaving the pits now. I mean, that's got to be, what, 30 seconds, Simon? It's got to be, hasn't it? That was, a, that was a very, very long stop, that's for sure. Now, I'm going to make a note in my little book here because I'm trying to be organised, John, for once. That's I know. not like you, Simon, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Johnny What's I, happened? Oh, no, someone's <laughs> taken over my body. Johnny and I have known each other for far too long and he knows that one organised is perhaps one word that's never used to describe. Right, so we, we saw that, uh, that stop on where we uh, lap. Um, so yeah, we've, we've seen that with uh, just over 3.13 to go, so that was when we saw the, the change for both those guys. Now, going back to we are talking about Shulzitski, he's still in the car. Obviously, different dynamic for these guys. Luciano Pajetta has now taken over that car, according to our time. Yes, we didn't yes, see yeah, that they stop. were always going to do that. Basically, the Greaves is to, I don't think I'm giving anything away, is uh, what we were going to do with Chris McMur uh, Matt McMurray rather as well. We're going to single, single the uh, silver driver then uh, myself and Luciano Bacchetta were going to do double a uh, double in the middle and then they were going to do finish off the race so you'll see him now double the car and very good drive been very impressed with Luciano this weekend actually he's done a fantastic job we've got a problem there for the number 24 uh, car that's uh, Arthur Pick I think in the car being pushed down the pit lane so that's they've dropped back actually I expected to see a lot more pace from them uh, actually maybe he just stalled it and got push started again but uh, uh, I expected to see a bit more pace from that car um, at the end. Well, they did have a spin fairly early on. You might not have seen on the on the TV, John, because I'm guessing you were pretty busy sorting things out with the team. But they did have a spin about sort of right. 10, 15 minutes in, uh, and that okay, I right. think might have lost them a fair chunk of time. Um, I don't think I don't know if there was contact. Maybe Arthur was going through some traffic at the time. Now that looked to me like that that car had had a problem at the top end of the pit lane rather than the bottom in terms of yeah, getting strange. away. You know, it's strange. Yeah, maybe like uh, as they came down through the gears coming into the pits it could have been a, a bit of a drama for him perhaps yeah. to see if it fires up now they cut away there you can see if it fires up and uh, of course mustn't forget now that we've got uh, the Moran car leading so with uh, Pierre Regas yeah now that's going to be interesting to see how whether they can hang on to that pace once they've uh, made the change or once they've uh, certainly made a stop but Dolan, the interesting thing with Dolan, I think, you know, he's very, very uh, key. What you said, John, about the way his attitude about, you know, just wants to be focused on driving at the level of the guys around him, which is not an easy thing to do for anyone, even for other professional drivers coming up to this level. Yeah. Um, but the point really being is that you notice on his outlap, just instantly straight on it. And that's what one thing the pros do very well, isn't it? They don't need a lap or so to get up to speed. It's the first corner is as committed as they've been at any other point in the weekend. Yeah, and, and, and he, he's, he knows the car inside out. They do an awful lot of testing, Jota, testing development. They involve Simon in all of that work. They've also got a very good crew, Jota, I mean, Sam Hignett, we both know him well. They've also got Tim Holloway, who's effectively the designer, one of the designers of this car, who I was fortunate enough to engineer me when I raced the Zytec, the factory Zytec in the American Le Mans series, who's a fantastic engineer, very calm on the radio, and I know he'll have worked very hard with Simon to make sure that he gets the best out of him. And so that car is absolutely hooked up, absolutely hooked up. You can see just in, in the final sector with the downforce they're running, the way they've got that balance on that car, absolutely nailed. In terms of handling not quite as quick on the straights perhaps as some of the other LMP2 cars but in terms of the cornering absolutely got it nailed down at the moment so I guess you know your comment there about straight line speed because most of the cars run well nearly all of them run the Nissan engine with a couple of Judd engines out there as well yeah so performance between from engine to engine is going to be significantly different I would imagine they're fairly similar I think it's just L over D Simon in terms of the drag of each car and the Zytec traditionally has never been particularly quick in a straight line as uh, as everyone knows and so down the back straight we're normally giving away anything between two or three tenths up to six, seven tenths just in the middle sector, which is effectively the back straight. 
I think we ought to talk about GTE a, a little bit because I'm always annoyed when I'm in GTE and we never <laughs> talk about them. We so now I think we should give uh, old Ben Barker a, a bit of a mention. He's yeah. leading GTE quite comfortably in the Porsche, which is a bit of a surprise. I know everyone's kind of started their uh, their bronze driver in that category, but even so, it, uh, the Porsche going very well there. Yeah, well, Ben, interestingly, got into the lead pretty much from the beginning. And uh, the other driver that was right up there, who's worked his way through, is Venturi, who wasn't even in the car this week. And he's turned up just for today, basically. Oh, really? Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, because okay. it was uh, basically the cut of Pierre Caffer and uh, Alexander Talcanista had been sharing. Um, and then I think uh, we, you were talking about licensing scenarios. And obviously, we do have to briefly mention we've got this situation where certain grades of drivers can drive together and others can't. So they, they needed basically to get a, a, a silver grade driver into the car. They had a bronze and a platinum, but they needed to do that. So, right, okay. So, yeah. Yes, uh, that just shows you. I mean, it's very difficult to. As a, as, a, as a working professional driver, it, uh, it makes it very, very difficult sometimes with this uh, whole ranking system. But it uh, obviously means that it, it opens up the, the level of, 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 uh, of, of professionalism uh, to, across the board. Now, down in the pit lane, we have Corrine who's going to grab one of the guys to uh, give us a bit more info on what's happening. Yes, of course, for LMP2, I mean, uh, the team manager, Xavier Combe of the car 46. So, Xavier, how was the first time? Yeah, the first it, the first it was okay. Uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre Thierry took the start. He had a good, uh, really good stint, but unfortunately, uh, we have a tire puncture uh, just before the stop, so we must reduce the stint. Then uh, we lost uh, a bit of time, but uh, now the, the car is okay, and uh, Ludovic Bade is really fast on the track, so we expect a good result. Thank you. So interesting to see from uh, the Thierry HDS team exactly how things are going. Of course, such a successful team. They're one of those teams that have always been competitive in this, this form. And it's interesting how, I suppose, it happens in all forms of motorsport that certain teams seem to uh, get into certain categories and really focus on uh, developing their success there. Jota is one example. Yes. Uh, Thierry TDS, Murphy Prototypes, you know, and of course your own team, Greaves. That, you know, they, they've been a Le Mans winning team in the past. Absolutely. I mean, Greaves Motorsport are eponymous, really, with the whole European scene, where it was the Le Mans series and now the European Le Mans series. Murphy Prototypes, I mean, honourable mention to them, really. They've missed a few races and came back, first race back, put it on pole, you know. So I think uh, LMP2 in the WEC, which obviously we were doing earlier on in the year with Ram Racing, has been a little bit... Uh, a little bit flaky on occasion, but certainly it seems to be pretty healthy here in the European Le Mans series, and they've got some great racing going on, as we see uh, some real slipstreaming down the back straight, in and out of the GTE cars, and as you can see from looking at these pictures, there's not a lot, if any, difference between the GTE cars and the LMP2 cars in a straight line. It's only when you get to that corner at Senior, and we're flat at Senior, yeah. or a small lift, but you can't do that if you're more than about two car lengths behind the GT car, because they're going through there pretty quick as well, and to be able to dive down the inside and be clear of them by the time you reach the apex is pretty tricky so the work that's going on in these cockpits from the GT cars and also from the LMP cars in terms of working the traffic is, is pretty high I can tell you. Well interesting in the first few laps when uh, Tinker was behind uh, Pipo Durrani that corner in particular seen it would appear that Pipo may have been lifting a little bit perhaps understandably his first stint yeah. leading a race and uh, and Tinker was taking so much time he was back onto him almost underneath him into the next right hander so clearly that's a corner that requires some big commitment <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah big commitment <laughs> Yeah. Say that again. Yeah. But I think also you saw with the Murphy car and, and then Durrani, he was a bit quicker on the straight. Um, and obviously probably running a little bit less downforce than that, uh, that Zytec. And we tried to go yesterday for some real low downforce and we're not quite sure it was the right way to go. And we were at this point in time bleeding some more downforce back into the car. Uh, outright lap time on your own in, in clear air, maybe it's better to run low downforce. But certainly as soon as you get into a race situation, running traffic, having to work the GT cars, it's, I, I'm not quite sure it's the right way to go. And it certainly seems that at the moment anyway, the uh, 38 Jota car have, got, have made the right decision in terms of the uh, combination of downforce and straight line speed. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see uh, uh, Pierre Rag came in and they just made a uh, uh, just made a fuel stop. They didn't change the driver because he started the car. Still in the car now uh, with a lead of 23 seconds. Now, do you think that's uh, that's basically because the, the driver change is adding that extra time into it, or is that something they're factoring whilst the fuel's going on? Well, I think again it goes back to the the class of driver. You've got a minimum driving time for the driver. So the fast guys like Harry Tinknell, there he can't drive basically more than 45 minutes. Uh, whereas your your uh, 
your, your time limited driver has to do a minimum of either two hours or two hours twenty depending on whether you've got two or three drivers and so effectively you're in a situation there where they might just decide to keep their time limited driver in, in this case the silver driver and just double him, get that out of the way, that opens up a window later on to work with their other two drivers in terms of if we do get a safety car or something like that but you can see they're working the traffic really nicely there actually uh, and uh, it's, it's a joy to watch actually when you're seeing good drivers at work there as you say that Chatin and the uh, Alpine uh, working it through onto the straight. It's such an important corner, that fast left-hand corner out onto the back straight, because if you can't get flat through there because you're held up by a GT car or everything, you probably lose like a second and a half without exaggerating down the back straight. So, it's, as you see again, just now is sat right on uh, the tail of the uh, Gonzales in the uh, number 48 Murphy Prototypes car there, and just working the traffic a little bit more aggressively, you might actually have a little dive down the inside here for the uh, turn one. Not quite close enough uh, to send it to the inside. I suppose the braking distance is, uh, is so short for those cars that you it, 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 unless you have a look at GT stop. cars as well so I mean look at that Porsche he went in just now he's still behind them coming out I mean the GT cars now have got so good that it really is driving like it's like GT car now is like driving a prototype from 10 years ago almost in terms of braking distances and all the rest of it so it's a uh, fantastic how how good a performance you can get out of a GT car around here and again as we see him he's going to really be losing front downforce at this point this is a real understeery corner this one here it really goes on forever and he'll be lost a bit of front downforce there which is why he's dropped back slightly and he'll about halfway down this straight I expect to see him tucked right back up under the under the wing of the uh, Murphy prototypes car but the Murphy car is actually one of the quickest in a straight line uh, and as you can see here even with a slipstream he is struggling to catch him he, he'll probably get him but maybe not quite enough before senior. Gonzalez goes defensive if we see one of the SMP cars in to make their change, can't quite see which one it is. I think that's the Bertolini car that was on pole. Look at that, almost side by side through scene. I think Johnny. he might dive down the inside into the right here. Yeah, Gonzalez is driving a good race in the sense that he's not having, he's not overly defensive. No, but no, he just did the right thing there. He just went to one move to the right, held the position. And he says, you know, I'll be honest with you, if anyone can go around the outside of someone at Senior, then uh, either the person that's been overtaken has got a problem or the person that's doing the overtaking is like in centering <laughs> incarnates, you know. Fully committed, yeah, yeah exactly. It's still, still mind blowing when you think of the old turbo cars going through there back in the day. Well, qualified. think about it. In these cars, you're coming down that back straight, it goes on forever, and you come up to Senior and you don't lift and, and you, you just turn, turn in. Your you brain know, goes, turn in. Yeah, and you're like thinking, your right foot, you put your left foot over your right foot and make sure you don't lift. <laughs> Now the question is Johnny of course, you know, now we've been doing this for a couple of years now, this race in Lark, haven't it? Yeah. So is that is that last bit, that lifting bit, is that still something that you go, yeah, we can do this? <laughs> God no. Have to think about it a bit more. Well, I, the way I built up to it was I came up to it, kept my right foot flat, but left foot braked. <laughs> so on the throttle trace, my throttle trace was flat, <laughs> but you see a little pump on the left foot yeah. on the brake. But uh, that's the way I built the confidence up. But it's like anything, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. If anything, as you become more experienced, you... Uh, a slightly less risk averse in terms of wanting to risk the car because you're aware that in sports cars at any rate uh, people want you to be quick but more importantly they want you to bring the car as he's oh. got down the inside that's a great move I don't know if you'll be able to make it stick though it all depends on that GT car in front and he might get held up now so if he can hold back the per per Murphy prototype so he should get a real good run at him and with his straight line speed he might be able to actually draft past him before they get to senior but it's going to be a problem now because that GT car is going to be in his way when he wants to pull out well, as we come up to almost exactly one hour of the four hours completed, and look at that. You can see the difference. He's, He's trying to box him in now. He's trying to box him in with that, with that GT car. That's quite clever. This is a uh, very good move by Gonzalez if he can get it to stick. Well, you saw there, gonna... you saw he had the slipstream, pulled out, and he actually went backwards when he pulled out. That just shows you the importance of slipstream in these cars. Well, this is a fabulous, but I mean, it's great. We always talk about how sports car racing has changed in the, the last sort of 10 or 15 years to go to full on sprint racing. Oh, now. we drive it as hard as you can. I mean, you look at the stint, you do a 50 laps, they tell you if you're going to double stint. So let's say you're doing an hour and 20, hour and 40 in the car, and you just go out there and drive it as quickly as you possibly can to look after the tyres in that time. So all you're doing is managing that hour and 40 to be as quick as you can in that hour and 40. If that means not driving it, qualifying laps for the first five, 10 minutes to make sure you don't kill the tyres, then so be it. But as you see here, just dive talk down us, the inside. Talk us through how he pulled that move off, John, how he set that up. Well, basically, he just got a little bit early down the right-hand side, got a little bit, I think, perhaps, uh, 
um, Gonzalez there was just distracted slightly by the uh, by the 54 GTE Ferrari in front of him, and I think he just managed to sneak enough of a nose down the inside that that forced Gonzalez to miss that apex. And like I mentioned to you earlier, it's a very understeery corner. It's very dirty offline, and he just pushed a bit wide, managed to make the move stick. Well, also interestingly, I think that that those two cars that were fighting was the cars that were fighting over second and third place in class, and that was Venturi and and Lions. So needless to say, they were very busy having their own race. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. And again, this is always the problem with, with class racing, isn't it? You've got those battles. If you've got, we see it at Le Mans every year. You have two or three GT cars all over each other fighting for a win. Yeah. And then they have the, the LMP1s and MP2s coming through. And it's, it's understandably, they're thinking, you know, you, you have to find a way past, mate. That's, that's how it works, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's very, very tricky with the classes. I remember last year with us running in the GTE class, we had our own race going on, but uh, it was uh, tough, tough work in the traffic. So how is it for a guy like uh, Christian Klein, who is uh, he's looking at what's been going on with uh, running in this car? He's been doing a, a fabulous job. Uh, so we'll have a quick look and see what's happened for the first hour of this race. Johnny, this is what happened to Matt. Talk us through it. Yeah, I mean, he just basically just, you can see, we thought he'd been hit initially, potentially. Got a good start there, got himself back up to eighth position, and then he just locked the rears and just went in. And then the, the engine was overheating, unfortunately, and the engine asked, uh, the team asked him to turn the engine off because you're only allowed one engine in this Formula. As we see a replay there of what a move we were just talking about there of, uh, of uh, Gonzalez getting passed by uh, Chatin. No, Tink, that was Tinknell, wasn't it, early on? That's that, this one, this one is this the, one's the highlight. Yeah, Tinknell getting that, that's for the lead there. Tinknell and Durrani. taking a really, yeah. Uh, Fabian Barthez retiring. So what happened to Fabian Barthez Ge then, Simon? Gearbox, Gearbox. Ah, we heard right, from Jerome yeah. Polycon from the Soft Rev team. And uh, uh, then we saw some, some fabulous battles throughout the order. The 57 car that was right in the mix. That was the car of Mediani that had come through to fight for uh, a lead in the class. There is Ben Barker that we were talking about earlier who took the lead fairly early on within the first 10 minutes of the race. He was still leading up now, into the seventh lead. overall. I mean, that's an incredibly good result. Now, Ben's one of those drivers that uh, perhaps hadn't been uh, immediately apparent to everybody, but look, at this is that battle again. This is, yes. was a very good move by Chatham, wasn't it? Yeah, he really, he just absolutely sorted that out, worked the traffic. You couldn't work. If you ever wanted to see how to work the traffic, that's how to do it, to make a pass stick. Yeah, and he uh, and he then did the right thing about just positioning the car. He'd done hard bit of getting himself yeah. into the lead. I mean, he knew that he was coming. He knew he was slow in a straight line. He'll have known Bimp from being tucked up underneath Gonzalez's rear wing there that he was slow in a straight line. He did a good job. So back to the live action here as we look at the, the 99 McLaren of uh, Ricardo Gonzalez as opposed to Rodolfo Gonzalez, just to confuse us. No relation whatsoever. Different nationality as well, in fact. And, and then... Our race leader now, the 43 car of Pierre Rags. Now, he's a driver that's uh, that not a not a driver that's perhaps of much of a household name, but certainly in the LMP2 world, he's established himself as being one of the the quicker guys and always is very competitive. Yeah, very very good. Done very well. He's maintaining a really good gap to Simon Dolan at the moment, keeping it at around the sort of 22, 23 second mark. So the question is, of course, going to be as we go through and look at an overall classification after the first hour. It's uh, New Blood by Moran Racing. It says one lap, but of course we know they are on the same lap. Joda Sport, Signatech, Murphy Greaves, and Thierry A. Further down the order, leading it's Golf Racing UK with the Porsche with Ben Barker on board ahead of the AT Racing of Mediani. Uh, which is actually entered by AF Corsa, Alexander yes. Talkinista Racing. And then leading the GTC class, it's uh, Anton Ladigan ahead of uh, Madiani that we saw a moment ago, and Yen Gudi uh, in the 98 McLaren. So, uh, Well, if you think the racing's good now, Simon, wait until you get all the platinum drivers in at the end when you're getting this Christian Kleon in and the Albuquerque in and all those boys, and they start going at it hammer and tongs, and there's probably only 30, 40 seconds at, like there is at the moment covering the first four or five uh, for the overall lead and in GTE it's even closer and now Venturi just looks like he's taken the lead there as Ben Barker's pitted in the uh, number 86 Porsche. Yeah it'd be interesting to see who goes on board now whether they put uh, Mike Wainwright in the car or whether I think they're going to hang on and uh, do a relatively short run for Mike and have Ben. They'll go uh, in the middle I would, yeah. I would assume they traditionally all these guys when they've got a bronze driver they'll put the bronze either at the start or in the middle and they always have their normally anyway have their quickest guy finish. Yeah and that, that's a logical thing to do because that's where 
potentially the, the, the race is won or lost. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. The, the quality of, of those guys and why you have guys like yourself of that level in there is is to make that difference when it matters at the end. Because uh, at this stage, it's still. I love it's, watching it's, these races, though. I mean, I must admit, I don't often get a chance. Like, this is very nice for me in a way. It's nice to sit in here with you and just watch some of the racing. I don't normally see anything. You're very blinkered when you're in a racing. You know what it's like, Simon. When yeah. you're in your own garage, you only look at the people immediately around you. Half the time, I don't even know what's going on until I walk down to Matt Griffin, my sort of co. European champion from last year. I didn't even know how he was getting on and he was the same with me and so it's nice to actually sit here as we're watching the 73 uh, GTC Ferrari uh, that's uh, Ladigan uh, leading his class in 13th overall there. Uh, it's just nice to sit here and, and, and watch these boys doing their stuff and that's actually Matt Griffin's car behind him, the number 55 AF Corsa GTE Ferrari uh, just behind the GTC leader there with uh, this time Rugolo at the wheel and he'll do the middle stint. Uh, I don't think Matt said to me before the start, I don't think Rugolo's going to double. I think he's going to do a single and then uh, Matt will get in and uh, and finish up. Yeah, so again, interesting combination of drivers there. We've got Duncan Cameron who has driven with Matt for such a many long years, time. Many years, yeah. Took uh, three wins last year in his National GT Open. Just one GT Open in the GTS class last weekend at Spa. Yeah. They've won the Spa 24 hours together. And again, you know, uh, Duncan Cameron's another driver, a bit like Simon Dolan, has really worked at improving his uh, Absolutely. standard of his performance. Absolutely. Absolutely, Matt's always telling me what a great job Duncan Cameron does in the car and, and he's another one, I mean he's probably a few years behind Simon Dolan in his development but yeah. he's another one that doesn't really care what the ranking is between him and another driver, he just wants to get in and go as quickly as he possibly can and I admire the drivers like that, that don't, they don't want a safety net to be ranked as an amateur so they can beat other amateurs, they just want to go in and measure themselves against the best pros that are out there and I think that's the, a healthy attitude and most of the amateurs to be fair that I talk to have that attitude and Duncan Cameron does a fantastic job, keeps it clean more often than and not very consistent and you don't win these races single-handedly is about the driver pairings and you don't win GT Open races and I know from having done it for a few years unless both drivers are holding up their end of the bargain so him and Matt Griffith make a great team. Now we've just been watching for a little while one of the um, ART McLaren then the other one here is uh, Delina and Spirazzioli and these guys have come from racing in the uh, uh, Maserati Trofeo series which yeah. is an interesting series I mean you've raced in one make sports car series like Porsche Super Cup yeah. and of course uh, Porsche Cup GB before that with great success so I think it was a 100% record was it 97 won every that race so long ago Simon <laughs> I can't even remember but <laughs> point is, is that you know that that type of racing is you see a move there yes, to the inside nice. the 71 car going through and uh, getting that move done, Persiani, who was quickest of the GTC guys in qualifying, doing a great move to put himself ahead of uh, Ricardo Gonzalez there in the ART car. And it's still interesting with GTC, we've still got this wonderful dynamic of a much broader spread of manufacturers, because yes. it's more accessible for them to be well, involved. Well, last year GC GTC was just kind of introduced to the European Le Mans series, and, and uh, it, was, it, was, it did very well, but it wasn't that competitive probably last year. This year it's just absolutely exploded, and it's every bit as competitive as the GTE. I mean, you've got people like Jan Magnussen in it for, yeah. for, for Crikey, you know, and it's just absolutely brilliant racing, very, very close. And this, this is why it's enjoyable to, to watch these kind of races because there's so many battles going on within the race, and it, they are battles. It's not a case of someone just getting out to the front and cruising. Having said that, at the moment, Rages is still uh, now actually extended his lead a little bit to 24 and a half seconds over Simon Dolan in second place. Uh, so, in that sense, the battle is kind of spreading out a little bit at the front, and uh, nice to see. Uh, Luca, Luciano Bacchetta, Bacchetta in the 28 Greaves car, got to give him a bit of honourable mention, and just set his fastest lap of the race in the cars as well at 51.7. And we said before the start, Simon, uh, in terms of qualifying pace, we weren't sure if the Greaves car had it, but we were pretty confident that the, uh, that the race pace was there, and uh, I was able to do sort of 51s, 52s in, uh, in race trim, and uh, we were hoping that that would be the race pace, and it certainly appears that that is indeed the race pace. So at the moment, he's the quickest guy out on the track, him and uh, Bede in the Ligier. And of course, Pacetta is one of those drivers who uh, had a very, very strong single-seated career up until very recently, winning the FIA European Formula 2 Championship. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't do something like that with a standard drive to race against unless you've got a very high level. Absolutely, you don't win the Formula 2 Championship unless you're good. No. And he's adapted to sports car racing. And, and to be honest, it's, it's not a surprise, is it, when you see a guy like that? No, I mean, across, more, you... more and more young subs. This is a really good battle here, isn't it, developing between the 98 McLaren now and... Uh, that we were just talking earlier on about Gonzalez in the 90 car, and I believe this is the 70 Ferrari. It was the 71 against the 99, and now it's the, the 70 against the 98 with Perodo at the wheel, who yeah. drives with Manu Collard, who's a, who's a fantastic driver, been around a long time, very versatile sports car driver. 
Manu would have been doing Porsche Super Cup when you were doing it, I think, was he? Actually, he did it before I did it. Yeah. He'd already moved on by the time I got there, but he was very successful in every category he'd done. And, yeah, as we see, uh, I think that's the Simon Doan Club just putting someone a lap down, is that? Uh, I don't know if he's fighting with uh, Pick. Cut. Maybe Pick. Had, yeah, because Pick had that. Pick, yeah. I think, maybe it's caught back up now. Uh, no, you're right. I think Pick must be a lap down looking at it. Yeah, he's, he's, a lap yeah. Down. he's only doing 54.8 that last lap, and Dolan was 53.5, so I think that was him just putting a lap as in second place onto the... Uh, the peak orica. Which says it all really, doesn't it? We talked about Simon Dolan and the level that he's at. And he finished second. Yeah. Oh, the pig finished second uh, in GP2, didn't he? Yeah, he, he had a race uh, win recently. At Monza, in, in and GP2. Simon Dolan has just passed him. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's not to say for a second that, you know, I'm sure there are car problems that's in, in, in Peak's defence. I mean, he's a far, oh, that's a shame, looks like a puncher. Yeah. Right, I would say that's a right rear puncher. Yeah, that's the 57 car, so uh, one of the SMP Russian bear guys. That's Mediani, who was right up there. Uh, that's a shame, that's for a big shame for Maurizio, that oh, is. I wonder if he'd had some contact there. I didn't, couldn't quite see if there was, it's a bit cause and effect bodywork damage, isn't it? Did the body damage come because he got hit and that's yeah. what caused the puncher? He's got to be careful. He doesn't want that to come and rip off the fender, otherwise that'll cost him even more time. It's such a killer when that happens to you and you're a long way from the pits and you don't want to go too qu uh, too slowly because you salute, you know you feel like you're hemorrhaging lap time as you get in the in the cockpit, but you're so careful with not damaging the suspension and the, and the bodywork uh, too much so that when you come back in it's just the case of putting on a new tyre and off you go again. In comes a JMW car now. That car has looked very strong. Uh, Damien McKenzie in the early part of the race was right up there. They're in from the lead. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's from the lead. The way the pit stops have panned out. That's the leading GTE car at this point. And McKenzie is staying on board. I think he's going to hang on for another stint. Now that was tyres going on by the looks of things. Yeah, they're fuel and tyres, definitely. So that's an uh, interesting uh, combination of, of uh, keeping McKenzie and putting the tyres on because next on board, I think, will probably probably be young George Richardson who's their, um, their least experienced driver through but as a, tr as a three so as a, the three drivers across the board Walker McKenzie and uh, Richardson providing a pretty strong combination yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised they're keeping uh, not changing drivers, actually, because uh, obviously it's about an hour and 15 a stint. One stint each, you get close to the nearest damage to the, to, to the four hours. So I'm, I'm surprised that they're not uh, changing drivers on that one. As we see uh, the Mediani back in there in the GTC number 57 Ferrari, and uh, that doesn't look like he's done too much damage to the fender or anything. I think he's done a very good job there bringing that car back in, and they're fueling it at the moment, and then you'll see the... All four tyres getting changed, and uh, again, looks like he's staying in the car. And it's interesting, isn't it, that um, you know, the difference between a GT car and a, and, a, and a Formula car there. We saw, obviously, what happened to Lewis Hamilton recently yeah. in the Grand Prix when he picked up that infamous puncher from contact with Nico Rosberg, and the damage to the under tray was what, did, what finished his race, basically. Well, don't forget, the, the profile of these tyres is much, much uh, smaller than the, a Formula 1 tyre. It's a lot more rubber to come off a Formula 1 rim and flap about and break stuff than there is on one of these sports cars. Uh, and also, the tyre technology in sports cars, we see all the... Look at the crowds. Look at the crowd, Simon. Amazing. Yeah, that is it. You don't always get a big crowd for European Le Mans series, but I must admit, driving in this morning, I had to wait before I could get into the car park. Didn't they know who you were? No, I'll tell you not. Clearly not. You know? Exactly. You've got, to, you've got to remember always turn up in your race suit, yeah. John. That's <laughs> Absolutely, that's, that's it. No, that's your trick, Simon. That's the thing. But going back to the tyre technology, a sports car is also very much a case of dealing with punctures, the thickness of the tread, so that you don't get too many punctures. Like in Le Mans 24 hours in the old days, punctures are very common. They're a lot less common now, and a lot of that's down to the tyre manufacturers and their development of the technology to avoid that happening. And also, they're very much stronger in the core, and they do things and belts within the tyre to avoid delamination to the same extent. So tyre technology is has moved on dramatically in the last sort of five, ten years, and that's one of the reasons why you can see someone drive back that quickly with a flat tyre and not damage it too much. Yeah, and, and obviously it, it helps as well, I suppose, that somewhere like uh, Paul Ricard, which has got such a, uh, a, a lot of um, wide runoff areas around, you could run Absolutely. on a fairly smooth part of the road and be offline without, or be literally yeah. off the circuit without actually causing Absolutely. an issue. Absolutely, and, uh, the, the race director here, Eduardo, he's very, uh, he's very anti-safety cars anyway, and on a track like Paul Ricard, you'd really have to have, and I hope I'm not going to jinx anything, but you'd really have to have a really big incident before you'd have to be in a situation to call for a safety car. So we just see the uh, Roman Narak car, I don't know if Narak, no, Amindo on board that car now, the 76 car, um, we're under a bit of pressure from Cristone now. Crisoni and uh, and his co-driver have already taken a, a class win this year, so clearly as a combination they work very, very well. Just the two drivers as well, so 
it seems to be more common that we see the the the, the, the three driver combination working. Yeah. But two drivers seems to work in in certain situations, John. You obviously well, going to be doing that yourself. Well, right? yeah, we were. T it works more for the for. It means that the amateur gets uh, more driving. Uh, obviously but uh, certainly last year with three hour races in the European Le Mans series myself and Matt Griffin did just two drivers clearly as most people did a few people tried to shoehorn three into a three hour race which is a bit tricky but uh, I'm going to call it here now I'm actually going to tell you that I think in GTE actually talking about Matt Griffin that the number 55 AF Corsa GTE car is going to win win their class because Rugolo's just done a 57.7 which is nearly three seconds quicker than some of the guys directly in front of him. He's fourth in class, but he's only 23 seconds behind the leader, which is the uh, Ben Barker Porsche still, and Matt's still to get into that car. So I think uh, the combination of Rugolo now and Matt Griffin later, I think is going to be a little bit too strong for the opposition then. So I'll put my money on them to win the class. Yeah, and I guess the, the key thing is, is, although you can see Barker leading at the moment and uh, Adam Carroll, of course, to take over at the end, of the, the race, it's going to be. I mean, there's quick. another great driver. We're talking about single seater boys coming in. I mean, Adam yeah. Carroll, fantastic driver, and he's running in GTE. What a superstar that boy is! Yeah. Obviously, a race winner in uh, in GP2, A1 GP champion, yeah. a <laughs> test driver for Honda in Formula One. So, Absolutely. you know, it just shows the caliber of sports cars now, the yeah. quality of the drivers you've got. And, and I guess that's the thing where the, the teams now have got this uh, this plethora of drivers they can look through the ranks of guys that are out there and keep to be involved. And that will do a fabulous professional job for them at, uh, you know, at a sensible kind of combination of their budgets and what have you. And that's a, that's obviously a key factor. It used to be obviously back in the back in the day where you'd always you'd see three drivers, all of the highest level, all being paid. Motorsport and the world has changed, and this combination yeah. seems to work very well now. In terms of grids and numbers and cars out there, and the teams being able to find drivers with budget to keep the doors open and employ all the mechanics and have an infrastructure there, as we see again now, that's uh, a number 36 car. Yeah, Dolan has been caught by Chatan. 0.6 seconds now, Chatan behind Simon Dolan in second place in the 38, and he's working the traffic, I think, a little bit better there. Got right up onto the tail of Simon Dolan. It's going to be interesting to see. If he doesn't actually get past him before the back straight, if he's right behind him this close as they come onto the back straight, we're going to actually see what we were talking about earlier in terms of the Zytec potentially not being potentially the quickest car in a straight line. So that'll be interesting to follow. Hopefully the director will stay on that shot for a, a while as we come round into the uh, ter exiting turn two there. Dropping down to the next corner, which is uh, third gear in. You carry a lot of speed in, turn in on the brakes into this corner here, down into third, carry as much speed as you can. You end up on the left, second gear here, hug the left-hand side all the way around to try and keep it over to the left-hand side. You see Simon struggling a little bit with the rear of the car there as he braked and went down to first gear for that one. The rear just swung a little bit out to a bit of oversteer there. He's running quite wide there and it'll be interesting now. He just managed to eke out. I think that's the downforce helping him there, Simon. A little bit through that tighter, twistier section. So it'll be interesting to see how much of a run now Chatan gets on him coming up in the Alpine, coming down that long straight, which seems to go on forever. You can have a cup of coffee, send a text, <laughs> exactly. and then you start stealing yourself for that big ballsy right hand senior corner at the end and there's traffic look at that there's a, a big battle going on up ahead so there's five six gt gtc and gte cars coming up as he has a look down the inside he made and there stick. you go yeah that was a great move that was a great move but again that was just simon to be fair didn't put up much of a fight i think he realizes it's probably quicker for his race to just carry on as quick as he can but you can see almost immediately he's able to catch a ride up to him so that is there is the difference between downforce low downforce on the straight High downforce in the corners. And, and again, you know, keep going on about Simon Dolan. I think he's going to have to send us a commission check by the end of this. But yeah, probably will. Simon Dolan, but he's, thank God. he's good for it. <laughs> but yeah. the point so. being is that you, even though the cars clearly work, well, the Zytec specifically works very, very well in that situation, you've got to be able to capitalise on it, be able to make, make the most of it. And there's other drivers who you could have given all the downforce under the, under the sun, but they just simply haven't got the ability to make the most of it. Oh, yeah, clearly you've got to drive the thing close ish, if not on the limit, close ish to its limit to be able to benefit from the downforce but uh, Simon Dolan as we were saying before again you know more than holds his own in, the, in this company. So this is where it gets very challenging for Dolan to try and yeah I mean he's lost out there because this is going to hold because this is one area where the GTEs do hold you up a little bit he's managed to clear around the outside but you can see how hard it is you have to look over and make sure you don't pull back in before you've cleared the GT car and uh, you see there that uh, Chatin actually caught that GT car at the perfect place. But I suspect here he's going to get a little bit held up throughout that left hand onto the straight. Because this is one place actually where the prototypes are quite a lot quicker than the GTE cars, so coming out onto the straight. 
Yeah, this is where you can see they physically can carry so yeah, much. He just more speed. caught that at the right time there. Yeah, yeah, you're that right. was, timing yeah. is everything. It's well, I mean, I don't think he timed it. I think it was just lucky that he didn't have to lift there. It was absolutely perfect just as he exited the corner, pulled out, and he's now got a nice slipstream. I had this yesterday in practice. A great slipstream. I thought I'll be passing before I get to the corner. And then I pulled out to overtake, went backwards, had to pull back into the slipstream <laughs> again. And you can see that happening right here. You know, he's struggling to get past that GTC Ferrari. That's not even the GTE, that's a GTC Ferrari. I know, so we're now looking at the 99 car, Ricardo Gonzalez in the uh, McLaren sharing with Karim Alajani and uh, Alex Brundle, of course, the uh, son of uh, Martin Brundle, who's been racing in sports cars for a while. We've seen him actually more in prototypes than GT cars as Alex. So yes, I was surprised to see him in a GTC car, but I think he recognises he's a sensible lad. He's got a father who can obviously give very, very good advice. No one knows the game more than Martin. And I think he's recognised if you want to be a professional racing driver these days, the opportunities in GT cars, quite frankly, as I am testament to in a way, uh, of being paid to earn a living in racing something are far greater by and large than in, in prototypes and so I think he's looking to become adept across the board and, and that will help him hopefully be a professional racing driver for the next 10, 15 years or so. Yeah and, and also there's another one like uh, Luciano Pacetta who moved across from single seat to seat, raced in Formula 2, Formula yeah. 3 as well fairly, fairly recently but instantly on the pace straight away actually probably arguably more competitive in a sports car than in a single seater. Well I think um, single seaters to prototypes is is not a big step in a way. I think it's very natural you're dealing with the downforce. I remember when I drove with Stefan Johansson a few years ago he was telling me that the Zytec we were driving at the time was every bit as good as the last Formula One car if not better than the last Formula One car I ever drove. Now obviously that was a few years previous but it just shows you how similar the prototypes that you're watching out here are to single seaters. Um, GT cars is a different story altogether I think to drive a GT car is a little bit more of a black art to it. At the same time, a great driver will get in and he'll get there, but it's probably not as natural a transition for someone like an Alex Brundle or a Luciano Bacetta to come and hop into a GT car and be quick immediately. Whereas I think if you're hopping into an LMP2 in particular, which is a little bit lighter, not massively powerful, relying a lot on downforce, I think it's a, a relatively easy transition. Yeah, and that, uh, that has been borne out. We've seen that a few times uh, before now coming through there. Is that, uh, I can't quite see which car that was, that, was that the peak car or that was, oh no, that's a... Uh, no, that's the green uh, scar. That's the green that's scar, that's Bacetta, Bacetta isn't we're talking it? About, yeah, I couldn't yeah, quite see that was Bacetta, you, you're demonstrating yet again what you were saying about the, the, ja uh, the yeah, challenge I mean, he's you struggling, have. he's yeah. struggling to get past as you see the Porsche and the, uh, oh no, number 72, that's the GTE Ferrari. And the SMP car's out and... Uh, that's Shaitar. That was our pole position car, of course. And that's, that's, that's good news. That's good news for, uh, for Matt Griffin. Matt Griffin's and championship guys. hopes. That's yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. You know, Bertolini, of course, has been Mr. Pole position this year in yeah. those cars. An absolutely outstandingly fast driver. And did it again with a remarkable time. But uh, especially through sector three, where he seemed to find loads and loads of time. And Shaitar is actually one of these drivers who's coming this year not really having uh, been on the radar before. Quite a few of these young Russian drivers coming through the SMP team really developing this pool of talent. It's almost like a sort yeah. of a Red Bull type scenario in that they're yeah, bringing these guys through. And he's been a revelation. He's been within sort of seven, eight, ten. He was good last year. He was yeah. already in pride. Never heard of any of these Russians until last year, but they've definitely, uh, they've got the resources. They're picking some good drivers. And uh, now in GTE, you've still got Ben Barker in the Porsche leading and Talkanitsa second with Mackenzie third. And Rugolo in the... Uh, a Ferrari uh, in number 55 in uh, fourth place and then uh, Perazzini in the who had that awful uh, situation with Anthony Davidson at Le Mans yep. many many years ago in the uh, other end of course number 54 GT Ferrari in fifth place and then Ladigan in the 73 GCC Ferrari. Now down in the pit lane I think we have Corinne and uh, hopefully she's going to have a chance to uh, catch up with uh, one of the guys down there we'll see who she's got but we'll have a chance right. to find Moran. Yes. Moran. So let's uh, see if we can get some information as to what's been going on with our, our race leading car, uh, which is of course being driven by Pierre Rags at the moment and has a lead of over 21 seconds. So uh, in a moment, hopefully we'll see Kareem will be able to catch up with, uh, with the Moran guys down there. Uh, but meanwhile, this, uh, this battle goes on here that we're watching between the GTC uh, car, the McLaren, or the ART entered car that's being driven with great commitment by uh, Gonzalez ahead of Lasser. Uh, and this is for fourth in class, fourth and fifth in class effectively, uh, 20th and 21st overall. There is our race leader, the new blood by Moran Racing. And uh, that is, uh, he's, just driven, he's just driven absolutely impeccably in these early stages of the race. 
Let's have a look. Have a look at uh, what's going on. Have a word uh, with Karine down in the pits. Yeah, I'm with Benoit Morand, the team manager, of course, of uh, the the car leading a race right now on LMP2. So, can you tell us something about the strategy? Well, uh, we have uh, Pierre did make a really fantastic uh, beginning of race. Uh, we double steel with the same tyres at the moment. And uh, we don't know exactly what's happened for the third, third stint, st st if we change tyres or not. But uh, we will change driver, definitely sure. But at the moment, uh, it's, a, it's a very good job from Pierre. Thank you, Benoit Morin. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I mean, if he's going to change drivers, it would be uh, foolish not to change tyres, to be honest. So I suspect that they'll change probably to Gary Hirsch and, uh, and put, and put a, another set of uh, boots on it and send him on his way. Uh, what's the characteristics of the tyres in these cars? Do they seem to be quite consistent once you've got that initial performance gain of a new tyre? Once that's dropped away, are they fairly constant? It was difficult early on in the week because there was a lot of uh, the, the, the way the, the track had been brushed and everything, especially on the kerbs. There seemed to be like a lot of almost like little metal balls or something that were being picked up in the tyre. And, and, and if you ran over a kerb, then the next corner you got to, you seemed to have picked up something in the tyre, not dust, something a bit more substantial than dust, which really reduced the grip of the tyre. But as the track's rubbering in with all these cars going constantly round and round, the tyres, I mean, Dunlop have done a fantastic job in LMP2, they pretty much bar one car with Michelin sewn, sewn that up and they, they have very consistent very consistent race tyre, so every car out there will be double stinting the tyre uh, uh, probably a couple of times in the race and we were even talking potentially about triple stinting them but I think Paul Ricard's a little bit too abrasive for that. Yeah, and again, that's one of the things about it being the standard of circuit that it is here, this high level, as we look at the 73 SMP Russian Bears car, uh, which is um, scrapping a little bit further down the order. Let's have a look at what's happening uh, with... Uh, that's the leading, that's the leading GTC Ladigan. car, yes, you saw then, the leading GTC car, leading quite comfortably at the moment uh, by about 51 seconds over the next car, which is Persiani, number 71 Ferrari in GTC, and then third is uh, Sibaruzzioli, Oh, got that right first time. Yeah, didn't I? And good, number good 95 effort. For good 95 effort. Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, see. So uh, doing. Uh, yeah, the, I love the fact that the directors are following a lot of the GTC battle as well as the GTE and the LMP2. And uh, just for those that haven't uh, seen it, Ragas is still leading, as we just heard from Benoit Morant. Uh, and then Chatin is now in the Alpine in second place. And he's pulled out about six, seven, nearly nine seconds actually on Simon Dolan. Uh, lapping about a second a lap quicker at the moment in the 38 Joe 2 is in third and then uh, Rodolfo Gonzalez in the Murphy car which is fading a little at the moment rather surprisingly but it would be interesting to see what happens when Berton who put it on pole gets back in that car then Luciano Bacchetto who we were talking about a little earlier in the uh, number 28 Greaves car 46 Ligio of Bidet and then uh, 24 Arica of Peak. Yeah so an interesting mixture of drivers and cars with all the various conundrums that you were mentioning about straight line performance versus aerodynamic performance um, the Orica or I guess is probably one of the best overall packages but the Zytec seems to be the one that chassis wise is, is absolutely superb isn't it? Well you have to say Jota last year challenged and, and for the championship didn't quite didn't quite sneak it but they were on pole with Oliver Turvey for pretty much every race I think and then uh, the Murphy prototypes cars always seems to be quick in qualifying Brendan Hartley is now a factory Porsche driver driving for them last year put it on pole a couple of times that I, that I remember and so I think it really is but the nature of this is so much horses for courses in terms of the different tracks we go to I mean the next track we go to is Estoril which has a relatively long straight and so in some ways not totally dissimilar to Paul Ricard in terms of trying to find that critical balance but you go to A1 GP it's all about downforce you know yeah. so to, to A1 GP the uh, Austrian yeah, drop, yeah. Uh, yeah. Austrian track uh, A1 so ring A1 ring sorry yeah, yes yeah. Um, so that, that just shows you that probably picking one car that's going to be a dominant force at every race for the whole European Championship is, is unlikely, so which, which makes it more exciting because it means that everyone has a different chance of, of winning. Yeah, and uh, this, this, is, is, a great this is another really good battle, the, the 81 Crossoni car working very hard on the back of Nicolas Armindo. What a star driver Armindo is as well. We talked about the quality of drivers. He's been a winner in Porsche Super Cup. He's yeah, been a winner at Le Mans, yeah. you know. And, uh, and, you and know, just in front of them is Perazzini. So that's basically, uh, what's that, 5th, 6th and 7th in uh, GTE, all nose to tail. And uh, it's interesting, I was talking to Michael Lyons, who shares with, uh, as we see Ben Barker out, still our race leader in the GTA category. His lead over Alexander Telkinista is, uh, last time we looked, was around about 18 seconds, which is a, a sensible lead. Um, but yeah, going back to what we were saying there about uh, the Parazzini driver, that he 
as you said, he was unfortunately the driver that got caught up with Anthony Davison in that shunt a couple of years ago at Le Mans when yeah. Anthony flipped the Toyota and, uh, and injured himself quite nastily in that. Um, one of those very unfortunate things. Not entirely Berezini's fault in some respects, I suppose. Yeah, I don't then, think it was Berezini's fault. I think even Anthony would accept that, you know, at that point going into Mulsanne, it's very difficult for a GTE car to actually stay out wide like that. You're going to shunt. You yeah. have to start taking the apex on that little kink into the corner. And I think even Anthony would accept right now that potentially in hindsight, he should have been a little bit more patient and just waited a fraction longer and then dived down the inside of the brakes as we came away from that apex. So I don't think uh, that anyone in the knowledge in the paddock blames Perazzini for that. Yeah, and, and the poor guy was obviously distraught about oh, absolutely. the fact, you know, being involved, yeah. and, and he did get a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of stick from some of the forums and the comments online and things, as uh, Jules Van Allee sharing with Mike Parisi, another driver that's a uh, top-line GT guy, yeah, he's been yeah. involved at all sorts of levels, um, but, um, you know, GT1 winner this year as well, FIA GT, so... Um, I'm missing this now, Simon, I have to say. You want to be I was, sat here, I was sat here enjoying watching it, but now I've been watching it for half an hour, I'm suddenly thinking I'd rather be out there, especially <laughs> seeing this time last year I was out there in the thick of it all this, yeah. So, yeah and uh, and of course you know a, a champion last year in the series with Ram Racing as you said it's uh, yeah European yeah. championship we got last year so that was a great it's just such a shame the way things have ended up in the WEC but uh, nice that I'm back out here well I didn't get a chance to drive but then I'm back out in the uh, American United Sports Car Championship. I'll be at Cota for the Tusk race there, and then I'll be uh, in Petit Le Mans, which I love. I absolutely love Petit Le Mans with the Bar One Motorsports team in the Prototype Challenge class. So oh, cool. uh, hopefully get to do some racing laps and over there. Who are you driving with in there at uh, um, Petit? It'll be. Uh, um, I don't know the third driver yet, actually, but uh, I think in the other car it's going to be Martin Plowman is oh, the cool. pro in the other car, and then I'll be the pro in our car, and I think Tom Papadopoulos is going to be uh, uh, our, uh, our silver rank driver in that. He's a great guy, good fun, good driver. You know, funny enough, I know someone if you need him, but we'll leave that to another day. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. We can talk about that off air, Simon. Don't worry. Have you got any cash? <laughs> you know the yeah. answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, Rag still leading from Chatan. Now, I think the question is, can Chatan start to eat into that lead? The last couple of lap times, he's started to get closer and closer. Down on. to 13 seconds. Yeah, it, he's, so, ta uh, he's definitely taking time. I mean, that particular lap, they have now lapped almost identical. 153.725 for our race leader. 153.729. Four thousandths of a second between them, and that uh, around that. In fact, we saw that yesterday in, yes. the, in the in the free practice. So Tinkle just four thousandths off of uh, uh, Christian Clean. As we see, this is Chatan, and this yes. is a man on a mission, I yeah, think. Yeah, you can just see the attitude of the car there, can't you, as he came through. He's absolutely pushing it. And the Alpine is actually another car that, not particularly quick necessarily in qualifying sometimes, but definitely seems to come into its own in the races. And, of course, in Signatech, arguably one of the very best teams yes, in terms really, of yeah. preparing, especially preparing uh, the, uh, the the Oracle cars. They seem to have always really done that. And, of course, they they are on pole a couple of years ago with Soyad Ayari at the wheel at Le Mans. Yeah, um, he's and just taking a little bit too sliding the rear quite a lot there through the left hand onto the back straight and uh, just taking a lot of curb actually through turns sort of five six and seven and the car bouncing around a lot there. Do you think he's, he's asking a, lot, a bit too much of the tyres maybe? I don't think he's day. asking too much I think he knows I mean looking at the times here he probably knows he's nearing the end he's probably where are we so we're 227 you're probably looking at it now he's probably within half an hour 25 minutes of pitting so he knows that he can start, you know, letting it go a little bit. He knows what he's got underneath him in terms of tyres. As we see again, that looks like the, uh, is that the Murphy Prototypes car coming under a bit of threat from the, from the, from I think the Lucci. Is that Luciano coming through? I think he might be. That's, uh, that's Gonzalez overtaking Simon Dolan there for, for third place. That yeah. was a change, a change for the podium. So, so Gonzalez, who we didn't think was yeah, actually we lapping saying. that quickly, yeah, seems to have yeah, uh, seems uh, maybe just had a couple of bad laps in traffic. Uh, easily done, isn't it? And it uh, is. It, it definitely yo-yos a lot in traffic, especially around here, because as we were saying, the straight line speed difference between the GT cars and the LMP cars is so close. It's actually quite easy to get caught and not be able to pass before the corner. Then you have no option but to wait for two three four corners and that can cost you as an LMP2 driver at least two three seconds a lap without even blinking. Yeah and last time through Chatan was uh, some two seconds two and a half seconds slower so clearly the traffic, traffic yeah. really uh, effective now. Uh, interesting to see that uh, as in comes Gonzalez 
Gonzalez comes in to hand over to uh, Natenia Burton, I would imagine. Um, and and maybe he's at, this point he'll double. at this point he'll double because Burton won't be able to do more than one stint. So he'll go for the last sort of 50 minutes. So I suspect at this point Gonzalez will double. So that's going to be interesting. It's probably just fuel. We'll watch to see if they do tyres. Remember they had they, they have to delay do with fuel. If they want a chance of winning, they have to do fuel only. Yeah, let's have a look and see what they do. They've and also the other key thing is we see the, uh, the 73 car coming in. Ladigan, our GTC leader. They pull him back into his pit yeah, It looks like they're going to do tyres though. It does look like they're going to do tyres on the Murphy prototype yeah. car. So. Shiny new Dunlops getting ready to go on to the Murphy prototypes car. Greg Murphy and the guys there absolutely committed to yep. their program. Hurts on board. Car goes up, yeah. Now they had problems, remember last time? Yeah, they, they did. The they jack out. Very, didn't very late, very long. Lost about 30 seconds probably, didn't they? 20 to 30 seconds in the pit stop. Well, if you don't, obviously it's a bit uh, difficult to say exactly. They're going to be it. tricky getting out there because they've got the uh, SMP racing Ferrari in front of them. It's going to be quite tricky to get out. They might even need a little bit of a pushback to release him. Yeah, but again, very long pit stop. Yeah, this does look like they're having some problems, isn't it, in terms yeah. of getting things done effectively now. Uh, Bacchetta, is that him still on board? I think it is. Yeah. Yes, he'll be doubling here, and then, uh, oh, then Mark will get, get, get back in and, and, and double again at the end. So, single, double, double. Yeah. So, that means that, at the moment, it's still Pierre Rags is uh, yeah, surely... Yeah, as you can see there, just getting around the Ferrari, just... That was a nightmare pit stop, wasn't it? And that would have been so frustrating for Gonzalez. He'd just taken third place on the track, worked his way back up, and now he's lost a ton of time, which will drop him at least, I would say, down to maybe even fifth place, fourth or fifth. At the moment, it's showing him fourth, but it'll be interesting to see how it pans out with Bacchetta. There you go, fifth. So Bacchetta's jumped him in the pit stop. So the Greaves Motorsport 28 cars jumped the 48 uh, Murphy prototype, so they're now running fourth and fifth. In the background, we saw Poulouk Chatin coming through to almost put a lap on Gonzalez. That oh, gives you yeah. a sense of just how... how uh, Simon Dovin's pitted. Yeah, and that's going to be interesting to see whether he stays on board again, for a little I bit think, longer. Yeah, I think again he'll stay. I think he'll stay on board. There we see him. And I think I'll, be, I'll eat my hat if they change tyres on that car, but I didn't think they would on the Murphy the car as we see the Ladigan coming out, Ladigan yeah. car coming out who's uh, dropped off, hasn't he dropped off the GTC lead now? Yeah, Pesciani now leads that car, uh, leads that class rather ahead of Spirazzioli in the uh, Kessel racing car. Mikel Mack sharing with. Uh, is that Olivier Beretta in the 73 GTC? He is indeed, yeah. Olivier Beretta. Well, there you go. There's another former, blast from the past, isn't there? Former FIA. I didn't know he was here. The young Magnussen, Olivier Beretta. GT2 world champion, of course, yes. Olivier Beretta, for yeah. the, back in the factory Viper days. Or GT1 Viper. world champion, even, because it was GT1s back then. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. So uh, that, this is where uh, it's going to get very interesting at this stage. This is, I suppose, this part of the race where we really do start to see how it unfolds. We start to see gaps appearing and in terms of the classes. And well, it's always tricky, isn't it, Simon, with the pit stops? It's always tricky when the pit stops start because there's always somebody pitting two, three laps later than someone else. So in the next five, ten minutes, I think you'll suddenly have a much clearer picture of who's in the chance of winning this race in every class. And I've got to say, what an outstanding job. That Rag is in. I think that's Rag is in. in. Finally comes in. So he's now yep, completed picks. 50 laps um, yes. out there on that set of tyres. Still lapping at really solid times. You saw the, the performance that he's put in has been absolutely yeah, outstanding. They're going to change tyres, change tyres, and they're changing drivers as well. Awesome stint from him, I have to say. Yeah, Gary Hirsch will get on board for this pet part of the lap. And a, a young, another young driver who's. Uh, really come to life he's a, he's a tiny little fella isn't he yeah really you hurts. saw the size of the seat insert going in you know it's almost like a anthony davis or an Alan mcnish seat insert isn't it <laughs> exactly he don't actually yeah, there's the alpine as well yeah and that uh, is chatin getting out of the car and he will be therefore putting in um is he putting punch and teach in at this stage that's going to be an interesting surely not that's relatively early to do that is it unless yeah, well, I mean, webb's going back in again maybe he's putting only webb back in again as uh Maybe they're just thinking, though, I mean, because they can, if you're changing tyres, you can afford to do a driver change because you're still going to manage to do it. It does look like Ollie Webb's helmet, doesn't it? I don't I'm not I sure. Don't, no, it's punch and teach, I thought, but anyway. But uh, you can actually get away, as we see the leader, or the person that was leading as they went out, looks like he stalled it there. He's got it fired up again, as that's Gary Hirsch leading, who was in the lead and is still shown in the lead. And because I think uh, the Alpine pitted behind him, he might well hold on to that lead. Simon Dolan stayed in, he's on an out lap, but that was a healthy lead that. Uh, the uh, Benoit Morin's team had over the uh, Jotas. I suspect he'll come back out here as we see him coming out to the pits in the lead still. 
Yeah, that's going to be a, a very significant stop. It did look relatively trouble-free, didn't it? Certainly. Oh, no. No, Dolan goes Dolan through. Dolan just goes through, and that is because he didn't take tyres. Yeah, and Bacchetta behind there. So the interesting thing going to be is that this uh, Gary Hirsch now explained to... Uh, You're right, it was Pianchetti. Yeah, uh, Pianchetti is on the, on the car, isn't it? Um, it, it explained to the, the guys at home exactly how the, the tyres are warmed in this process. Because it's not a tyre warmer blanket, is it? It's a different system that the guys use here. No, they do use tyre warmer blankets here. It's at Le Mans they don't. At Le Mans they use tents. But actually yep. here, they, they've actually got tyre blankets. So just like the Formula 1 technology. So the tyres are coming out, they're on the car hot. means you can get out there and get on it. I mean, the first corner as the chemicals release in the in the carcass and everything is always a little bit different but uh, other than that you can get on it straight away so we're going to hear from uh, down in the pits Pierre Rags is going to be talking to Curry a little bit because it's really hot um, I would like to know how was your double stint well, it will be fun uh, we make a good start and after I try to do my job uh, I'm the best uh, and it will be okay we have a good rhythm to compare all my all the other guys, so it will be fun now. Uh, I should be Gary and uh, Christian make a, a good stuff, a good job, and uh, it will be nice. Thank you. Yeah, he seems remarkably relaxed after all of that, and he Johnny. Yeah, he looks pretty good. Job. Looks pretty good. The hair's not out of place. It's uh, looking, looking, <laughs> looking good. So Dolan leads now, but he's only three tenths ahead of Gary Hirsch in the Benoit Morin car. So this is the fight now for the lead, and this is going to be interesting because don't forget the reason that Simon Dolan is leading here is because he didn't take tyres. So he is going to be certainly for the next 10, 15 laps going to be at serious disadvantage and uh, the grip level under braking and through the corners and off the apex and being able to get onto the throttle a lot earlier will be to Gary Hirsch's advantage in the, in the Royal Royal P2 car. Yeah and I guess the, the, the key now going to be for Dolan is, is how much uh, or how little time he can lose relatively speaking if he can hold on and keep in relatively good shape then we've got all four cars that well, well, punch at I mean Yes, absolutely, and, and, Lu and Luciano Bacchetta in the Greaves car is now only 2.6 seconds behind this battle that's going on, you can see him, and then Piantatici is behind him, who's just set the fastest final sector on his new rubber. Yeah. Uh, so this is turning into, and you can see there the grip level that he's got, I mean look at the grip, and Simon just defending the inside, but there's so much more grip for the 43 car there, this is only a matter of time before he passes it. Yeah, and I, and I guess Dolan will be conscious of that. I mean, look, he's held at tight alignment, sorry to interrupt, I just said, I mean, uh, I suspect he'll just he'll just drive past him before senior, but a great great job by Bacchetta. And again, the reason he's there is he's double stinting the tyres. Whereas the two cars basically at the moment first and third double stinted, second which is about to become first and fourth took tyres. And look at how much time Gonzalez lost in that stop. As you can see now, is he going to get it done? Is he going to go the long way around? I think he might have done. Oh, ooh, that's very marginal, isn't it? That's good from Simon Dolan. A full marks there for that. Full marks there for that. And not being intimidated at all, but look at this. Hirsch is just that's, using uh, that extra bit of grip yeah, again. And he's using that GT car as a bit of a buffer as well. Good. That was good. But again, that was good, but that's grip. That's just grip for you. And that's allowed Bacchetta to close right up here. And look at Pachitici round the outside, oh, over the kerb. And yes. remember that the the, uh, the the sausage kerbs have been made much that higher. That was a big the hit. Car. I mean, he, that was the, uh, the GT car there. I can't actually see what number that was, but really should have just got out of the way there and just let them through. And Luciano was desperately trying, to, and, and that's a great move down the inside there to see if he can make it hold. That's a fantastic move from Luciano there. Yeah, get it done. Straight back down the inside of him. This is where you're going to see a straight line difference between our car and the car next to so even though you've got a cleaner exit, but I think he's good enough, he'll hold him on the outside, he'll be loving this, this is like Formula 2 all over again. <laughs> yeah, basically you have single seater racers love a bit of wheel to wheel oh! stuff, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> that was good, but again, the difference between new tyres and the tyres that have done a stint, but he, he, he held on gamely there, but I suspect now... Pantici will just check out. Yeah, he definitely looks like uh, he's just got a little bit of grip everywhere. We can tell he has. Yeah. And uh, Bacchetta, I think, is, is given second, second and a half a yeah, lap tyres. Put up a game fight, but I think he's going to probably accept that for now that's the best that they can probably do. I, I, but the key thing is, is that they're in the really, hunt. You really, First, second, third, fourth, all within four seconds. You really couldn't say which one of these got, which of these cars is going to finish in which order, and who's going to be on the podium. Even at this stage, it's going to be tough. But it does, to me, look like I think between. The, the new blood car and between Panchatich and the Alpine seem to have the, the best overall pace. 
consistently throughout the I don't the know. I think when Albuquerque, because Simon Dolan's up there and he is, you know, even though we've been singing his praises with the greatest respect, probably the weaker of the three. Yeah. And I would say when uh, Albuquerque gets in that car, I think I think it's going to be a straight fight between the 43, 38 and 36 car. And I wouldn't count out the 28 Greaves car either. Yeah, and now Panchatichi has passed Dolan yes, as well. Yeah, again, new tyres. New tyres. Yeah. He's, uh, he's going to be on a mission now. After oh, 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 off goes that's Pacheta. Luciano, yes. Just pushing a little bit too hard, just making a slight mistake, hopefully, because it's very abrasive, these blue and red lines, aren't they? They've been deliberately yes, designed. And, and not just that, it's dirty as well. So much rubber and dirt and stuff out there. You go off out there and it's going to take him a few corners to clean his tyres back up. But he, sense, he sort of senses that there's a chance here, as you see him running wide again, you see, there's a chance here for him to actually overtake that other Zytec and it won't be lost on him that the car in front of him is actually the same car albeit probably in slightly different sort of configuration in terms of setup but it's the same car that he's in yeah now and with Simon Dolan at the wheel and he'll know that he has a sniff at, at getting past Simon so the question is where is Gary Hirsch on pace apart from the fact that he's got new tyres as a driver is he going to be able to maintain the pace that Panchatichi can deliver. It's going to well, be a tough gonna, ask, so we're gonna, isn't it? We're, I think potentially he is probably one of the best silvers out there. So uh, it'd be very, very interesting to see. Uh, I, his reputation could be made in the next sort of 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, no pressure then. No, no pressure, as you see now. Luciano right up behind and now we're going to see we've been wondering all day long whether we were quicker in a straight line than the Jota car or not so now we're going to find out yeah Dolan obviously uh, gets as defensive as he can be without being unfair Pachetta tries to go the long yes. way around needs to get it done early though for that one to stick doesn't it well he's now going back behind him as you can see us and uh, now he's got him he's got him he managed to slip stream all the way past him great great move was a very good move and Pachetta again uh, Clearly working the car well in these conditions. Maybe, again, this could be a situation where perhaps the experience he's got of the type of racing he's done, being used to those tyres going away, might be something that he can cope with the pace a bit better. I think, I think ultimately that is just the difference between a professional driver and someone that doesn't do his, earn his living from this, is that he knows exactly what he needs to do. He also is probably slightly more comfortable in a car at this stage with the tyres, a stint old, it's moving, a car moving around underneath him a little bit more. And I think it's, that is just what it's down to. I mean, that's, uh, that's not to be in any way disrespectful to Simon Dolan. I think he does a phenomenal job. Probably one of the very, very best silver drivers out there. But uh, I think that's just a, an, that's a Formula 2 champion overtaking someone that's, uh, that's doing this as as to make his life complete as yeah, a hobby. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a serious, serious competitor in Simon, yeah. but not a full professional. Exactly, simple yeah, as that. he would be the first to, to admit that. So Gary Hirsch now leads, having completed 55 laps uh, with Nelson Panciatici, not that far behind, four tenths of a second slower on that last, that 151.4 for Hirsch on a 151.8. How much now is the circuit starting to change in terms of grip levels when they're going offline like Hirsch had to do yeah. to overtake some of the GT cars? The track will be getting quicker and quicker and quicker as it rubbers in. Um, the temperatures will probably start dropping now. We're getting, what, 10 to 3 in the afternoon here in the next sort of half an hour ambient will start dropping slightly the engines will start picking up a little bit of horsepower as a result problem there for the pegasus car the 29 car it had a troubled start but having yeah. that stop and go early on and that has looks like that's the end of their day jonathan coleman on board the car at the moment so another of the lmp2 cars looking likely it's uh, not going to fish now it used to be back here sort of 10 years ago that when you saw the uh, LMP2 category at Le Mans, it was uh, who could finish the race was basically going to pretty much yes. win its class. Yeah. That's not the case at all now with these new cars, which have got a much more road-based engine in there as well, which is significant, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, and unfortunately, you know, which is one of the reasons why we had to retire our car earlier on, is, is that you're only allowed one engine for the season. That's so the engines are incredibly robust if you think you're only going to run one engine for the whole year. And I believe it's something if you change engines, you have to do a five-minute stop-and-go penalty, as we see again. This is a repeat, I think, of the 43 car taking the lead around the outside of Simon Dolan there. Um, yeah, and yes, he, he that's timed that very, very yeah, well. It, Just uh, got and back again, in this time. Is, uh, this is, that was after Luciano had been passed by the uh, Alpine of Pianchatici and... Uh, just diving down the inside to take him again and then losing out going down into turn one. 
It's always interesting, isn't it? Again, you see that side by side stuff. Both those guys sticking their elbows out, metaphorically speaking. So, you clean know, racing, though. Clean real racing. Clean. Yeah, but again, clean. I think really you, you, you'll get a situation with Bachetta, and you'll know from your single seat today, Johnny, that you, you do have a different mindset as a single seater driver yeah. to it, whether it's sports cars or prototype. Panchatich is still pretty much doing a bit of both. Yes. Um, and obviously, uh, as, you, as you said, with uh, Luciano, he's still very much of that mindset. Paziani, he's done a very, very good job, fastest in. GTC in qualifying now leading yep. um, ahead of Olivier Beretta and Mikkel Mack with uh, Scheiter being shown in 19th position when we saw that car stop. So clearly they've got that car going again. Yes, and yeah, but uh, looking back to GTE, Ben Barker still leading in the Porsche from McKenzie, but now Rugolo in the 55 AF Corsa car up into third place ahead of Talcanitza in the other 56 AF Corsa Ferrari with Pacini and then Armindo in fifth and sixth behind. Yeah, and the list of quality drivers keeps going on now. What we haven't seen is that there was a problem uh, early on for the uh, race performance car, the car that was started by Michel Frey and uh, Frank Maillard is now on board. It's a yellow flag at the top there. And, uh, yeah, it's showing yellow flag on the timing screen. Now, that's for the yeah, stationary, uh, stationary car yellow, okay, of yeah, the so. uh, Pegasus car that's been pushed out of the way, just a uh, you know, standard thing to give the marshals some protection yeah. whilst they recover the car. And uh, got to say, very efficient crews here, aren't they? It, it, I mean, it happens a lot in these series, but this particular circuit here, they seem to be super on it. Whenever there's an issue, they seem to get it sorted as much as possible. Now, down in the pit lane, we're going to get a chance to catch up with uh, some of the guys from Russian Bears, and hopefully we're going to get uh, Kareem to give us uh, a bit of a chance to see exactly what has been going on. I'm just waiting to see if, there, if she's... Free to start having a chat with the guys down there for us. Meanwhile, um, I think they're working out whether he speaks English. <laughs> exactly. Well, they, he speaks better than, than our Russian, anyway. That's for sure, John. I think maybe that's a language you need to learn in motorsport these days. It's such a big influence. So, um, we'll find out in a second what's going on. Meanwhile, problem for another puncher. Now, this is—is is that? That's not the same. That's a 71 car. We jinxed it. That's yeah. the first time I've ever done the commentator's curse. Persiani. Persiani just comfortably leading GTC there with a, a puncture in the left rear tyre. And such frustration. Interesting, that's the same... Is that the same tyre that we saw go down? Now, this one has delaminated yeah, and fallen this apart. One, this one that's he, lost big chunks of rubber flying off of that. Again, Again, that's showing a little bit of inexperience there. Just far too quick coming down. I mean, look at the speed he's going at. Far too quick coming back to the pits. Yeah, Kirill Ladigan there looking on and shaking his head. Now, we were going to get an interview down there, I think, now. That's perhaps uh, was who, I think that was who um, uh, uh, Karim was going to be talking to. Yeah, it was, yeah. I think they did, yeah, look, oh, at, look the at the damage. I mean, look at the difference between that and the way Mediani brought his car back. Yeah. And even the left rear uh, brake lights popped out. Yeah, and that's, uh, how much difference would that make to the run of the car? Now let's have a look and see if we can work out, oh, this is, I think, when the tyre finally... I mean, in his defence... It doesn't look like he slows down at all there, does it? But in his defence, it happens to him on the straight. So it's going pretty quick when it happens. But you look there, he's still really not slowing down that much. Yeah, and that's going to be, at that point, they're probably doing, what, 140, 150 miles an hour? Yeah, like at easy. least more than that, probably. As they're accelerating up to top yeah. speed there, of course. Well, he would have been in top at that point. Yeah, and so. that's... Uh, Lucky, lucky guy, left rear going at that point, could have easily pitched him right across the circuit. Well, it goes back to the tyre technology you were talking about before, that you don't have blowouts that suddenly lose you everything and just spear you off the track. It's uh, the tyres themselves, but you can see, look at the, the damage that will be doing underneath. I'd be very surprised to see if they can just ping another left tyre on and let that go. At least cosmetic work. That's going to put the uh, sister car... <laughs> Three Russian Bears car, sorry, SMP car. So I used to call them SMP Russian Bears when they started. Uh, of Olivier Beretta into the lead ahead of Mikkel Mack. And uh, Persiani dropping down the order. I think uh, Spiracioli is going to come into the podium position. Oh. And, uh, oh my goodness me, that is completely... I love the way they check that. Have a quick look. Yeah, that looks fine. Stick it on, send him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just drop it. <laughs> is the roll bar broken? No, don't worry about it. Off it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, you know, that, I suppose in theory, th th there's a good point because unless you are... They'll have another puncture if they send it out like that. Yeah, you're either very thorough and yeah. you literally look through everything that could potentially cause you an issue. Now they've obviously, the team managers have probably said, get some tape on it now. You see, really, they should have taped that before they put the wheel on. 
Yeah, and I, I really, that's not going to do it. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago in British GTs, Jim and, Jim and, uh, and Glenn Geddy were leading a race, had a, a problem with the front of the car, came in, they put tape on the front of the car. As it drove down the pit, all the tape blew off. So it was like kind of completely and utterly wasting the time, really, of, of doing it. But look at that, the, the SMP team, so frustrated with that. And it's uh, two punches for their cars. Yeah. I don't suppose there's any, is, can you see any link potentially? Well, I've seen a, quite a lot of the GTE and GTC cars using a lot of kerbs, so you might have picked up a puncture that way. I remember last year, my last stint when we were coming in, uh, you know, it was all about winning the championship and my engineer getting on the radio and saying, whatever you do, do not touch the kerbs. Yeah. And so it doesn't help if you touch kerbs, it puts a lot more force through the tyre, so. And I guess, you know, there's always a danger if you hit a kerb at the wrong angle, you can t cut the tyre as well. It's yeah, unlikely, exactly. but it can happen. No, it just puts more pressure on the tyre, makes it more likely to have a puncture. But sometimes you just get a puncture because you get a puncture. It's just unlucky. It's like when you get a puncture on the road, you know. Yeah, just it happens. So the leader is uh, being closed down now, I think, by Nelson Panciatici. The leader overall, Gary Hirsch, last time round was uh, half a second slower than Panciatici. The gap now down to 2.461 seconds last time through. Um, um, and basically, it means that uh, with both those cars running on uh, similar sort of lap, uh, similar yeah. sort of tire conditions, both having new tires on yeah, the I'm same lap. Yeah, I'm here with, uh, with Kirill Adigin. Of course, all the team is very disappointed. Uh, you were uh, be, uh, winning, and uh, what happened with the tire? Yeah, uh, explodes uh, tires. Rear uh, left. Uh, we lost uh, many time. Uh, I think we will fight, of course. And like us <laughs> of course yeah quite disappointing thank you so much so well he pretty much summed it up there <laughs> <laughs> oh, he explodes <laughs> you know like really yeah yeah that's very <laughs> concise it's very concise and insightful interview from Guru Ledig in there but uh, yeah no ultimately it's it basically means that that you know that, that that situation for those guys has been compounded by the fact that now the time has dripped drifted away from them but obviously now they've got a situation where they've got to try and push so so hard on that that tires and if the big thing of course is it's thrown their strategy out completely isn't it this means that they're all of the uh, all of the, the plans they had of who they were going to stop putting in the car at when different tires all that kind of stuff that's gone yeah yeah they, they, it does it just it, at that point you're playing catch up you just get out there and do the best you can and just literally drive it like you stole it and hope that at the end of the race it pans back out for you and you get back into position but uh, interesting that the first uh, overall leaders in LMP2 now. We talked about Gary Hirsch just did a 52-1. Uh, Panciatici did a 52 flat. And then uh, Bacchetta, sort of 10 seconds behind. Didn't quick on that lap, but the lap before I noticed he was quite quick. And uh, he's pulled six seconds now, Simon Dolan in fourth. And Rodolfo Gonzalez now, a good another 12 seconds or so behind Simon Dolan, which just shows you how much that tardy pit stop cost them. And then uh, still, we keep saying, don't we, Ben Barker. In the still Porsche, leading, yeah. Still leading. This time, Rugolo is now second, some 18 seconds behind. And with, I don't know, you'll probably know Simon, but Ben Barker seems like he's been in the car forever, but he must be the second driver in, I'm assuming, or isn't he? No, no, he's, he's been in from the beginning. So, so who's got to go in that car? So they're going to put in uh, Mike um, Wainwright for, I think, a relatively short stint. Right. So and then they're going to have a long stint, a longish stint for uh, Adam Carroll at the last part of the race. Right, so, so there's the no way that car can win this race then, effectively. No, I think it's going to yeah. struggle because of the, the, the yeah. time that they're going to have Wainwright in the car. Looking at the lap times, Mike, although he's, he's you know, you know, does a very, very solid job. He's yeah. just nowhere near at the level of the three guys. Because obviously are in the Rugolo car's got Griffin to go, so th so that's putting them in for championship, and uh, and they might even be able to seal the championship here actually if, if the Bertolini car doesn't finish. Yeah, and it would be uh, or it would not maybe seal it 100%, but certainly put them in a really strong position going to Estoril. Yeah, well the Bertolini car we saw having that problem in Shaitar on board the car now is running down in let's have a look at uh, what's eighth position i think in class um so it's going to be impossible to get any significant points for that car after the problem they had early yeah, he's on one, he's one lap behind yeah and uh, he might be able to they might be able to with bertolini if the car's strong and not damaged he might be able to get up to fourth or fifth though to be fair so it's still not over for them interestingly last lap through uh, gary hirsch set uh, fastest sector two personal fastest sector two there so clearly the, the car's working well and he's pushing it hard 52 7 though we've seen in fact gonzalez 51 9 the quickest of the lmp2 cars at the moment out there by quite some way as well so clearly gonzalez although he's um, and another 51 8 yeah although he's lost all that time he's 
lapping and the Murphy prototypes car is working very, very well. So, you're going to get a chance to see a quick recap and highlights of the second hour here at Paul Ricard. So the first thing that was significant was the pit stop and driver change. Pierre Rags coming in and handed over to Gary Hirsch for the race leading uh, car of New Blood by Morand. And uh, likewise, at the same time, we saw Nelson Panciatici taking behind, over the yes. Alpine car. And both those stops went reasonably well. A little bit of a delay for Hirsch. We've got this very unusual system of uh, of how the uh, the limiter works on these cars, haven't you, Joe? It sort well, of. I don't uh, know. I normally just press the throttle and drop the clutch in first <laughs> gear. It seems to do the trick. Yeah, it seems to work. I was watching the cars yesterday in free practice, and you hear them on the limiter as they go out all yeah. straight away. No, it, to be fair, it's difficult because you're not allowed to. As we saw again, this was the fight for the lead, wasn't it? Uh, Gary Hirsch getting past Dolan, wasn't it? And, and then, then that was, a, yeah, you saw how much air there Luciano Bacchetta got in the uh, 28 Greaves car and allowed Panchatici a, a run on him and then he dived straight back down the inside of him a couple of corners later, as we're seeing right here. And then uh, going into turn one again, you'll see that, uh, that uh, Luciano then uh, had another sort of defend, tried to keep him on the outside and locked up there. You can just see a bit of smoke as he locks up and that allowed Panchatici to come around the outside. That was a great move. For me, actually, that was the move of the race so far, that. That was a really clean, good move. What, well, from Panchatici? Yes, yeah. yeah. To especially well. to do it on someone like Luciano to get around the outside. So this is where we saw uh, Mediani have the problem and then the... Uh, no, the that's... Uh, oh, Ladigan, is that's it? That's Ladigan, uh, yeah. Ladigan's car. Um, uh, so it was Persiani on board rather than uh, at the time, wasn't it? And, uh, yeah... Just that again, it just got out and yeah. uh, Persiani got in. Frustration for the team. And, and it, it highlights what a, a, across the board, what a competitive team this, this group of guys are. They're working so, so well. Got some very good engineers invo involved as well. We saw a bit of a party going on as well on the rooftop uh, for the fans to enjoy. So we go back to live racing action with just under two hours to go. So we're halfway through the race. 1.86 seconds. The gap has come down to now for New Blood by Baran over Signatech with the Greaves Motorsport car in third of Luciano Bacchetta ahead of Jota Sport a further 13 seconds behind that and then the Murphy prototypes car pushing very hard it still was Ben Barker it is Ben Barker eighth overall leading Giacomo Puccini in uh, the 80 car and then in third position in the pits now Daniel McKenzie he'll be handing over to George Richardson I think and then further back, Matt Griffin now is on board the Ferrari. Now the mission starts, Johnny Molan, doesn't it? Yes, uh, Matt Griffin now in. Um, I'm not sure whether it's going to pan out that he's going to be able to drive to the end, though. So it may be that Duncan Cameron has to get back in again. I don't quite know the driving rules now with the three drivers in GTE. You probably know better than I do, Simon. Well, I think that it's, it's very, going to be very marginal, isn't it? But uh, I'm guessing that's what they're trying to do, is to see if they can keep... Griff on board for that period it of time. It may be that Rugolo has to get back in. I know that Matt, as the gold, cannot drive more than one stint. Yeah, so that would probably uh, mean an all, almost certainly a change. But in which case, it's surprising he's in at that stage, if that is the case. Well, I think they were talking about Rugolo doubling, but it's quite a hard work around here in a GT car. It's not exactly cool today, and it's actually quite a physical track. I know it's got a long straight, but it's quite a physical track, and I think potentially they were thinking it would be better to single Rugolo and then put Matt in. But Hirsch is doing a solid job. He's got the gap back up to 5.27 uh, seconds. Now I think we've seen a change where Gonzalez has got ahead yeah, of he's Dolan. Dolan as well. I mean, Simon really does seem to be struggling a bit on this second. Let's not forget he's not on new tyres. Everyone around him, apart from Luciano Bacchetta in the 28 Greaves car, is on new tyres the last two pit stops. Simon uh, in the 38 Zytec and the. Uh, 28 Greaves side take of Bacchetta did not change tyres and the Zytec traditionally I know this from old is very very good on its tyres very light on its tyres but this is a very abrasive track this this track is extremely hard on tyres and Dunlop have been seeing a lot more tyre wear this weekend than they did at the prologue test and so they were a little bit more concerned so I don't know what the other teams are doing but certainly for the Greaves car it's probably again not giving away any secrets at the moment we're running basically hard cut the hardest compound tyre all the way around apart from the right front which is a medium so that's showing how how concerned we are as we see a little bit of a the uh, louver sticking up on the left front wing there of the 38 Jota car but that going back to what I was saying about tyres that just shows you the concern that certainly our team has and I'm assuming the other teams as well to do with tyre wear. So here is Nelson Panciatici on board the Alpine the Signatech run car 
current champions from 2013 winning the series this time last year and in great shape they could potentially come away extending their championship lead current championship leaders once uh, we get to the latter stage of this race but Panchatici has got a job in hand as Gary Hirsch now sets his personal fastest lap of the race, 150.672. That's, that's impressive. That's we were saying, weren't we, that the next 15 minutes might decide. And that's that's a great lap from that's Hirsch, a, isn't That's it? an awesome lap time. That's an awesome lap time at that point. That's significantly quicker than anybody else has done out there. And I think that just probably seals the, his fate next year that he will not be a silver-ranked driver. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's always a challenge, isn't it, to try and, you know, it in, a, is in a perfect world, the lower ranking you are in terms of the opportunity the you got, the better The better it? it is. I mean, uh, that's the thing. I mean, uh, there are more opportunities for silver drivers to get paid if, if, you, if you're a quick silver than there would be if they then get moved up to gold and suddenly it becomes a whole different ballpark because you're competing against top-line factory-line professional drivers that have been doing this a long time. So, yeah, that is good. And it's a, it's a, I can understand the need of the system, but it's a, it's a difficult moving target for someone like the uh, ACO to, to do this ranking system because drivers obviously get better, you know. And yeah, and sometimes you get situations where the, the car or the team might flatter a driver or vice versa. Yeah, exactly. and that it's very difficult to judge. The car is so important in motorsport, so it's very difficult to judge uh, exactly what the drivers are. He's a nice little slipstream there on the 67 Porsche. Yeah, the Imps that competition the, car. Uh, that was actually a GTC, I think, and a GTE. E car being slipped in by a GTC car. Another top line driver in that car, Eric Hellery, of course, a former Le Mans winner. Yeah, last in the past 1993 well. for Peugeot. There's hope for me yet, Simon. All these old guys driving well, still, earning a living. Well, it's the only one you've not got in your collection, is it, Le Mans, John? Oh, I've been on the podium at Lawn, don't, don't. Yeah. I've been on the podium, I've led a few times in class, but I've never actually, uh, never actually won at Le Mans, which is, yes. That, that hurts a little bit. But uh, Daytona and Street bring not to you. But you got the watch, yeah. didn't you? John? Got the watch. Yes, you got the yeah. watch. Yeah. yeah. I remember you bringing that to work one day. We, John and I used to work together as race instructors many years ago, and uh, and I was uh, I got very close to chopping his hand off at that point. That's yeah. uh, very proud of uh, of John that weekend, as uh, as all of us were. But anyway, let's go back to the racing action. Gary Hirsch leads now by uh, 6.86 seconds. So he's really put in two or three yeah. laps. Which if you're Pancha Tichy, you probably would have been getting a gap on your race or on your board or wherever yeah, it would have be, been and knowing and it you're on the been, same tyres um, a bit like um, it would have been very very difficult for him emotionally I would have think Jesus I'm pushing my what's it's off to try and close that yeah. gap down and I'm, and, up against, and I'm up against the so-called not quickest driver in the car yeah. you know supposedly uh, yeah, uh, that's, so yeah you're let exactly alone when, right. when Cleon gets in what well, his potential shows that car that car must be working absolutely brilliantly so there's no doubt that uh, he's going to be in, a, in great shape. Now, in a moment, hopefully, we'll get a chance to catch up with Paul of Chatel, who uh, did a, such a superb job in his stint in the Alpine uh, car, the Signatec car. So, in just a moment, we're going to get a chance to see from uh, Paul of So, let's hear from Karim and Paul of Chatel. So obviously uh, not quite ready just yet. I think there's uh, down in the pit sometimes occasionally it's very difficult for uh, uh, Karine to pick up the signals from when they're ready. So I think we uh, might be ready this time as we watch a great battle on circuit. But Karine is going to talk to Paul Loup Chatan. Yes, I'm with Paul Loup Chatan, you're right. Uh, I would like to know, uh, you're doing simple stints. Are you continuing with uh, this strategy or not? Ah, it's a good question. We start on this strategy because for us it was uh, the best that we can do, but uh, we don't know the other team. Some team did a double stint. We are checking that with Dunlop and the engineer for the moment. All the team on Dunlop did a great job. So we have to see. He's not sure for the moment to, to continue on one stint or to do a double. Okay, thank you. So meanwhile, we've been watching this wonderful battle going on out on circuit. The uh, fight that we've seen there between the AF Corsa car and the Pro GT by Amaris car third and fourth in the GTC battle. So the car with uh, Frank Pereira and uh, Spirizioli fighting very, very hard. And that uh, that could go down to the wire. Spirizioli was right on the pace here last year in the 
uh, Trofeo by Mazda, uh, by Mazda, by um, Maserati. Yeah. <laughs> Nearly right. Yeah. There's a bit of a difference. I think you'd be a bit upset. Slightly, yeah. <laughs> a bit upset if a Mazda was delivered instead of a Maserati if you'd order one. But uh, nothing wrong with Mazda. It's great cars. Anyway, um, the point being is that this fight is going absolutely to the wire, isn't it? These guys are um, uh, very different cars, very different level of driving experience as well. Uh, Fun Pereira, one of those guys that we've seen uh, right... Uh, in the mix, and another, another guy that's very well known in the in the French uh, scene, and a little bit in Europe, but perhaps not as well known on some of the high, high yeah. level global stuff. Yeah, doing a fantastic. Uh, it's all about having great racing, and we've got that. You know, third and fourth place in GTC, having a great fight here, very even at the moment, no contact, and uh, it's looking really, really good for them, and really strong. And uh, Matt Griffin just set the fastest lap of his of the, his car for the race with a 57.3, so that's really good pace there, right up there. So. Uh, yeah, really good, and uh, it looks like it's going to turn into a really, really great race, Simon. So I'm going to... Watch with fantastic interest. Fantastic move oh, there. He blew it. And he blew it. The 93 there, just first into first corner. So there's no way that he's not going to have to give that back. Yeah, well, Johnny, you've he's been... He's going to have to let him back in front now. There's no doubt in my mind that they'll have to let him back. Otherwise, he'll get a penalty. And if he does let him back in front, he might get a penalty. Mate, was it? It was a bit ambitious, wasn't it, to say least? But listen, he gave it a go. It's been absolutely superb. Uh, Thank you, Simon. It's been a by, pleasure. By Johnny Molum, as uh, frustrating as it has been for his race to be ended uh, right at the beginning when Paul Matt McMurray got caught out on the first corner. But a uh, great addition to the European Le Mans coverage. Let's just, just before you go, talk us through this bit. <laughs> oh, he got a massive oversteer at the apex, and that's why he had to go straight. Uh, but a fantastic effort. He's down the inside, and he just had to break so late, lock the rear slightly, as we see Matt Griffin's car there running wide. But, uh, it was looking really, really good there. Really nice move, and that's what this is about. So it's been a pleasure, Simon. And for those of you that are watching, I'd suggest you stay and watch the last half an hour at least, because I think it's going to be a real grandstand finish in all the classes. It will indeed, as we watch George Rich. And so thanks for Johnny Mullen. We'll let Johnny go away and, and take a well earned breather. And um, hopefully, we'll watch to see how your teammate gets on Luciano Bacchetta. So, we're watching George Richardson on track at the moment in uh, the JMW Ferrari. He's uh, the driver who has been racing from, for some time now back in uh, in the UK initially and things like Ginetta Juniors and moved into Porsche Carrera Cup and then a little bit of racing in the States has been part of the sports car scene and thoroughly enjoying the JMW racing team uh, set up here and, and basically has been uh, one of those drivers that has got his head round the, uh, the the challenges that they've seen of racing in sports car racing very, very quickly. But what we've been watching at the front, the battle that's been going on in terms of the uh, the prototype battle, the LMP2, has been fascinating. And at the moment, it's a great battle between Gary Hirsch and Nelson Panciatici for the lead. But on a mission and coming through after a couple of relatively tough stops is Rodolfo Gonzalez. And the man that started the race on pole position in his first ever race with Mo Murphy prototypes is Brazilian driver Pipo Durani who's taking the time to come and join us in the commentary box. Pipo, that was an exciting first few laps for you. Yeah, it was definitely uh, a nice fight with Harry. Uh, we obviously know each other from the Formula 3 last year. Uh, unfortunately, I chose the wrong side when I was overtaking the GT. But that's, that's how it is. Uh, but we are looking good, very happy with the performance and uh, fingers crossed for our strategy come, come together. So uh, obviously you saw um, at the last lot of stops, we saw um, Rodolfo look like it, oh, the, the stop wasn't quite as slick as it may be. Was that a, was that a delay or was it just, a, just one of those stops that came across as being a bit slower? Well, uh, it was a little bit slower. Uh, we tried to cool the brakes a little bit, uh, doing something. So, after, I mean, I think it's good. Uh, he's doing a good job recovering. Uh, and yes, hopefully, hopefully he can bring home. We can bring home to the podium. So, have you had a chance to absorb the different drivers' paces out there? Gary Hirsch at the moment is just set fastest lap for him personally, uh, a lap or two ago, and Panchitichi putting a lot of pressure on him. There's some very interesting performances going on out there in the LMP2 class. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, for me, it's been everything new, you know, all these things with driver change and uh, silver drivers and gold drivers. But obviously, you got to try to have the best combination possible and the uh, smallest gap between your three drivers. That's how you're going to win races. Uh, obviously, it's not only that. On the four hours race, you got to, you got to, everything got to come together. Uh, but yeah, it's very, it's very nice. The driver must use its brain uh, much more than a sprint race. Uh, you got to pay attention 
on everything, you know, the tires, engine, uh, and it's been great. I'm having so much fun. This, uh, this is my endurance debut and I'm really happy. Yeah, and it's obviously uh, interesting the, the, the mixture of drivers that you have in your car with uh, Rodolfo, yourself and of course uh, uh, Nathaniel, all very experienced single-seater drivers at the highest level as well. Of course, Nathaniel, GP2, Rodolfo as well, yourself, Formula 3 and, and some racing in America as well. So do you think that helps that you all understand the aerodynamics and the balance of things like this, uh, perhaps, and, and maybe somebody who's come from a GT background? Yeah, I think, you know, coming from a single-seater, especially the ones we we came from, uh, you, you are used to work with the downforce, and this car has a lot of downforce, so it's pretty similar to drive to a Formula, uh, much, much similar than driving a GT. So obviously it helps, uh, we gotta get used to it, because it is a bit different, but at the end of the day, uh, coming from Formulas, for sure, um, it gives us a little bit of advantage. So this is an interesting fight we're just watching here for a moment, just to concentrate on the action on track. We've got George Richardson in a Jam W Ferrari uh, being put under pressure by uh, Matt Griffin, who's one of the most established, the current champion, of course, in the uh, uh, European Le Mans Series in the GTE class last year with Johnny Molum, who's joined us a little bit earlier. And Griffin clearly put in pressure on young George, who's doing a great job uh, of battling up. This, uh, this, this circuit, as you see the, uh, the, the Ligier come in, um, this circuit has some sections where it does really look like it's, it's very, very different, difficult not to uh, be affected by the car in front in terms of the aero, etc. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you come on the back straight, uh, we are actually pulling up to top speed a bit quicker than the GTs but it gets to a moment where the GT starts to, to be quicker than us. So it's definitely a place where you need to be very careful with, with some drivers. Um, obviously, they, they have to break for that for that corner. We do not. So it's a bit tricky to manage. You either going to overtake on the outside or in the inside. But yeah, uh, it, it's a track that at least you have some runoff areas. In case of something, you gotta uh, you got to be paying attention because you might have to go uh, and avoid something, but in, in the end of the day, uh, it's going to be always like this with the GTs and the LMP. Now, in the first few laps, it was a really interesting little battle between you and Harry, as you were saying, and uh, it did look at the end of this straight here that um, that the, the, at one point the Murphy car seemed a little bit quicker, uh, moving away, but then Harry, I think maybe just because he's more familiar with the car, just seemed to be quite quick through the right hand and put a bit of pressure on, but you, one thing that was interesting, you never looked like you were, felt like you were taking the pressure, it looked very calm, relaxed, in a nice groove, and it was only that, as you said, that uh, maybe, maybe guessed the wrong way of going past the traffic that cost you the, the position yeah that for sure uh, going uh, first time dealing with the traffic that co got me the position he caught me and overtook me cost me the position but uh, yeah it looks like uh, they were running a little bit more wings so they were pulling a bit less on the straights but onto the fast corner he, he managed to get the gap back a little bit and maybe try to attack a few times in the corner in the corner after uh, but yeah, you know, the team taught me really well. They made me really calm with no pressure. So I think it went, it went really smooth. Yeah, it's a great engineering team that you got at uh, Murphy Prototypes as well. And some fabulous drivers, not just this year, but previously, of course, Brendan Hartley racing with the team last season has gone on to become a factory driver with Porsche. So it's a great thing for you, as you said, it's making your debut in, in sports cars with a team like this, moving forwards with them and then maybe into other arenas in, in the future. Yeah, uh, that's that's the point of coming to a sports car. Uh, Greg has a good historic with uh, with Brandon, and he taught him well. I hope he he can taught me well too. Uh, but I'm I'm very happy. I mean, there's lots to learn. That's for sure. It's very it's my very first race in the endurance. I need to get better on pace. I need to understand the car a little bit better and know the tracks that I don't know. Uh, but so far so good, and I'm really happy. And it's uh, it's great to see you part of. Uh, we'll see you over in the UK for a long time, and uh, and I know you're only 20 years old, but it feels like you've been part of the scene over here for a long time. Do you feel comfortable in Europe now? Do you feel like it's uh, it's not quite home, but you feel happy here? Yeah, no, definitely. I feel I feel more at home here than in Brazil, to be honest with you. Uh, when I'm back there, it feels that I'm away from from my job, from from what I love. So when I'm here, I'm, I feel very happy and I'm, I'm used already. I've been here for the past four years. So yeah, uh, sometimes a weather like this with a lot of sun makes me feel even more at home. Yeah. Uh, in the UK, you know that sometimes, sometimes no, or most of the times you are 
it's a uh, bit colder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that make me feel that made me feel uh, miss home a little bit, but. Um, yeah, I'm very used to, to Europe and I, and I enjoy being here. Yeah, and, and I think I've you know, met a lot of Brazilian drivers over the years. It's a similar thing that, you know, uh, they like the people, they like the place, they like the environment. The racing, of course, is superb, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's only when the sun comes out it's weather. Now, Hirsch, let's go back to watch the action from Owen Hirsch now. 71 laps down, 12 seconds ahead of Panchatichi. Now having to really work hard in the traffic and... Uh, Gonzalez now uh, got down to within a, a second, I think, of, uh, of Pochetta. So, interesting, looks like Rodolfo is going to be challenging for a podium once again. Well, I hope so, you know, to be on the podium on my debut, it wouldn't be that bad, okay, I have to say. And uh, fingers crossed for him, he's definitely doing a very, very good job. And of course, you still have uh, Nathaniel to get in the car as well. I'm guessing for the last part of the race, he's going to be on board. And uh, how much do you, do you pick up from working with a guy like Nathaniel who's got that experience of these cars, especially? As well, of course, you can understand from your both of you having a high level single seater background. No, for sure. Uh, Nathaniel has been doing a great job. He's been working with the team already for a while. He did Le Mans. So it's a guy that I really look after. And uh, it's very good to share information with, he, with him because I can learn. Uh, not only the experience he has with endurance already, but the experience he already had in his racing career. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been so far so good in the first weekend for sure. I have a lot to learn and a lot to ask him. But yeah, we're looking forward for him uh, going into the car and, and driving. Uh, we think he can be really quick also in the end of the race. So yeah, in good shape, in good shape. And that, that lap time he did this morning was quite remarkable. An absolutely amazing lap. I mean, it is, I was watching the, the commentator on the qualifying saying that yesterday low 49 was a good time. Today they get in the 48s and maybe low 48 and then boom, 47 eight. It was uh, a hell of a time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, we were expecting to be quicker than yesterday, that's for sure, because it was in the morning. Uh, not that much quicker. Uh, fortunately, he, he managed to put it on pole. Uh, on the, his second second lap, he was P1, and then he got dropped by Tinknil. Um, in the garage, uh, Greg said to me, you know, not bad to start from ball from your first race. And immediately when he said that, Tinknil got the position back. Uh, and then he just did a fantastic job putting another lap together. And, you know, I think he couldn't have done any better. Uh, he definitely extracted everything from the car. Yeah. Now we're getting some fabulous GT action on circuit, people. Let's have a little watch for a moment and see what's unfolding here. We've got uh, Mike Wainwright in the Porsche that was leading for so long with Ben Barker on board. And now the 95 cars, Pirazzioli, one of the Castle Racing cars, uh, putting a bit of pressure on him. That's not for position. That's a little bit further down the order of the lead now. Matt Griffin leads George Richardson and uh, Mirko Venturi is the first three GTE cars. And for GTC, it's Olivier Barretta and Mikkel Mack. And, uh, and then Spirizioli that we were just watching is the top three. It must be very difficult when you're in uh, traffic and you know these guys are fighting for their own position. That's something that you won't have experienced before in your uh, Formula 3 days, for example, where you know you race against the guys you race against. And uh, if you're out of position, then you're racing with someone that's still in the same yeah. same race, but not for position. Panchatichi coming through. That must be tough, knowing how to judge judge where to position the car. Yeah, it was uh, definitely something new for me. Like I said before, uh, some drivers, the pro drivers, they uh, they pay attention more, so they know where you are. Uh, and it makes life a little bit e easier, but sometimes um, the amateur driver, uh, he doesn't know, he doesn't look too much on his mirror, so you, you gotta pay attention, you gotta make the work for yourself and for the other for the other driver. So yeah, it's been a little, a, a little tough, unfortunately I did lose the lead uh, of the race on a situation like that, but that's all learning and I'm looking forward uh, to improving myself race by race. Yeah, it's a good experience. And we saw Emmanuel Collard, another very, very experienced guy coming in there with a problem clearly um, in uh, in the Ferrari. So let's see if we can understand what that problem is a little bit later on. Meanwhile, Gary Hirsch still leading, 74 laps now completed. Uh, 154, 152 last time round. It was down in the low 151s a moment ago, Pipo, which is a is a pretty impressive lap time at this stage in the race as the as the track's changing. Yeah, for sure. Um, there are some dri drivers uh, on different strategies and better tires. There are some of them who are still um, with with more fuel and uh, and uh, more tires. Here we can see a battle between the Signatech and the Ligier, which. Uh, 
it was a bit uh, emotional, I'd say. <laughs> a bit emotional. Good description. <laughs> yeah, certainly uh, tight. I think was a. Yeah. yeah, that's where you 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 know that these guys. It, and it's, I guess it's probably a better time than ever for drivers like yourself to move across into into this kind of racing because you do drive a sprint race. You don't drive a, like many years ago it used to be a careful race, looking after tyres and brakes and things like this. Now it's just push, push, push all the time. Yeah, I'd say uh, in in a four hour race you you do go more close to the limit than you would on the 24 hour Le Mans but like you said yeah it's very it's a very good time for me to come to, to move over to sports car and uh, I can't I can't be more happy to to be doing this because I know there's many drivers who only think about Formula 1 Formula 1 Formula 1 and um, in the end of the day you gotta you gotta make a career you gotta leave a motorsports and I think here is the place to do it now just a perfect timing we got your uh, co-driver Rodolfo Gonzalez uh, coming through, currently sitting third in class and uh, now uh, let's have a look done, 10 seconds behind Panciatici, lap times wise, uh, lap time not showing last time through, I think we had a bit of a glitch with the timing and it's because it's showing that uh, Rodolfo's in the pits at the moment, which he clearly isn't, um, so we'll have a watch for that in a moment, but it looks like the car seems to be working, it's difficult to tell obviously without watching, I know you've you were listening to the team radio a little bit earlier and everything seemed to be going okay from Rodolfo's point of view? Yeah, I think uh, everything is coming together. Uh, definitely, like you said, we had a little bit slow, slower pit stop, the first one. But, I mean, the car is good. Uh, Rodolfo is saying he's comfortable with the car and everything. So, uh, yeah, all good. It must be very strange as well when you're so used to just focusing on your own driving to, to allow have to uh, benefit or lose from the other guys around you. Obviously, I, I saw the, your reaction in the pit after um, the pole position was achieved by Natanya. It's like like you've done it yourself. You know, you're very proud for the team, but but it's good to see that that relationship is already a strong one with the, you and the other guys. Yeah, I mean, this is a teamwork, you know, and uh, I'm sure that uh, in the end of the day there is a, an influence because we do say the same things about the car so if Nathaniel would say that the car was oversteer and I would say car was understeer that for sure would cause us problems because uh, we would have gone uh, different, different directions so I'm happy that uh, I was very happy for the pole position because this is a team is a teamwork I know that if he does well he's gonna put me in a better position so there's no reason why not to be uh, that happy and express myself that way. Yeah, it's good and very Brazilian as well, which we like. <laughs> in nice, good, it's a good way. Uh, so yeah, we're watching this this uh, this little fight here, the 24 car, which is Andrea Roda on board now in the Sebastian Love, the only car that's running on Michelin tires as well. So um, that could be a factor for those guys. Could work for them, work for work against them. It's very difficult to say because they have no one else to compare with, I suppose. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's difficult because they are completely different manufacturers, and uh, for sure, uh, one might have an advantage one place, the other might have an advantage uh, in another track. But so far, uh, I think we have a good combination driver, uh, driver car and tires. So looking forward. So now pull up Chatan back in the car. Uh, also Philippe Albuquerque back in their car. So I'm guessing it's going to be uh, not too much longer before we might see a change and uh, Nathaniel get on board your car. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully soon. Uh, hopefully soon. Soon. I I don't know exactly at what time uh, Nathaniel will jump in, but uh, we're looking forward to see him drive. So, people, I'm going to let you go back to the team and uh, enjoy the remainder of the race. But I just want to say a big thanks for everyone and for all our viewers for taking the time to come and join us. And uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of your, your first race, people. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here, commentating a little bit about the race. I certainly don't know too much at the moment. I, maybe I get better race by race. But, yeah, thank you very much. Well, and, we'll, uh, see we'll, you soon. We may be having you back at Estoril. If, uh, if hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Can, okay, thanks very thank much. You. And I'll, uh, I'll let you go. And thank Thanks to, to Paul Grogan and everyone at uh, Murphy Prototypes for uh, for delivering the diminutive Pipo Durrani to the uh, to the the uh, commentary box. I'm going to get back into the zone and understand exactly what we've got going on as we see the change now. Pull up Chatan is on board, and we're going to focus on how him, Rodolfo Gonzalez, and Gary Hirsch battle it out for the balance of the race. Likewise, Philippe Albuquerque on board and uh, looking very, very quick immediately as he's jumped on board the Jota Sport car. The battle for the GTA honours looks like it may well be uh, looking a bit more solid for Matt Griffin in the 55 car. That 
is going to massively help their championship position because the championship leaders in GTE are likely, uh, if they continue in that vein, to put themselves into such a strong position going into the remainder of the, uh, the or the final race weekend, rather, at Estoril, as we should see Chatan, who was so impressive in the first part of the race, already looking like he's on an absolute mission. And that's one of the things we were chatting with Johnny Mola earlier on when he was joining us in the commentary box about how much easier it is for them, uh, or not easier, but how much uh, more impressive it is when you see these guys get on to it so quickly um, uh, in terms of being able to actually get to a, a lap time straight away. Bertolini, who uh, was with Zlobin and Shaitar second in the championships, comes in. In comes uh, the, uh, the leading car. The Morgan Judd car is in. Gary Hirsch is getting out of the car and Christian Klein is now on board. So we now have former Grand Prix driver and Peugeot factory driver and a new set of tyres going on for Christian Klein. He will be heading back out into the fray any second now. And it'll be interesting to see where he pops back out relative to the rest of the top line cars. You can see the, the 99 car, Alex Brundle, I think, just having clambered out of that car. And Karim Aljani just uh, jumping on board. That car was running in the top three or four, I think, just before the stop. Past goes Gonzalez now to put a lap on Klien. And let's see how that uh, pans out in terms of pace. In is this back to the only car, I think. That looks like Adrian Delina clambering on board and likewise you can see the 60 car the formula racing car which uh, is probably going to be Jan Magnussen I think now in the car and we're now getting into the last hour and a half of this race and it's starting to really get very very exciting and very interesting Mikkel Mack uh, was shown as the leader when he came in and I don't know if it's Mack taking over or Mack jumping out Sparazioli de Moustier the other cars that were in the fight there, Rodolfo Gonzalez, well, we just heard from his co-driver, Pipo Durrani, and what he expects to see. Expect to see a driver change come in, not too distant future. Likewise, now we've got Klien in, Shulzitsky back in the car that was being driven by Luciano Bacchetta. Now Ludovic Bade now on board, and I think are possibly going to be handing over to Tristan Gomendi very soon. Uh, Vincent Capliari is in bo on board the uh, 24 Sebastian Loeb racing car and Franck Mayor still charging away. He's worked his way back up into eighth position after the car being right down at the bottom of the timing screens early on after an early stop that uh, Michel Frey was forced to make. We've had two retirements from the LMP2 class, which was right at the beginning of the race. Jo uh, Johnny Molum's teammate, Mac McMurray, and then Jonathan Coleman a little bit later on with a technical problem. It is Jan Magnussen on board the Ferrari as we thought it was. And we're going to watch to see where he pops back out. Frank Pereira shown as our race leader in the GTC class ahead of uh, Markozov in the 73 SMP car and then Persiani in the 71 car recovering um, after that uh, problem that he had with the puncher earlier on. Delena now in the uh, 95 Kessel Racing Ferrari ahead of Magnussen, De Moustier and Mika Salo being shown as in the pits now. But it is Rodolfo Gonzalez now as our race leader. I think uh, possibly a little bit out of sequence now. Gonzalez leads by 5.690 seconds. It's showing as ahead of uh, Christian Klien. Then Shatan in the Alpine. And uh, Shulzitsky, Bade, Albuquerque and Capillary. And this is the point in the race where we're going to watch with great interest to see how this unfolds. Matt Griffin there, our leader in the GTE class, coming past the uh, Aston Martin, which was uh, started by Roald Goethen. Roald back on board the car now, having uh, shared the car, of course, with Stuart Hall and Dan Brown. Dan Brown racing in uh, British GTs in the past and also in the FIA GT3s with uh, Glyn Getty, taking the win in GT Open, which is a series that um, last year Griffin and Cameron took three wins in overall. As in is Frank Mayer clambering out after a monumental stint 
as Michelle Frey, the 40-year-old, jumps back on board to see what uh, he can do for this last just under, well, 87 minutes of this race here at Paul Ricard. Remember, it's the penultimate round four, round four out of five of the European Le Mans series. And it's a race series which has provided us with some truly spectacular racing throughout the pack um, and throughout the various different classes. The team now working, you notice how at any one time only one, one engineer can do a tyre change. And that obviously means the tyre stop accounts for around about 20 to 25 seconds of time. Frey comes out onto the circuit. We'll watch to see whether he can put in much of a lap time relative to what the others are doing with uh, the new tyres on. He has been very impressive and, uh, and that car has certainly got some much stronger performance of late. Now interesting clean, Christian clean now on board with new tyres on set the fastest first sector of anyone in the race thus far. And that gives you a pretty clear indication of the level of intent that he's got of being able to close down Gonzalez. And that car is looking very, very strong. And this, uh, as we get into the latter stages, there it is, our race leader early on for such a long time with Julian Schell on board. Then with Gary Hirsch, who did a superb middle stint. And now Christian Klein, who I'm guessing will run to the end, will double stint on fuel, will stay on the tyres he's got. The fans are here of all ages. And as we look down into the pits where the Pro Almeros by GT team watching to see how their drivers are getting on. That could uh, well be looking very good for a good result for those guys as well. The 93 car currently leading in the uh, in the class that is the Pro GT car with uh, Frank Pereira on board who has been sharing that car with uh, Olivier Beretta uh, sorry with um, my mistake with the uh, with Lucas Lasserre and Eric Dermont Eric uh, Dermont of course uh, former uh, World Series by Renault McGann racer of note so we look at the 38 car with Philippe Albuquerque on board, the man who raced for Audi at Le Mans this year, sharing with Oliver Jarvis and uh, Marco Bonanomi until unfortunately Bonanomi was involved in an accident not of his doing and put the car out of the race. He's also a former DTM driver and uh, winner of the Race of Champions series as well. So Philippe Albuquerque, clearly a top line guy in one of the best cars. He now sets the fastest first sector and the fastest lap of the race. 150.387 for Philippe Albuquerque as he does everything he can to close down on the cars immediately in front of him. This is going to be one hell of a battle between these guys during the remainder of this race. 150.387. Now, down in the pit lane, uh, hopefully we're going to get a chance to find out from the guys at uh, Pro GT by Al Almiris. And uh, Karen Lima is down in the pit lane and we'll be talking to the guys now. GT uh, C category, congratulations, you were on the seventh place when you start the race and now you're leading. Yes, that's a good job, we have, we have worked uh, a lot for the, for the race, especially with the tyres that are completely new, so uh, we'd like to wait the, the end of the steam to see uh, what aspects are the tyres, but uh, we cross the finger. Thank you, Philippe Almeras, the team manager, of course. So, Philippe uh, clearly feeling very confident. We just saw uh, a car, cars disappearing across the uh, the infield there. So that car clearly wasn't part of the plan and that probably wouldn't do his tyres an awful lot of good because, as we mentioned earlier on, the um, the red and the blue stripes that you see around the edge of the poorer car circuit are different levels of abrasiveness to stop the cars uh, in the event of them spinning off at high speed. And that works pretty well now. This is clean. His personal fastest first sector matched. He's matched uh, with uh, the best one that uh, the 33087 was the, the uh, sector that Albuquerque. Interestingly, uh, the best sector two is the uh, 36 car, um, which of course uh, is uh, 
has been looking very, very strong a little bit later on. So 33.087 for our uh, car of Philippe Albuquerque. 50.873 that time around. Still lapping significantly faster now. Albuquerque, I think, is in a position now to start to gently work his way up ahead of the guys immediately in front of him. Bade Shulzitsky, possibly even Shatan, depending on where they are. The gap is quite significant though. 52 seconds from the lead. Um, but let's not forget that uh, Gonzalez has still got to make another stop to put Daniel Berton in the car. I think it's probably the car that's looking the strongest. This car that's on the circuit on our cameras rather at the moment, the 43 car. Just 2.85 seconds behind the Murphy Prototypes car, which as I said is going to be stopping soon. thing is that all of these drivers are able, all these top guys anyway, are able to run at a similar pace at this stage now. Just uh, looking at our mosaic of cameras just in the background, Eric Dermont is going to be taking over the current leading car in GTC, Pereira. Markozov in second place in the 73 car, S&P racing car that he's sharing with uh, Beretta and uh, with Anton Ladigan. I think it could be Beretta clambering back on again for the final part of the race here. It's still Matt Griffin leading from uh, Mirko Venturi and George Richardson. George doing a very, very good job in the JMW car. The young man has uh, really driven a solid set of laps. Just needing to continue in that vein as he hands over to James Walker who is there pro driver that will be completing the race on their behalf. We're just over one hour and 20 minutes remaining here at Paul Ricard. This is where we got the section of the race that's getting exceptionally exciting now as Gonzalez, you can see Christian Klein in his mirrors really starting to work back down towards him. Points wise in the championship because it's a uh, the Alpine guys that are leading the series. And the Moran car as a result of having some uh, some tough times uh, in uh, Imola, having taken a uh, taken a third and a fourth thus far. Currently sits there down in sixth in the championship, 25 points. So not really in the championship shout per se but they've clearly got everything working very, very well here. It's really going to be between Signatech and Jota Sport. Race performance, clearly not going to get the result they would have liked this weekend. But uh, if, uh, if Jota Sport and Signatech continue at this pace with uh, Chatan 51.5s and last time round Albuquerque 54.2. He's now 4.2 seconds behind Badet. That is going to be the, the tough call for these guys as to there's now just 0.7 of a second between Gonzalez and Klien. Tough call is going to be whether um, Albuquerque can get himself back into contention as the last section of the race starts to unfold. So now Markozov showing as in the lead as Pereira comes in to hand over Dermont for the GTC class. With Jan Magnussen uh, some 22 seconds behind. Uh, and Magnussen lapping, looking at the lap times, 159.2, lapping faster than anybody else in the GTC category. So that's a, a change that could potentially come in this latter stage of the race. Let's watch to see what sort of lap times the uh, former Stewart and McLaren Formula One driver, of course, uh, don't need me to tell you about his son Kevin and what he's doing in Formula One at the moment. This car, the 60 car, has been quick. Andre Pacini sharing the car with them at Imola and taking pole position. Been on the podium at Silverstone and took the win at Imola. Wilson, Mikko Mack and Andre Pacini. With Magnussen not being available, I'm assuming probably on American duties at the time with Corvette. As you can see, that talk about the Magnussen car now under well, not under pressure, but certainly 
in the middle of uh, this scrap for the overall lead. As it to the inside goes clean, is he going to be able to stick it to the inside and make that one last? No, he's not. He backs out of the move from Gonzalez, which is probably a very sensible thing to do at that stage because Gonzalez looked pretty committed. And behind this battle, some uh, 16 seconds further back, is Paul Luc Chatin in the Alpine car. And then Shulzitsky there is the uh, Murphy Pitts. Greg Murphy there on the left in the white shirt with the sunglasses on, doing his best to stay calm. I can imagine having chatted with Greg this morning and he's probably getting pretty uh, excited by the whole process. And it's great to see uh, Irish motorsport represented at the high level, highest level. And the last time something that was uh, so proudly Irish was succeeding in motorsport, to my mind, was uh, the A1GP team that Adam Carroll drove for and took to victory in the 2009 series for A1GP Team Ireland. So there we can see the Mofi prototypes car now under increasing pressure from Clean. Clean on, uh, of course, a newer tyre as well, which is significant. And of course, having just that a little bit more momentum, it would appear. I think the Murphy cars had one of those drives which so not been not been uh, anything particularly wrong, but they've had just a couple of little niggling delays in pit stops and things. Uh, but all of their drivers, both their drivers so far, they've been in the car, have done an absolutely superb job. Especially Pippa Durrani, who we had in the commentary box a little bit earlier, his first ever. Endurance races did a superb first section of the lap, first section of the race rather. Philippe Albuquerque meanwhile still lapping very quickly back down in sixth place, closing down on Ludovic Bad. I think he's going to be up to fifth place in just a moment. And further back, it's uh, Griffin leading Venturini, or Venturi rather, by uh, some seven seconds at this stage in the GT, GTE category with George Richardson still there doing a great job in third position. It'd be great to see the JMW guys get onto the podium for uh, this particular event and they've worked very very hard. So hopefully we're going to get a chance in a moment to catch up down in the pit lane with, uh, with Greg Murphy and uh, Greg will be talking to Kerry. Of Murphy prototypes, Greg Murphy. It's a good, beautiful battle be between uh, your team and Moron team. Yeah, well, this is what is great about the European Le Mans series. Every team has a chance to win, and for sure, Moron are doing a great job today. So we will keep fighting. We have Nathaniel Berton, of course, the pride of France, to get in the car. So we think we are in a good position. Thank you. Well, I'm sure Nathaniel likes to be referred to as the pride of France. He certainly did an absolutely outstanding job to take pole position in qualifying earlier. The lap time was just superb. And there's no doubt that on pure pace, he's going to be right in there. But the question, of course, is going to be how does this affect the sequence now um, between these guys? I'm guessing there that uh, the, the Murphy prototypes guys will be getting into the point of potentially making a driver change in the not too distant future. See our is that the Griffin car it is the 55 car, so that's our race leader in the GTE category, just being passed by the prototypes. That's Matt Griffin, who, as you'd expect, has done an absolutely superb job to position the car in such a strong place at this stage in the race between him and his co-drivers Duncan Cameron and Michaela Rodolo. They've been absolutely superb. This is it, this could be a change for position. Remember both these cars are very similar. Morgan chassis is not too dissimilar to the Orica chassis that we see the Murphy guys running. But again, looking very good in a straight line. That's one of the key attributes that we've seen throughout this race from the Murphy prototypes entry. And it has looked very strong in a straight line. I think perhaps the, the Zytec been a little bit quicker through some of the twisty sections that we've got here. But Gonzalez, very experienced guy, of course, raced in uh, GP2 amongst other formulas and has 
always been very competitive. I remember him racing in the UK as you can see the 94 car getting uh, La Castellacci on board that. And the AF course of cars that uh, Castellacci would uh, normally be sharing or is sharing in fact with Andrea Rizzoli. And once again Christian Cleon coming back at uh, Rodolfo Gonzalez seemed to get a good run out of the final turn there one, and once more they're struggling with traffic and a decisive move to get past the first or oh, first first piece of traffic dealt with there the 73 car of uh, Markozov who's a leader in the GTC category he leads Jan Magnussen by some 22 seconds and I think uh, Magnussen is possibly going to be in a position to with the time that's remaining looking at the lap times now Magnussen 2 minute point 2 last time uh, Marzakov 159.9 so about 3 tenths of a second difference Let's look at this side by side going down the straight it is Christian Klein trying to go the long way around almost touching as they started to put a bit of pressure on one another but I think I don't think, rather, that Clean's going to be able to get clear of nearly touching once again. Gonzalez really holding his ground. A very aggressive bit of racing by both these guys. Christian Clean not only was he, of course, a driver for Red Bull in F1. And see Murphy guys look on even more sort of anxiously at that situation. But... Uh, of course, raced for HRT and it was, a, was one of the test development drivers for the BMW F1 team as well. So, plus the experience he's had with Peugeot at the moment in their LMP1 prototype program. But clearly, Clean is not giving up this fight at all. He's absolutely determined to try and get himself into the league. Um, so basically, will be fighting very very hard for this latter part of the race to see who can establish a little bit of a gap between the two of them it's going to be nip and tuck between the two because Gonzalez is lap times 154.1 and Cleans 154.1 virtually nothing in it just a few hundredths of a second I've got to say that Gonzalez has driven an absolutely superb race to hold uh, Christian clean back it's probably actually going to be working in the favor of some of the cars behind because Paul Chatin is now 8.1 seconds behind um, in terms of uh, lap times he's lapping three seconds faster in the Alpine car so there's a good chance that he may well be on the back of this pack in the next few laps if this continues like this in other words if Gonzalez is able to keep the uh, fighting car of, of uh, the Moran car rather of Christian clean behind as Gonzalez tries to put a car in between him but doesn't manage it so Gonzalez clean Chatan that's our top three Shulzitsky Albuquerque now ahead of Bade uh, who has just pitted and Albuquerque now being shown as some 43 seconds behind and although he is lapping very quickly, it's going to be debatable as to whether he can close down enough in the just over an hour remaining. There's another stop to come for fuel for all of these cars, of course. And look at this. Now, Gonzalez has been so committed in the traffic. He finds his way past the Porsche, then past the Ferrari. But likewise, Clean is taking every little step that he sees Gonzalez make and following it through. Hertz backed car in the lead is doing a fabulous job pole position and a leading position surely a podium is in in reach of either of these cars at the moment the question is going to be which order and of course who's going to be the remaining car on the podium would it be the Alpine could it be the Zytec of Shulzitsky or would it be the Zytec of uh, Philippe Albuquerque That lap, a little bit more of a gap. 
just seeing the uh, right way right Porsche going through. He's down in fifth position now. An absolutely uh, superb lap last time round by Berka Venturi is now leading because Matt Griffin has come in, made a uh, stop. He's got a problem maybe. I don't know what's happened to Griffin because Griffin was leading company. I'm, I'm guessing he might must have come in and, and had a stop, probably for fuel. George Richardson is now in from second place. He'll be handed to James Walker. This is for the GTA class. There's a change for the lead. And it is now Christian Clean who's got himself ahead of Rodolfo Gonzalez. Let's have a look now. Slices to the inside. I think Wayne Wright in the Porsche might have been um, in a position where he allowed Clean to find a little bit more room. Gets it done now. We're going to have to watch with interest to see what sort of lap times Clean can do. Now he's clear. And he's got clear air. He charges down the outside of the Porsche. There's Castellacci and there is Griffin. Now, that coming round the outside is the 28 car of Schulzitski. Where's he going to end up as the almost end up four abreast? Castellacci and Griffin now still looking to see if I can work out what's happened. Showing the pit stop wise. There's only been two stops for Griffin, so on the screen it says anyway. So that would indicate that there's been some sort of a problem for the car that was leading comfortably, as it's uh, Venturi leading Bronozewski leading Lyons. Lyons will be handing over to Ciocci, I would imagine, any moment now. It's just over an hour and five minutes remain here at Manicor. Christian Klein now leads by 1.8 seconds ahead of Rodolfo Gonzalez and a further 10 seconds behind we have the fighting uh, Poul Loup Chatin. I saw them around pits there looking nervously on to see whether they could be in with a shout of their first win of 2014. We've seen a win in the opening round of the series at Silverstone by the uh, Tirier by TDS team. Then Jota Sport took a win at Imola as in comes that Tiri 8 by TDS car that we were just mentioning there. And then round three of the series was a victory for the Alpine team at the Red Bull Ring. So three different winners in the overall category so far. And it could be at the moment if it stays like this, another different winner in 2014. It could be either the Morgan of uh, Christian Klein, or it could be the Orica of Adolfo Gonzalez Murphy prototypes or New Blood by Moran. Which one of them is it going to be is the question. This fight continues here between Castellacci and Griffin. Now, looking down the order, uh, Griffin is now being shown as in the lead, so I don't know if the timing screen had a little bit of a, uh, a blip there. And Castellacci who is in the silver Ferrari, or who was in the silver Ferrari, just double checking that we haven't seen a change now. And that would have been the car that, uh, of course, a car that uh, he have been showing with Rizzoli, 94 car. Yeah, still Castellacci is down in about sixth place in the GTC category. And as we watch with interest, the 56 car, that is Pierre Kaffer now. Closing down on Mikhail Bronozewski. So it's all starting to happen. It's uh, an AF Corsa and Kessel Racing battle at the front of the GTE category, as it often has been. Tristan Gomendi is being shown as in the pits still for the Tirier by TDS team. There is Bronozewski. Piccini potentially going to take that car over fairly soon. Clear now leads by 2.235 seconds over Adolfo Gonzalez. And uh, Chatan closing down on the two cars ahead with Albuquerque in turn closing down on Shulzitski. But still a little bit further back than he would like with the amount of time that's available. It's going to be a big, big fight for Albuquerque to be able to do anything about the guys immediately ahead of him. GT 
see it's still Markles off leading Jan Magnussen. 18 seconds is the gap that Magnussen has to try and close down to try and potentially take a victory there. So, we have had an absolutely superb first couple of hours here. We go into the final hour of the race. And we're going to get a chance to see a quick reminder of what's been going on in the race so far over the last hour or so. Matt Griffin has been absolutely superb in the AF Corsa car. Battles further down the order as... Uh, Michael Mack worked his way towards the front of the pack for the GTC class. Capillary and Arthur Pick doing a good job for Sebastian Lowe, but it was Rodolfo Gonzalez who did uh, a great job in his stint for Murphy Prototypes, the 48 car, working his way up to and past the Sebastian Loeb racing vehicle. And then setting about pulling his way towards the very front of the pack. We saw Christian Clean jump on board. The new blood by Morand entered Morgan, putting new tyres on. And then after a, a tremendous fight between Gonzalez and Clean, eventually it was Christian Clean who managed to work his way through to get himself into the lead. There was a point there we did think they were going to possibly fire each other off. That didn't happen. And it has been thrilling stuff so far. Back to the live action as we look at Christian Clean, our race leader now has pulled away by 4.5 seconds ahead of Rodolfo Gonzalez. The pull up shut down now 11.95 seconds away from the lead. And then it is Philippe Albuquerque who's closing down on Mark Schulzitski for that fourth position now. This could be so significant going into the last hour of this race. The battle that we're watching from a championship point of view is going to be most keenly watched between the number 36 Alpine with Paul Ipschatan and a brilliant stint, Gary Hirsch. I'm here with Gary Eads. Here's, of course, it's an amazing and fantastic race. Congratulations. Um, you're now at the first place, so. Yeah, obviously, uh, it's a great battle now. We're fighting uh, for the lead with Murphy. So uh, during my single stint, I had to push as much as I could and um, do the gap to, to keep the lead for Christian. So now he's doing the job. Let's, uh, let's hope that uh, he can make it till the end and cross fingers. We'll see. Thank you. So let's have a quick uh, look at exactly where we're at classification-wise. It's a, a 4.5 second lead that uh, Gary Hirsch and his co-drivers have over the Murphy prototypes and Signatec Greaves and Jota Sport are closing up on each other. Further down, AF Course with Matt Griffin lead Kessel Racing with Mikhail Bronozewski and then Pierre Kaffer in third position in the GTA class. For GTC, it's the S&P Russian Bears car of Markozov leading ahead of Jan Magnussen in the Formula Racing and then the Art Grand Prix car in fourth just behind the other AF Corsa car um, which is being driven by Adrian Delina at this stage. So further down the order, you can see the 41 car of Greaves Motorsport was the first retirement, and uh, with 93 laps completed, a race leader is still Christian Klien. And with less than an hour to go here at Minicore, we just have to watch for them to have a smooth stop, and then potentially, uh, once the fueling is done, Barring disasters and problems, Clean could be in the driving seat in terms of bringing this home for what would be the first win of the season for the team. And for the first win for them as well as a combination of drivers. And if they were to be able to get it done, it would be a thoroughly well-deserved result for them. Now, looking at the rest of the order further down, it is Gonzalez. Still in second position being shown at 4.8 seconds behind with Chatan now closing down up to about six seconds behind Gonzalez lapping around about a second faster. So on that pace in theory should be on him within the time that they have available. But as we've already seen with Rodolfo Gonzalez, he's not an easy man to pass. Likewise, the Markosov 
Magnussen and Delina battle. That is going to run to the end, I'm sure. And Dan Delina in the 95 car has done a very, very solid job taking over from Cedric Sperazzioli. But this is a, a team that has a collective. The three drivers in each of their uh, sections of the race have just been absolutely on it. They've really given no, um, no time to sort of uh, relax or coast at all. They've been pushing from the absolute beginning. It's, uh, I think I very uh, quickly mis uh, mis uh, identify the drivers as being Christian Kling, Gary Hersher, and I said Julian Schell. It meant to be Pierre Rags, of course, did a fabulous job in the first sector of the race. Here is Michele Rigolo, who has taken over from Matt Griffin, now leads with the 56 minutes remaining for Rigolo, the very experienced Italian, another man, like so many of the guys I've mentioned before, like uh, Adam Carroll, for example, has experienced racing in the A1GP series and then has raced in, uh, in uh, the GT Open series and, of course, in the WEC series as well as here in the LMS series. So with Rigolo and with Griffin, two top-line drivers on board that AF Corsa car. And of course in Duncan Cameron, Cameron, even a very, very strong driver who's been getting stronger and stronger over the past few years. And now at uh, a much, much closer pace to their guys in, in uh, Griffin and in Rigolo than he had done in previously. So this is the 73 car that leads. It is uh, Markozov, who has been really, really solid his last uh, stint, or this stint he's been doing has been absolutely superb. David Markozov sharing with Anton Ladigan and with Olivier Beretta. And Beretta, of course, uh, another former Formula One driver, has been uh, so, so quick this weekend right in the mix as you'd expect him to be now we've just seen Paul Luc Chatin set his personal fastest lap 150.889 last time round to start to close down even further Albuquerque meanwhile is now close, closing down further and further on Shulzitsky but as the tyre performance starts to drop away from all of the cars the lap times start to equalise out very little in it now car the 56 cars been in the mix throughout the day now yeah Kaffa has uh, done a superb job to start to work the car further and further near the front the AT racing team which is Alexander Telkinista has been uh, getting stronger and stronger and they had the addition of Mirko Venturi to the driving lineup at very very last minute hadn't even been part of the squad for qualifying jumped straight into the race and has been on the pace very much throughout it as a car we haven't had a chance to speak much about there the very distinctive green BMW Z4 of Team Russia by Barwell Johnny Cocker one of the drivers beating with uh, Timur Sadarov Great job. Currently, let's look at the list, see where they're running at the moment. Uh, he's running 30th overall, and uh, I think that's ninth in class in the GTC category. What's happening at the front? Well, Gonzalez has now dropped back a little bit further into the clutches of Chatin for the battle for second overall. There is the 28 car of Shulzitsky. Now just under 10 seconds ahead of of Philippe Albuquerque. If you're watching the distance, that car will probably appear in just a moment. There it is. So it's the length of the start finish straight, more or less, the gap between Shulzitsky and Albuquerque. And as a driver, as soon as you start to see him, that's psychologically going to help him massively in terms of being able to close that gap down. Just look 
looked at one of our other pitches and I saw that um, the Thierry A. Carp has been retired. So Tristan Gomedy didn't really get a chance to drive the car in anger and the frustrations of, uh, of motorsport that even in a relatively short race like this one it's still going to be things that technically can cause problems but it's a testament to the quality of the cars that are racing that we've got um, really only I think three, four cars that have retired now and uh, one of those was as a result of accident damage as you see there Kaffa starting to uh, blast his way past uh, Johnny Cocker in the GTC car. Two different classes, remember. The GTE cars, the quicker of the two categories for the GT cars. And the biggest difference, talking to a couple of the teams earlier, was is the fact that we've got a little bit more aerodynamic grip underneath the car in a GTE car. Um, and just some other changes throughout the way that the car works. They just make everything a little bit more like an out and out true race car rather than a modified version of a road car, which is what some of the people feel that some of the uh, lower categories are. But these are serious racing cars throughout the pack, whichever version of it you're looking at. Regolo there, you can see, and the AT racing car. First and second, the gap now just 1.819 seconds now. That means that we have got a massive battle on now with 50 minutes remaining here at Port Ricard. A lap time last time round, 158.073 for Pierre Caffer in second place. And then further back, the, oh sorry, lap time rise, the time of Rigolo, 159.155 was a second further back, is what I was going on to say. Um, so that could change, those positions could change at any point. Overall, though, the lead is now 5.5 seconds. So Gonzalez took a bit of time back out of Christian Clean that time. Shut down 151.0. Lapping faster than both of the cars ahead of him. Albuquerque a little bit slow. He's now ahead of Shulzitsky. Uh, he has found his way past Mark Shulzitsky. So I'm guessing Shulzitsky must have had a problem of some sort. fight going on for the GTE class and uh, it's Michael Regola leading from Pierre Kaffer from James Walker in the JMW car and uh, a driver that was right in amongst it at the early part of the races during his stint is a young man who's uh, raced in the FIA GT3 Championship GT Open and now in the European Le Mans series and I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Lyons. Michael it looked like you had a great start to your race I stressed for that, G. We, um, we had a bit of a mix. I didn't get through the traffic that quickly while the um, while there was the the rubbish from the tyre on the on the minstrel straight. That made it very tricky because I was having quite an intense battle with the Russian Russian Ferrari. And no, the first stint was a bit mixed. The second one was much more fun. I had a really good fight with the Porsche, and we went back and forth. And the second one, I was really sort of back in settling back into it. I think. Now you've uh, obviously got the, the car out there at the moment with uh, Marco Ciocci on board running currently in fifth position in class. Um, but the battle at the front between um, uh, Michele Rigolo and Pierre Caffa, that's starting to look pretty intense. You know all of these guys in the AF course are family very well. Which way do you think you're going to call it? <laughs> well, the, sort of, the favour's been with Michele recently, hasn't it? They've had a really good run these last three, few races. But when I saw the lineup on paper this morning, because I mean, we only found out this morning that Venturi was joining was joining the AT racing car, which was purely down to regulations because Kaffa is a platinum and they can't share bronze platinum. Which, so the, with the addition of him, I think it's made that car really, really strong. But we'll see. This is this is the time that sort of for you guys back home to come and watch because this is when the gloves are off and the guys are out there to earn the money. Yeah, and it's absolutely brutal, the fight that's going on. And throughout the categories, we've seen a fabulous uh, fight overall. I don't know if you've had a chance to actually see that. 
um, so much because you've obviously been concentrating on the on the GTE battle. But this guy here, um, Christian Clean, has uh, has worked his way um, away now from uh, what was Gonzalez. Shatan now has moved himself into second place as Gonzalez comes in to hand over to Panciatici, and uh, that's going to, I think, help Philippe Albuquerque go up into a podium position. But We've seen some superb battles going on. Do you get a chance to take on board what's happening in the other classes or do you just really focus on the GTA class? Uh, you, you get a little bit of a run of it sort of as, as the ca traffic's catching you because in GTE obviously we make pretty much one hour stints on the hour and you'll notice the prototype guys running 40 minute stints that if you're, if you're far enough up the road sometimes you don't see them before you make the first pit stop and that's a really big advantage because otherwise you see them twice but it's yeah you do get you get a bit of a feel I sort of I saw a couple of the guys early on we had I think we went three wide into into scene corner a couple of times which was very exciting and I can't remember the name but the corner just after we, I came in having just overtaken another GTE car with a prototype on the inside and a prototype on the outside so you can see their battles just as fierce as ours yeah, I think that might have been the point where you might have had uh, Luciano Pacetta on one side and and, uh, and uh, Nelson Pacetta on the other side because they were right that as you went through. So, but the, the the racing today has been absolutely superb throughout the pack as you'd have expected. You know, this is what, what ELMS has brought to motorsport over the last few years, especially now the way that the regulations seem to have uh, really evened up the driving mixture as well. But. You know, from your point of view, it must be very tough sometimes when you're fighting for your position to have to allow for the fact that these prototype guys are going to be all over you at times. Yeah, well, that's where the experience seems to count. I mean, learning from the so many pros in, in amongst AF Corsa that I've got to sort of just take knowledge from and really grow as a driver. But you just tend to find that in the GTE cars, it's actually very easy to be too nice to the prototype guys because you, you see them coming, but they're, they're so fast in the first phase of the corner that when you're because we're very similar on the straight when you see them coming you kind of you're tempted to give them the benefit of the doubt and it's only with experience that you realize that no they're you've probably got another three four corners but around this place for them i think it's very difficult because in the last sector if they get if they don't get past the sort of through scene they're they're a bit screwed really it's quite difficult because we we have to take a lot of a lot of road to be stable and the road the circuit moves a lot so it's quite a tricky place to try and get past them and also it's similar at the end of the first sector they have quite an issue because in the slower speed corners it's quite we're quite close speed wise oh that moment there for somebody flying off the road that was one of the smp cars couldn't quite see which one it was it just uh, looked like it had a problem of some sort because it's not the sort of place that you'd have uh, maybe expected a driver error but shatan comes in for his last stop for fuel Looked that like it could have been locking the rears, I think, so maybe just an early down change or something like that. Was, it's unusual to see that from a GTC car. Yeah, well spotted. That could uh, could exactly be what's going on. And meanwhile, that uh, at the front, that uh, gap's gone up to two and a half seconds between Michele and Pierre. And both of them, you know, very, very difficult to call as to, as to pace-wise, which one of them as a driver has got the edge. There's, there's virtually nothing in it. I think Griffin certainly seemed to be just a little bit quicker in the early stages, but... There's nothing in it, is there? I think he lives here, actually. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not so sure about the Thrapston residents. <laughs> I've seen him down here so many times. Yeah, Matt's Matt's been really strong around here, but it's it's been a good fight. It's also look look for um, Bertolini to come on strong through this thing because he's always super super fast. Yeah, Bertolini. Obviously, that car's had dramas early on, um, but as you can see now, um, Magnussen. He's uh, he's been super quick in this latter stage. He's got himself now into the lead. And Markozov down into second as the pit stops come. Basov in third, Castellacci, Sparazzioli, Corjus, Demont. That's the battles that we've seen going through the order. But yeah, Bertolini, well, now he's on board. Look at the lap times he's doing. He's doing 157.2, which is uh, a couple of tenths quicker than Michele, who's leading the race. Yeah, it is. It's super strong. I don't. Re the rest of that car, we're very. It's very close, sort of, with us, to be honest, on pace. We're quite. It's sort of luck of the draw because for us the biggest variation is usually in the bronze section. So it's always it's always interesting to see how some cars are really strong in one area. For example, Takanitsu is always one of the very fast gentleman drivers you'll notice sort of going through. So it's always interesting to see how the fight comes out because obviously with three drivers there's a big 
big opportunity for variation. We're just trying to close that gap all the time. Absolutely. Now, you talk about the gentleman drivers, of course. You've had um, um, Epi Perazzini as your third driver in your car, and, and he seems to have done a pretty solid job this weekend. Yeah, Epi has been... Um He's, just, he's got so much experience to draw on, no matter what's going on, where we are with the car or anything in free practice. He's just, he's always there. Sometimes the pace, that single lap pace is always very, very strong and we just we just work for the stint, really. Yeah, and he definitely uh, looks like, um, you know, the, it, when you look at the, the various different combinations of drivers, that, that there's certain cars that do have that broader spread, much more even spread. And certainly, I think that's, a, that's closed up a little bit with your car, isn't it? Well, one of the things we also find is there, there's also quite often a lot of complaints about the BOP in this championship, the balance of performance in amongst the GTE cars. But the trouble is, when you look at the combinations, 90% of the combinations that are on paper, when you just look individually at the drivers, are in Ferraris. So sure enough, at the end, usually there's three or four Ferraris in the mix there with a couple of the Porsche guys and sometimes the Astons there. But... That's that's what makes it difficult with this championship is the true combinations. This year seem to be in the Ferraris anyway. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing from my point of view is looking at it. You look down the list, and there's if somebody just said to you, like, from what you know about these guys, what grading are you going to give them? It's not always the obvious thing. There's so many factors that can decide whether a driver's uh, not so much platinum, but certainly silver and gold and bronze. Is, there's uh, lots of why, what ifs and where's. Uh, now down in the uh, pit lane. Uh, I think Carino is going to have a chance to find out what's been happening with the Thierry A car. Yeah, I'm with uh, one of the drivers, Ludovic Bade. Uh, uh, unfortunately, what happened with the car? We don't know really what's happened, but uh, I think we, we have a problem on the sus rear suspension with the choke absorber. And uh, we don't know where is the problem, but there is a, a real problem. Thank you so much. It's very unusual. These these cars, well, all of the cars throughout the pack, but these, especially the the, the, the level now, that you don't seem to see mechanical failures very often in this this type of racing, do we? Now it sort of that emphasises that this is the sprint section of the Le Mans style racing. We're we're doing four-hour stints, which is two-thirds of a WEC event, and obviously a, a long way away from the 24 hours of Le Mans. So this this for these cars really is just. Now look at this for, for close racing. Look at the difference in lap time between Paul Upchatan is second and Nathaniel Berton in third. 149.887, which is a new fastest lap. But Berton, 149.888, one thousandth of a second. <laughs> you, can, you can see him in the sights, can't you? You can see with our pictures now. He's just, you can just see him. He's starting to pick up a bit of a toe on the Instrol straight now. He's not so much, but just a little toe, I think, in it. It's really starting to hot up, and he, he can he can breathe it. The Murphy guys have been due a good result this year, and you can see that they're really hungry for it. Well, that pole position time that Berton did was a 147.8. Now, obviously, they won't get to that time because of fuel loads and everything else, and tyres and what have you. But to be within a second of that time at this stage in the race, okay, they've got new tyres on, but that's pretty awesome stuff. It shows you the level of performance these guys have got, but also how equal the cars are. Although the uh, the Alpine is essentially an Orica, really underneath, uh, you know, underneath it all, the um, the uh, the Orica of the Murphy prototypes car is clearly working seriously well and Berton is uh, reminding us what a superstar he is. Uh, this, that's why we do this championship really isn't it? It's just it just shows you the level. I mean they're catching a couple of the GT guys now it looks very very close. Yeah and clean I think is up the road and gone now. Look at this this is gonna be potentially a change for that second position now I would imagine Simon Dolan who's in the uh, Jota Sport car who's fighting with the Alpine team for the overall lead of the championship is hoping that the Murphy car does get past because it'll uh, just put them back a little bit closer but the, well it could easily end in tears at this rate it's fierce racing isn't it yeah they're, they're so close I mean also with the with the GTE cars we can sort of lean on each other a little bit more and take a bit more risk but these LMP2 cars are really fragile out and out race built machines and so you, you see them they have to give each other a little bit more respect when it comes to wheel to wheel stuff 
And that's uh, been evident throughout the race that, that they're out racing very hard, but it's clean, fair racing, which is superb. Interesting, we had Pipo Durrani come up into the commentary box earlier, Michael, and uh, chat to us from his perspective. He obviously was on pole, effectively. He led the race um, and had a fight with Harry Tinkle, who's knows from Formula 3. And you know, as a former single-seater driver, well, you're still racing single-seaters, but in historic racing, but when you were doing Formula Renault, for example, that uh, it is a different mindset, isn't it? Look at this. this he's going to have a run now, isn't he? Yeah, he's got a good run to the inside. He's going to be able to make it stick, though. Talk us through this section, Michael. So coming into scene corner here, he's got a good run down the inside. If he can get far enough, no, it, it's one of those corners where if, if you're not really alongside, you have to give in because otherwise it's going to be the biggest shunt you've ever had. Yeah, and that's, uh, what, 160, 170 mile an hour for those guys? Something yeah, like that. every bit of that, definitely. And we, I mean, in a GTE car, we're going down to fifth. I think they actually stay in sixth through there, so it's shows you just how fast those cars are through there. Well, again, okay, we, we had um, Johnny Molan, who's one, who was, uh, unfortunately, his co-driver, Matt McMurray, was out on the first lap. But he said that, you know, on a good lap on new tyres, that's flat through there. So, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty awesome stuff, telling your brain that it's going to get through there, isn't it? Yeah, the advantage of Paul Ricard, though, as a circuit is there's a lot of runoff, so you can you can take a bit of a risk and maybe take some liberties it through there, which is the advantage. It helps you get up to speed. That's why guys like Pipo Durrani has been straight the race, even though it's his first race. Here, you can really just throw the car at the circuit and just then find your way almost back from that. Whereas when you go somewhere like Imola, it's a real difficult circuit and you make a mistake and it's going to bite you. Yeah, you'll be in the wall before you know it, somewhere like that, wouldn't you? Here, it's designed to give you that space. Now, look at the, the trouble that... Um, um, but Berton is having trying to clear the GTE cars there. It's a superb uh, indication of the, of the issues you were saying earlier that you know there is very little. I mean, oh dear, the Russian Bears car there, the 57 car didn't see that. I don't think he saw that coming, did he? No, it's the trouble is for the P2 guys. They see a hole open and they think they think that that's that's it and it's over. And also in the, in, when you're in a GT car, it's very easy to just think, okay, I can close the door now. He's gone, and it's. It's better when you're in, in the space and you can see him coming and you get a bit of a chance. But I mean, like during my stint when I was having a massive fight with the with the Porsche, we I think I went into turn one and then in the middle of the corner I found two prototypes alongside me and I didn't even know where they'd come from. Yeah, it just suddenly makes you jump a little bit, doesn't it? Um, I remember many years ago when I used to do some racing, that been testing and having two F3000 cars as they were coming either side of me on the straight and it nearly made me jump out of the skin, you know. It's just, uh, Car 48 drive through penalty engine running wise through Fury. That is so significant. That is for the Murphy prototypes car. So clearly there's some sort of operational error during the, the uh, pit stop because that is most unusual. You wouldn't normally have heard of that, would you? Yeah, unless maybe they had a small electrical problem. Maybe they had an issue with the starter and they thought maybe they could get away with it. But that's that's very unfortunate. That's sort of unfortunately going to put pay to what what's turning out to be a great race between these two guys. Oh, and he's catching a slower oh, GT. Oh, no, and he's caught. Oh. He's caught the GT car on the way. Look at Berton, very Gallic. He's waving his hand to say, how can you do this to me? I can't believe this has happened. What frustration for Daniel Berton. Oh, to, but then again, to be fair to the, uh, you know, the, the, the guy in, in, the, in the GT car, he clearly didn't realise that Berton was coming in as well. But oh, what a frustrating time for Nathaniel Berton. It would cost him it's so much. went though. straight away as well. And maybe if they, it's one of those situations and there's a car in the pit entry there, maybe if they, they could have met, left it another lap. But is he going to be compromised by the GT car coming out as well? can't tell by the head on shot. Oh, now. that was tight as well. Now that's <laughs> commitment from Berton, wasn't it? He really didn't want to uh, have to lose any more time. There is Rodolfo Gonzalez looking on anxiously and cannot believe it. He's saying that that's just out of order. The, the uh, drivers have obviously driven their hearts out to try and put the car in with a shout of a podium position. And then something like that happens. That's just so frustrating. It's probably quite good we haven't got a mic down there either. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think uh, uh, Karine maybe she would uh, she would struggle to get something <laughs> without a bit of uh, a bit of fruity language in there. So uh, yeah, there's times when it's a good thing perhaps not having a microphone there, as you said, Michael. But that's taking the pressure off of this guy. Pull up Shatan. He's looking good now for what will probably be a second place. I think that Clean 28 seconds up the road. Lapping uh, three seconds slower that time. He has lapped particularly quickly for the last few laps, but that just simply could have been traffic. But uh, Capillari is no, he's going quite well now. He's starting to take some time out of uh, Dolan. So the 24 Sebastian Loeb racing car, the only car that's running on Michelin tyres in the um, LMP2 category, that's starting to run pretty well. 
It was interesting actually this weekend we found more more tire wear than usual at Ricard, which I don't know if it's also affecting the LMP2 guys, but it made for some quite tricky stints. And if you'll notice a lot, I think some of the guys that tried to double stint, I don't know whether they did on tires or not, but you could see they were struggling towards the sort of, as we rejoined, I came I came across the Aston and a couple of other cars that were obviously heavy into their stints, and you could see they were starting to struggle. Yeah, so this uh, young man has done a good job. Mark Szczytski could be on for a podium, and that would be a superb performance for the Greaves Motorsport team after the frustration of having their other car uh, retire on the very first lap of the race. There in the background was Nathaniel Berton. I'm uh, not sure if he's still on the same lap. I'm guessing he's here. he probably is. So. In which case, I think uh, Berton will be on for a charge through to uh, get past Szczytski. With 32 minutes remaining, the gap, uh, if I read my timing screen correctly, is around about three seconds. So, yeah, almost certainly, I think uh, Berton will be on the back of Szczytski and pass fairly soon. Both those cars, of course, with Nissan Power as well, so they should be pretty similar towards the end of the straight. Yeah, now, Nissan have really kind of been the uh, the, the go-to engine, haven't they, for, G for LMP2 for recent years. And the Jad engine's still a competitive engine. It certainly looks like it's going to get the result today, that's for sure. Uh, but overall, it's definitely been more about the, uh, the, the Nissan engines, really. Yeah, they, they seem to have dominated the class in recent years. You can tell that Judd are still working, because, I mean, they've been... They've been there or thereabouts in this championship, but yeah, that just if it's look if we're looking at strength in numbers, Nissan have definitely got it on their side, and whether that's to do with the complete package or purely performance, I'm not quite so sure. I don't follow it that closely, but yeah, they seem to definitely have had a strong run the last few years in LMP2. Well, it's interesting the regulation stated that you've only got the, the one engine that you use for the season as well, which is is a is a great initiative in terms of encouraging durability and encouraging a uh, combination of performance and reliability. Well, I think the regulations like that are designed to try and bring this technology towards the road car stuff a little bit more so that there's more de the development's more relevant for the manufacturers. Yeah, and then obviously when the manufacturer sees a benefit in that, that makes more sense. I mean, as you can see now, Biaton is on the back of Szczytski and has a real sense of purpose about him, doesn't he? Yeah, you can tell that's, that drive through has really fired him up, hasn't he? He's going to give it all he's got for the the remainder of the race. Oh, they oh, touch. Contact, yeah, now. That's how fired up Berton is. That's not really the sort of driving that he needs to be doing at this stage of the race, simply because, you know, obviously these guys at uh, the Murphy, there is the Murphy guys, and you can see just how, uh, how um, stressed everybody was looking. I think you would be if that was your car, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For, yeah, fortunately, we haven't seen too many pictures of, uh, of, the, um, of my Ferrari 458, but... Yeah, it's, it's always a, a stressful time. What else, what's also quite tricky for a, quite a few of these guys have had to do two stints during the, during the race. And so that, that downtime in between when, you're, when you know your car's going round and you're tentatively looking at the, watching the live timing screens, but you're just also trying to prepare yourself, regroup and get ready. This is, the move's got to be on the end scene, surely. Yeah, he's going the long way around because I think we know that the Zytec tends not to be the quickest of the cars in a straight line. And that's done nice and early for Nathaniel Berton. Uh, his, uh, his rage against the machine <laughs> continues, I think. Let's have a quick look and remind ourselves what's going on in the other classes. The GTE classes, Michele Rigolo leading Pierre Caffer by 4.955 seconds. And a great job by James Walker and the uh, JMW team. They've done a solid job, haven't they? Yeah, this year they're back. They're back on the Michelins. Um, how they I didn't really see so how they went last year. I think that's a very good results when the weather conditions were a bit different. But yeah, it's it's good to see them up there. They've got a young, got a very young team. They've got a very very young bronze gentleman style driver. So no, they're 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 always in the hunt. They're always on one of the guys that we're there or thereabouts with. Yeah, and for the GTC class, Marcos of uh, Mikkel Mack and Spirazzioli, they are the top three in that class, ahead of Kevin Corajus, Persiani, who had the puncher earlier on, Castellacci, Dermont, Parisi, Alex Brundle in uh, the 99 car, and Johnny Cocker. So uh, some uh, quite a lot of British names out there for the British fans at home, isn't there? Lots of drivers that you know and have raced with at various levels over the years. Yeah, and the, and the Team Russia by Barwell BMW, actually, I saw that that came, that was just out ahead of him at the, at the beginning of his stint, and they looked really, really strong. It took a long time to ca catch, up, catch up with those guys. Yeah, and I think overall, perhaps there hasn't quite been as much performance throughout the three drivers as they would have liked. There's that contact again. 
And, and as you said, you have to be a bit careful with these things. They've got, you know, dive planes and bits sticking off them. And if they get knocked off, totally transforms the car, doesn't it? Yeah, and particularly um, the second Greaves car there, because I think they had some, some issues in the first few practice with one of the GTE cars. So that never a dull moment for those guys this weekend. You can see applause from Greg Murphy and Pipo Durani and the rest of the guys down in the pit lane there, clearly um, doing their, their uh, bit to support Nathaniel on his way to what could be a podium by the looks of things. He's now pulled out four seconds on Shorzycki. Dolan, I think, uh, is not quite there in terms of pace. It's looking like that's going to be a fifth place for the Jota Sport team. Yeah, I was chatting with those guys uh, earlier in the weekend actually and sort of of all the circuits that they could pick this is probably one of their weaker ones so I think they'll be they'll be looking to come back strong in the final round in Estoril. Yeah and that's going to be interesting home track for Philippe Albuquerque of course one of their drivers as the New Blood team continue on their way onto what looks like it could well be their first win of the 2012 season and that would be a super performance for me. Wow, that's Piazzioli in the yellow car putting uh, a move there on the 56 car was it the other way around no Kaffer putting a move on to Barazzioli I think Kaffer in second place starting to catch up now the, uh, the Aston again for uh, a lapping I think as opposed to for position it's interesting to watch the Aston actually because they didn't get much running on Saturday but they were very very fast in the beginning so it'd be interesting to see how Michele Rugolo gets on getting past Dewey Hall whether it's Dewey will just lie down and give in to him because they're out of position or whether it's going to be a, big, a good fight well I think uh, Stewie's the professional isn't he Stuart has been part of this program for quite some time and I think um, I'd be, be very surprised if he does anything other than cooperate because he is a, is a top pro and uh, you know I think he's as you said I think they're just uh, getting through the weekend now it's just been one of those weekends where it's started badly and it's not gone brilliantly ever since there you can see he's moved himself to the right yeah, that retro livery obviously hasn't brought the luck for them, unfortunately, has it? No, exactly, yeah. Golf racing, that's, uh, that's seen some days around here in the past, back in the day. But um, focusing on what we've got going on, as you see, that's the Spur Spur Spirazzioli concert at this late stage in the race. Spirazzioli, there we go. Cedric Spirazzioli, who's been racing in the um, Maserati Trofeo up until recently. Interesting championship, but it uh, seems to spawned some good GT drivers there's a oh, bad time getting edged out of the way then yeah that was very close wasn't it, it it's one of those tricky corners because when you're in the in the lead car though it's very it's very easy to just control the line and you do really cross from one white line to the other so when you're when you've got a run on someone if they don't see you it's, that happened to me a couple of times during the scene as well it's very easily done but then you're kind of wrong footed for the whole the rest of that section it's very hard to then make the move stick on them yeah and you can see that again one of the challenges of this type of racing, isn't it? And uh, it's uh, it's going to be very, very interesting to see as we get into this last 25 minutes of the four hours. Is there going to be any significant changes? Now, let's look at what potential changes really we might be looking for. I think the, the top two in the uh, LMP2 class are unlikely to change, looking at the various different scenarios there. The third position is probably going to stay uh, for the Tanya Burton barring disaster, so that's looking pretty set. Regardless of Kaffer, well, with the gap they've got between those two drivers, it, it's looking more in Michaeli's favour, but it's, it could still be changed. Yeah, it's, it's also, it'd be interesting to see how those two guys manage their tyres over the stint as well, because I found in the second part it was very easy to be quick at, in the beginning, and there was a re we really found a lump of grip, but later on in the stint I started to struggle a little bit so it'll be interesting to see how those two guys use their experience and make it count so from your point of view it looks like uh, the gap that Marco has got behind uh, Puccini is 4.3 seconds he's lapping a couple of seconds faster at this stage that could be just be traffic I think that's uh, a possible change it might be all yeah definitely um, hopefully we can get we can still get a run at the JMW car sort of a bit strange saying that as a young British lad but we're, um, the competition is fierce as ever so yeah hopefully we'll, s we'll see where we end up in the next half an hour or 23 minutes as it is now <laughs> yeah it doesn't take ticket long it? it goes so so quickly it just only seems like moments ago that we were talking about the, the first 10-15 minutes of the race I've been very lucky to be joined by Johnny Molam and Pipo Durrani and now by Michael Lyons who have all given me their expert insight into their respective races and their view on what's been going on so huge appreciation to all those guys and Michael um, 
you've obviously uh, enjoyed the season as it's gone along, but you've been very busy doing historic racing as well. Talk us through a little bit about some of the programmes that you've been up to recently. Yeah, well, I mean, in the couple of months we've had since the last round in Red Bull Ring, I've been flat out with the F1 car and also in the Group C. We've, we run a small family team and we're very, we're sort of quite focused. We run up to four or five cars sometimes and it's it's been great to keep my hand in and I've got to drive some amazing cars really has been. and some amazing circuits as well of course a, a victory at Monaco is not a bad thing to have on your CV is it yeah no it, that was really a dream getting to run around there is just fantastic in a Formula 1 machine with the barriers inches away from you it's, it truly is an, a completely different feeling to somewhere like say here where you have the a mass of tarmac now we see Adam Carroll now back on board. This car was so, so quick at the start of the race. It clearly got the car working very well in race form. It was Ben Barker who led for uh, most of the first part of the race until he came in to make his stop, handed over to Mike Wainwright. Mike handed the car back across to, uh, uh, to Adam Carroll. Now, Adam, let's have a look and see where he's running at the moment. He's running just behind your car. So uh, let's have a look. He's uh, some 24 seconds behind. Um, any concerns that uh, Adam might put a bit of pressure on you at this late stage? Uh, there was actually a bit of controversy between Adam and Marco in the qualifying. There were, Marco was a little bit unhappy with some of the on the slow on the slower laps and the traffic and what have you. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I, I think we should, with that kind of gap, with this kind of time to go, we should be okay because there's never normally that big a variation between between these guys. But it's also interesting to see that Ben Barker was actually seemingly the quickest guy in that car yesterday I don't know if that's tailed over to today but yeah I, th I think from chatting I purely by chance bumped into the pair of them at the hotel last night had a bit of a chat and they were both very magnanimous about it racing drivers as you know being one yourself don't like to compliment other racing drivers too often but you have to sometimes put your hands up and go yep the, the other guy's done a superb job and you know Adam is a, is a hugely experienced guy very talented driver but Ben Bark one of the younger coming men you know similar generation to yourself in terms of coming through the sport yeah he's, he's one of the guys that's been we've taken slightly different paths we're both in this championship this year I think he's missed a couple of rounds there's been some clashes with the Super Cup but he seems to be having a, a really decent year. I, th I think he won the Le Mans support race in the Super Cup. In the Super Cup. So, uh, yeah, he's definitely having a strong year. It's good to see quite a few of us young British guys coming through at the moment in GT racing and make, making a, a name for ourselves. And I think that's one of the nice things to see that, um, you know, there's this, there is this international flavour to it. It always makes it more interesting. Drivers coming from so many different backgrounds. Christian Clean that we see there coming up to pass Mikkel Mack. And Mikkel Mack having raced in uh, things like Formula 2, as did Luciana Berchetta, um, amongst other drivers. And Alex Brundle as well, another driver out there that you know very well. Again, you'll, you'll come up through the ranks at a similar sort of period. But, um, yeah, the, the, the interesting mixture with the guys like Clean and Magnussen, um, and, and Salo that are, and Beretta, all ex-Formula 1 drivers of different levels and, and what, a, what a wonderful mixture of, uh, of backgrounds and experiences to, to, to really bring this championship to life. Yeah, having, having guys like that is fantastic because it makes it more, more understandable the level that the series really is when you see guys with an F1 CV not disappearing off into this and being in amongst it but not necessarily being the quickest all the time it just shows you the level that GT racing is at nowadays and well all sports car racing including the prototypes as well it just shows you how competitive and how close all these guys are yeah exactly well you look at a guy like Andrea Bertolini who's been the uh, the ultimate pace really this year as a as an individual driver in terms of the pole position to laps that he's put in over the year so far uh, you know probably good enough to be a Formula 1 driver in his formative years. Oh, that was very marginal. <laughs> very marginal for uh, Michel Frey. And just behind that, Simon Dolan. Um, now, what's the situation between those two guys? Well, Dolan is... Uh, yeah, he's around about uh, 14 seconds behind Shulzitsky. Uh, and then uh, Capillari in the Sebastian Lopez next up, Frey. They've had some problems, so he's recovering, I think. There he is, the... SMP car, the 71 car, the car that was, we were talking about a little bit earlier with uh, Persiani on board was fastest in the GTC category. And again, there's some of these guys that um, you might not know that well, but there seems to be a lot of Italians, a lot of Russian drivers coming through. They're all of a, of a much higher standard, aren't they? Yeah, well, when you come from a British background, it's, a, it's quite a 
it's not a small scene, but you, you all kind of, everyone knows who everyone is, and there's certain people who people tend to favour and think that they're, they're great guys and everything like that. And then you come into a big championship like this in Europe and you find all these guys, when you first turn up and race, you find all these guys you've never heard of that are blisteringly quick and it just shows you how great the level is here in Europe. I suppose it shows you that you need to do what we have to do as commentators. You go and do a little bit of research into who these guys are and what they've done. Because it gives you a bit more ammunition when you're racing against them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and also it's it's very interesting as you see Francesco Castellacci there, another guy that I've been very close with, obviously in another AF Corsa car. But yeah, you see what, how they've taken, how their career paths have gone, and it's quite interesting when you get some of the the older gold drivers and stuff like that, where they've been, where they're going. And, the level they've got to it's great to pull from those guys and learn from their experience because they've got so much racecraft team in them and i guess that's one of the nice things about being in a squad like kf course that they have this wonderfully diverse mixture of drivers in there that i'm sure when you sit there and have a, a nice italian pasta lunches i'm sure that uh, they get provide you that you can you can bounce these ideas off them you're going to get that bit of an input yeah and the great thing is we're all treated perfectly fairly it's completely equal and so you can be one, one day you sit down to lunch next to a, an old Formula One driver whose son's, whose son's now made it through and the next you be sitting down with a couple of the gentleman guys. It's great and we all, all sort of pull together and it's, it really is a nice place to be. I've enjoyed it as my home for the last three or four years now. Yeah, and uh, Amato Ferrari, of course, no, no mean racing driver himself back in the day. I remember him in the Italian Super Turismo teammates, the guys like Fabrizio Giovinardi and Gary Isles. So, um, yeah, he knew how to drive a bit and now seems to be uh, doing a brilliant job as a team owner. So let's look at what's happening at the front now. Christian Clean crosses the line now with just over 16 minutes to remaining here. Uh, has got a comfortable lead over Paul-Luc Chatin in the Alpine car with Daniel Berton further back now. 13.4 seconds is the lead that uh, Clean has. Um, and then Chatin, 13.4 back. But clean has been lapping quite slowly the last few laps. So you know, remember, Michael, I said to you that he did two or three slow laps. But that seems to be the, the, the run, whether he's just been extra cautious or do they have some sort of issue with the car, do you think? Well, this is always the interesting time in the LMP2 scene because they they can't quite make it. There's an extra stop that sometimes they have to make, sometimes they don't, depending on the fuel consumption. So sometimes they can be nursing the fuel, but also I've seen a few of them have tyre failures today. So whether he's pushed his tyres too hard or whether it's a, a fuel-related thing, I'm not sure, or could even be mechanical. But a guy, a guy with that, ex, that much experience it would be very surprised to see if he was purely just having a bit of an off-run through the traffic. Yeah, well, looking at it, he's a second slower than Chatan through sector one. Let's look at what sector two does for Christian Clean. 29.2. That looks like a respectable uh, sector two time. Let's see. Yeah, 28.9. So, yeah, he's only three tenths slower than uh, Chatham, which is nothing, is it? That's just smacks to me of being. But that's really also completely straight as well. That's 90% of that sector is the back straight. So if he's saving fuel, maybe that's uh, that's what shows. Yeah. yeah. And again, look at the level of experience that Christian Clean has got. Paul of Chatham is, is experienced as well, but not to the level of Clean is, you know, all the things he's done working with Peugeot for three years at uh, LMP1 level, for example, that's going to give you such a background of every different scenario would have been worked through. And part of the endurance testing that I've done at circuits like this would have been, you're going to go round and round and round and round and, round and replicate what can happen. What about this? What about that? So he'll know all the scenarios, and that's why, um, you know, the New Blood by Maroon team will probably feel very confident that unless there is a genuine problem that we're not aware of, look, now he's gone back to doing lap times that are within a few tenths of a second of Chatan. So it pretty much looks like it's all OK. Yeah, I mean, what what tends to, you tend to find out with those, with those guys with a massive CV is usually how just how much testing they've done during the season when they've been doing development work. As we're seeing quite a good battle here between the the ART car and the Ferrari of Sizzioli. Yeah, let's have a look. That's uh, Kevin Corjus now putting pressure on Sizzioli. That is for the final podium position. So that could be quite significant. Corjus is on a bit of a mission. The oh, had a it's bit. It's gone of a, in deep, hasn't he? <laughs> he had a wobble there. That was a wake me up if there ever saw him, wasn't it, Michael? Yeah, and you've also, what we've also noticed is that McLaren has been very difficult to pass on that back straight. That's for sure. They've been super, super fast at the end there. So that's why you see him getting such a run. And I think maybe the it's very easy as a driver to get sucked in by the car in front of you and you, you get a great toe but it's easy then to try and break at the same place and 
just misjudge it slightly. Yeah, and you do wonder if that if it's that quick in a straight line whether they've compromised all of the all of the downforce to give you that sort of performance. It could be a, a factor, I guess. So um, Corjus, Spirazzioli, either of those drivers could take this final podium position, but it looks like Markozov has a 10.7 second lead with 13 minutes, so that's around about six laps to go here at uh, Paul Ricard. So Markozov in the number 73 car has done a great job uh, in this last section, the SMP racing team sharing the car with Anton Ladigan and Olivier Beretta, another former Formula One driver, of course, um, and Sparazioli and Adrian Delina have uh, likewise done a really good job of being able to be in with a shout of a podium position. But it looks like Markozov and Mack are first and second are looking settled. Now the gap between Rigolo and Kaffa at the top. Oh, 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 we might get it back into the inside. I think this is going to be very close going onto the straight. Yep. That was uh, uh, a bit of respect required by those two to not make contact, wasn't it? Yeah, it shows you the level that these guys are at. Yeah aren't they, the fact that they can give each other that little bit of racing room and resume battle straight away. Yeah, and uh, that looks now like uh, Sparazioli has just got himself a bit of a gap so he could maybe relax a little bit, but let's see if that McLaren comes back significantly down the back straight. So he doesn't look like he's making an, that much of an inroad, does he? You can see he's still in the toe though, he's not that far away, he'll still be gaining a few extra revs down there and it'll be making Sparazioli's life a bit more difficult. Yeah. Well, interestingly, just looking at some of the other things that are going on on the, on the circuit at the moment, and Daniel Berton in third position in the Murphy Prototypes car had that drive through not that long ago to set his personal fastest set to one a moment ago. Um, so clearly he's still on the mission. They have a very strong pace at the moment, actually. He's a full two, sec two and a half seconds quicker than the leader and a 1.7 quicker than P2. So he's, he's definitely got a bit between his teeth now, hasn't he? Yeah, exactly. Well, fastest lap in the uh, in the race was in the like high four, 149s not that long ago, um, and that's a combination obviously fuel load coming down, and they put some tyres on that were still working well, and the track changing. Where's the track at at the moment? Is it good or has it gone horrible and dirty f at this stage? Uh, seemingly in the LMS races, we tend to find that the last stint you get about halfway through, and it, the track just seems to light up just while the, when the tyres are about to give out and you lose that benefit of the new tyre, the track just seems to come alive and they, f they seem to be able to turn lap times when you do the last stint that no matter where you put your quickest driver, the driver that's in at the end always seems to be able to get fastest lap. Yeah, and that uh, is a combination of, of I think, uh, them understanding the cars. Obviously, you've, you've done a lot of laps by now. Now we're on 119 laps now in here, divided by three, although it's not divided equally by three. But um, that with free practice and everything else, you, you know, you, if you're not in the group by now, you're never going to be really. <laughs> yeah, well, it's also one of the trickiest things in the GTE side of things. The silver drivers tend to do, we tend to do double, two stints during the race, which makes it, means we get all the time in the race and we get very little time in the free practice. And so for us, it's like the first stint's the longest run you've ever had sort of going through the weekend. And then you've got... 40 minutes to think about it and then you're back in the car again but there's very little we can change during the race that we can do in the pit stops without losing time. Gorshu sends it up the inside into Is he going to stay on the track on the exit? Well, well that camera uh, angle doesn't really show the exit very clearly but there was a lot of moving going around in that McLaren wasn't it? And, uh, and that's what you get when you get a, uh, a young, very young single seater driver moving across Gorshu. I think he's only just 20 and uh, has been on the podium in in, uh, and winning race. Oh, now now uh, the P2 car is going to get involved and, and put not, a bit of distance between these Not two just maybe. any P2 car, they're a race leader as well. So I could imagine that they're probably a bit conscious of not getting in the way of the leader too much. He's got now, well, it's um, looking pretty comfortable now, I think, at the head of the pack for... Uh, you can tell at this stage as well, where he's in a bit of space, it's a lot more controlled. I noticed earlier in my stint, there was a couple of guys that were sending lunges with wheels locked up and... You, you'd almost have to avoid the incident as the GT car because they were really pushing on to just try and fight amongst themselves. Yeah, you kind of do the, um, uh, the old Ayrton Senna adage of choose which sort of accident you want to have, you know, uh, <laughs> which, we, which we, you don't need at this kind of level, do you? But, um, so, yeah, it's looking very much now settled. Um, we're going to say a big thank you and goodbye to Michael, who's going to go and enjoy the end of the race with the team. Looking very good for AF Corsa in the GTE class for Rigolo, for Kaffa, and of course a great job by 
uh, Mr. Chochi, who is in, in fourth place now, just before you disappear. So you've got to be pleased with that one. Yeah, and, and uh, what is it, eight seconds up, up the road to Mr. Walker? Was, oh, no, sorry. I've got the other way around. Here, right? The other way around. I was looking hopefully there, wasn't I? Yeah. But, but um, that will be, that will still be a season best result for us if we can keep it together so I'll go and see our, our guys and I'll see you all soon. Thanks Michael and thank you very much indeed for joining us and wish you all the best for the remainder of the race so as we go into the last um, eight minutes of the four hour race here at Paul Ricard let's take a moment just to reassess where we're at so Christian Clean leading overall in the um, new blood by Moran car we've seen that car on, on our camera and on screen there it is now the 43 car has been absolutely flawless driven superbly by Pierre Rags by also Gary Hirsch and of course by Christian Clean and uh, at this late stage of the race the gap just significant enough that unless there's any kind of issues then they will be in a great shape for taking their first win and it would be the fourth different victor in four races that we've seen so far um, in the ELMS series, the European Le Mans series, the first one being the Tariette by TDS team at Silverstone, then Joe to Sport at Imola, last time out, Signatech and Signatech at Alpine, and this time it looks like it's going to be around, and there's no doubt that uh, the Murphy Prototypes team will be in great shape for a potential challenge for a win at Estoril in the final round of the season. Anybody could win that. And the championship is looking like it's going to go to the wire. It does look like, and I'm going to uh, stick my neck out a little bit here, that uh, the relative position of between, uh, of between second and fifth place between Paul Chatan in the Alpine car and Simon Dolan in the Jota Sport car, that gap in terms of points, well, 18 points for second, and then it's going to be 10 points for um, fifth position, so an eight-point swing which means it's going to be a 12-point advantage that the Alpine team will have going into the final round. But as we've seen, it's just so fiercely competitive that absolutely anything can happen. But even if Jota Sport won the race, they'd still have to count on Alpine finishing further down the order for it to be a possible win for them to uh, go with their Le Mans win that they had back in June. Meanwhile, for the LMGTE teams and drivers, well, they, of course, are looking incredibly strong at the top of that particular um, championship. Looking down at, to see what's happening with the other situations, uh, according to drivers, first of all. Well, it does look like the Matt Griffin, Michele Rigolo and uh, Duncan Cameron car is going to potentially come away with maximum points, the 25 points that they would take from this is going to enhance their championship because second in the se in the series is, a, is a Andrea Bertolini. Adam Carroll just pits now from a uh, sixth position in class. That's presumably for a late splash and dash. Very late in the day to have any kind of issues in terms of um, potentially Mechanical, maybe, hopefully not. There is a, uh, uh, sorry, Panchatichi looking across. No, uh, Shatan, sorry, Panchatichi in the car earlier. So that means that uh, next in the championship, Michele Regalo, 50 points. So, of course, it's part of the same thing. Let's have a look. So, Mackenzie JMW, uh, it's going to mean that uh, that uh, championship lead is going to increase quite significantly. Uh, I don't think it can be settled because there's obviously 25 points for a win available. These guys have driven so superbly all day. Ricardo, uh, Rodolfo Gonzalez, Pipo Durrani in his debut in sports car racing. Thank you, Pipo, for joining us a bit earlier. And this man here, Nathaniel Berton. Meanwhile, Mark Schulzitski and uh, Luciano Bacchetta. Well, they have done a, a very solid, very consistent set of, uh, of laps. Fourth for them is going to be a solid result. I think they're going to be pretty pleased with in the exalted competition a little bit further back you just see uh, Simon Dolan coming across the line now is he in a position to close down or not let's have a look I don't think so four seconds it's possible uh, lap times wise let's have a look Dolan 53.059.154 well there's only going to be a couple of laps left here at Paul Ricard I think they're going to run out of time but it looks like uh, Rigolo is going to be taking 
the position ahead of Kaffa and then James Walker, the JMW team, potentially on for a podium here. That would be a superb result for those guys. They have looked solid all weekend. Marco Ciocci sharing with, of course, uh, Pez Giuseppe per Perazzini. Natalia Berton, interestingly, has just set the fastest sector two of anyone in the whole race. As you see, Pierre Rags, understandably looking very nervous with just under three minutes remaining. I think it's the balance of this lap plus one more. And then they will see the chequered flag at the end of what has been a superb race for them. Really have been super consistent. Made the best of uh, the traffic as well, but they just were, from the beginning of the race, they just looked like they had plenty to give in terms of performance. They've been quick throughout in free practice. Yesterday afternoon, they were fastest qualifying, not quite as quick as perhaps they would have liked to have been, but still were uh, in in the mix they were in the in the front two rows of the grid which is all you all you need to be able to do basically and as they sweep down through this final sector of the lap coming towards the line for what i think will be the penultimate time uh, with just under a minute and 50 seconds remaining are there any other potential changes going gonna go on no all of the positions i think are set for uh, corjusers as you saw, got himself into that final podium position. That's going to be a good result for ART. It's looking likely it's going to be clean. It's going to be Chatan and Berton, the top three in the LMP2 classes. So that would be uh, New Blood by Moran as they cross the line now with a minute and 26 seconds. This is surely going to be the final lap of the race here at Paul Ricard. In second position and third will be Nathaniel Berton in the Murphy prototype. So a podium at least for those guys is going to be a, a tremendous achievement. Um, then Michaela Regolo, Duncan Cameron and Matt Griffin looking good for GTA in eighth overall as well ahead of Pierre Kaffer. And, uh, and a, a remarkable performance by Mirko Venturi coming in literally this morning to drive the car to help towards the second place and of course the other guy in there, Alexander Telpinista, and then James Walker, George Richardson, and of course Daniel McKenzie. Superb performance by those guys for third position. It's Markozov leading David Markozov in the SMP car, the 73 car, sharing with Anton Ladigin and with Olivier Beretta. Second place in that class is going to be Johnny Larson, Mikkel Mack, and it's going to be uh, Jan Magnussen. And then Kevin Corjus in the uh, Art Grand Prix car. And he's sharing with Gregor de Moustier and Jan Goody. So this is it, coming through the last section of the lap now. Christian Klein, a veteran of Formula One, a veteran of Le Mans with Peugeot, and now has found a nice home with the guys at New Blood by Moran. They go past the Team Russia by Barwell. They sweep into the right hand and punching up through the gears. Gets a bit of a slide on. Watch for him to punch here. Watch for the delight for the team. A victory for Christian Klein. Wins here at uh, Paul Ricard, the fourth round of the European Le Mans series. Christian Klein, Gary Hirsch, and Pierre Rags for New Blood by Moran. What a superb performance by him. Crossing the line a little bit further back, there's the Murphy Prototypes car of Nathaniel Berton. And that's what it means to these guys. Gary Hirsch there, the young man in the middle of the picture. And now, uh, Benoit Morin there, absolutely delighted. The boys have worked very, very hard and done a superb job. There is the car that's going to win the GTC category. David Markozov, Anton Ladigin and Olivier Barretta will take victory here in the GTC class. Absolutely brilliant performance by those guys to get the job done. We've seen victories uh, in, the, in the class in GTC. 
by the Lawson Mack and Puccini car. We've also seen other victories throughout the order. But that's a great performance by SMP. That's going to mean an awful lot to them. As the uh, rest of the car starts to cross the line, there is a Jota Sport car. I think Simon Dolan uh, managed to get partial Zitski at the end. So that's interesting. Simon Dolan made himself up into fourth position. And that is super important for the. Uh, the Jota Sport team because that gives them a, just a little bit more of a chance of being able to close down on the Alpine team going into the final round. That means that Bertrand, uh, sorry, Paul Luc Chatin would have taken 18 points. Dolan would have taken uh, 12 points. So a six point swing instead of an eight point swing. That could be super, super important. But wow, a breathless race from start to finish. All four hours have created some fabulous racing, some side-by-side -side action, some wheel banging, some uh, accidents and some mechanical dramas, a bit of um, joy and a bit of pain. And there is the joy. Duncan Cameron, Matt Griffin, Michele Rigolo looking so, so good for a championship win now. Matt Griffin, well, the current LMGTE champion with Ram Racing, sharing with Johnny Molum last year, could be on for a double. What a performance that would be for Griffin. If you want to win, get a Griffin, basically. That's kind of one way of looking at it. Oh, excuse my terrible puns. But uh, for us here at uh, Ball Ricard, it's been a exciting weekend's racing, some tremendous action throughout. And uh, there's no doubt that across the order, these guys will have uh, really given it absolutely everything they've got to try and get the results. And I think there'll be some teams there that are going to be thoroughly, thoroughly delighted by the performances of their drivers. Beretta, well, we've seen him be so successful in sports car racing over the years. Uh, a former um, GT2 champion uh, in uh, world championship in, uh, for the um, Viper team. As you see a very sexy French shot there. And... Uh, I don't think Christian Clean is going to be too concerned. Not only has he won the race, but he's got a remarkably, <laughs> remarkably stunning girlfriend, as you'd expect for a Formula One type driver. He's going to be delighted with that. Chatan has been superbly fast. And Clean clambers out of the car, unplugs the radio, checks everything's all back where it needs to be. Gonzalez gives him a congratulations and says, Well done, Christian. The diminutive figure of Christian Clean punches the air in delight plugs the uh, radio cable back onto the top of his crush helmet and a uh, quick shake of fans there from the uh, Murphy prototypes guys as Bertrand well he can see how annoyed he was at that drive through Pippo Durrani who joined us earlier on took a bit of time to come and have a chat with us and tell us what's been going on he said wouldn't it be lovely to get a podium on my debut well he's done it um, they've done it as a team. I think they may well have even had second place. Whether they would have been able to challenge for the win, I think perhaps the uh, new blood by Moran Carr was just a little bit too strong today. But either or, it's been an outstanding performance, and I'm sure we'll get a chance to hear the thoughts of some of our drivers from Kareem when she gets a chance to catch up with them. And the Austrian driver. Well, there goes to see Gary Hirsch. One of his co-drivers well and the rest of the guys from the team. <laughs> and that's what they do it for. That's what everybody goes racing for to get those results. But no, I'm around. I think he's uh, he's got his Dunlop cap on already. I hope he's. Uh, oh, I expect he's going to go up to the podium as a winning team. Photographers uh, say congratulations. And uh, for Christian one of those races where he had a lot of the work done for him early on but still had to deliver in this very difficult latter stages of the race had to really be thoughtful of it you could see just how hard they were having to work in terms of making sure they managed the traffic correctly because that could have gone wrong very very easily so down in the pits we have Corinne and she is catching up with our race winner Christian Klein. 
Christian, clean with me. Yeah, uh, Christian, yeah. your pace was strong. It was almost a blessing when Murphy's boys got the drive-through. You could <laughs> away and cruise. So, congratulations. Yeah, well, uh, we waited a very long time for this win. Uh, basically, since one year, we were uh, in Imola, very close uh, to win the race. But finally, it's great for Moro Racing for the whole team uh, to finally get uh, you know the first step on the podium. And yeah, it wasn't an easy race, especially uh, in the end of the race. I did a double stint on the tire on the hard one, and it was quite tricky to manage the tires towards the end of the race. And the Alpine car was actually quite fast catching us, so I had to, I had to watch the gap a bit. But you know, I was it was quite a release when I went over the start, over the finish line. Thank you, the winner of LMP2. So you could see how much it means to not just to Christian, but also to the whole team who have clearly put an awful lot of time and effort into it. And there's the moment that they cross the line. And you can see the boys punching the air, all of the mechanics and engineers and everyone else that's involved with the team. They put such a lot of work. When you uh, wander around uh, behind the pits after qualifying or after practice sessions, and you can see just the remorseless effort that goes in for all of the teams here. Every single single member of the team personnel has to put such a huge amount of effort. The level of professionalism is of the very highest order and uh, it's rewarded when you have days like that. And that's why the cars are reliable. That's why the cars are fast because the team do the job that they do. And um, whether it's the race engineers or the mechanics or the drivers or whoever it might be, they're all absolutely committed to getting a result for these guys. It's very, very resigned to Daniel Berton on the left, the tall figure of Berton, the much smaller figures of Gary Hirsch and of uh, Pipo Durrani on the right. And then you see Ollie Webb just a little bit further back. He'll be pleased with that second place. That's really good for their championship, uh, especially finishing obviously ahead of Joe to Sport. Gonzalez there in the middle. You can see he's just a bit more kind of, well, it's what it is. These things happen. The Alpine guys coming through and say, uh, well done. Philippe Sino, no, of the Signatech team. Saying well done to Paul Loup Chatin. Rax, <laughs> of course, has uh, driven with them in the past, I think. But that's uh, a well-earned drink for Christian Clean. He was uh, super professional in that stint. Did look like he had it all under control, but at the same time had to do the job and get it done. And then just in a moment, we'll get a chance to see these guys get their rewards, get their podiums, get their trophies. And there's going to be a lot of these guys that will be taking those back to their homes with big, big smiles on their faces and rightly so, thoroughly deserved it. So, third position going up to the podium now. Good for Gonzalez, Pipo Durrani and Nathaniel Berton. Third place for the LMP2 category. Here in the middle, a big cheer from the Murphy prototypes guys. Paul Grogan in the blue glasses there and just in front of him, team boss Greg Murphy. The rest of the guys. Then Paul up Chatin, Oliver Webb and Nelson Panchitici. Good old selfie, look at that on the right hand side that Ted Berton's taking. That's a great thing to do, take a selfie on the podium. Tweet that one a little bit later on boys. And there's our race winners. And on the in the white suit it is Pierre Rags in the middle. It is Gary Hirsch and on the right as we look at it, of course, it is uh, Christian Klee. Here at the National Anthems. Voilà, mesdames et messieurs. So there we go, Paul Lipschatan, Oliver Webb, Nelson Panchitici on the left. On the right, Pipo Durrani, Rodolfo Gonzalez, and Natania Bertone in the middle, Pierre Rags. The little, uh, little Swiss souvenir being popped up there by 
Harry Hirsch, Swiss driver driving for a Swiss team, going to be pleased with that. And some very nice trophies for these guys to take. That gives them an additional challenge of how they're going to get their home on the plane. <laughs> Flying back to their respective countries. I'm sure most of them will uh, think of a way. Always leave a bit of extra space in your suitcase. Think positively. <laughs> Then the exciting bit comes for the guys at the end of all this is to pop the champagne and drown the rest of the crew. Benoit gets uh, champagne down the back of his race suit. I don't think he'll really mind. In fact, I know he won't mind. <laughs> and uh, as uh, somebody once said to me, there's nothing better than uh, when you're packing your race kit away as a driver and, you've, and it smells of champagne because you know you've done your job. You've had the result that you set out to do, all that work, all that time and effort. And as the great Michael Schumacher once famously said, you do a lot more losing than you do winning in this game. So when you win, make sure you enjoy it. And uh, he did a fair bit more win winning than most people. I wish him all the very, very best for his recovery, of course. So anyway, um, it's going to throw up some very interesting possibilities for this final race at Estoril in the middle of uh, October. Just about a month's time. We've got time for the teams to go away and regroup and consider what they need to do, maybe do some testing. So now I think we're going to get a chance to see the GTE podium for the guys that have done a superb job in their class and for a team that have got literally one hand on the championship trophy. So there you go, George Richardson. Daniel McKenzie and James Walker. So Daniel on the left, George in the middle, James on the right as you look at it. They're going to be delighted with that. The JMW team have done a superb job. In second place, Alexander Talkanista, the man with the moustache there. On the left, Mirko Venturi coming in at the last minute. Super sub. And then in the middle, Pierre Kaffer. But the race win goes to the long-haired figure of Duncan Cameron and to their AF Corsa compatriots, Michele Regolo and Matt Griffin. So Cameron in the middle, Griffin on the right, and Regolo on the left of the guys in the on the top step of the podium. And we hear the Italian national anthem for the winning team. So as you can see, Talcanista, a Belarusian driver on the left with Venturi from Italy and Kaffa. There, our second place finishes on the right. It's an all British podium of Mackenzie, Richardson and Walker. Although Walker technically is a Jerseyman, not an Englishman. So he's going to be much more proud to, to represent Jersey. And then in the middle, the Irishman, Matt Griffin, the Englishman, Duncan Cameron and the Italian, Michele Rogolo. Oh, a really close knit team, eh? of course. Of course, we had um, Michael Lyons, who drives with Michael Ciocci and Pier Giuseppe Perugini, Perugini rather, um, come up and talk to us a little bit earlier. And really highlighting just what a close knit and well structured team Amato Ferrari's eh? of course, a team up. And they really have been the team to beat in international sports car racing with regards to these guys for some time now. So a bit more champagne time, a bit more of a soaking. They of course uh, team, team boss definitely going to get it this time isn't they? That's not Amato Ferrari, one of his other guys are up there. 
Merci messieurs. On va vous rejoindre aussi pour euh, la presse conférence avec les impressions des leaders qui nous donneront euh, leur parcours et comment ils ont réussi à construire cette victoire pilotée, on l'a dit, par euh, l'AF Corsé numéro 55 pour Duncan Cameron. Je ne sais pas combien de trophées Matt Griffith a dans son trophée cabinet maintenant. C'est un succès pour le driver de race. Et c'est un truc brillant de voir aussi. Il a passé par un très, très... Very tough time many years ago. I had a horrible accident whilst as a, a race instructor, which looked like it was maybe going to finish his career or worse. And uh, not only did he bounce back from that uh, terrible situation, but also has just built his career onwards and upwards and uh, works brilliantly with Duncan Cameron amongst other drivers. And so always superb to see as Kaffa wanders away. Former GT Open champion Pierre Kaffa. And here is the winning car, the 73 SMP racing car of David Markozov, Anton Ladigin and Olivier Beretta from Monaco. Great performance by them. Second will be Mikkel Mack, Jan Magnussen and Johnny Larson in the Formula Racing car, the Danish entered Ferrari. And third, and the only McLaren up there, Kevin Corjus, sharing with Gerard de Moustier and Jan Goody. So as they go to the podium, there you can see on the right-hand side, the ART guys. Corjus on the left. And the other two guys just to the right of them. And there we see Johnny Larson coming up with uh, Miguel Mack and with Jan Magnussen. I think we all know Jan Magnussen. And great to see that... Uh, the kids are out there as well. What a lovely experience for them, something to remember forever. And it's good that the ALMS guys are, are, are kind enough to let that happen because you can't imagine so, some, uh, some teams doing that or some uh, organisations doing that. SP guys getting another little one up there to enjoy the team boss up there as well as Olivier Beretta comes to the podium and we are about to hit the National Anthem of Russia. So, at the end of a, a very, very demanding race, and that, that lead changed a fair few times. It was up and down throughout. Did a superb uh, job by the SMP guys to get the result that they got. See Jérôme Mondan handing out the uh, awards. All of the cars, of course, running on Michelin tyres in this class. Very much about the uh, Dunlops being the mainstay for the LMP2. For the GT classes, this Michelin. Uh, Michelin represented in, uh, in the LMP2 by Sebastian Loeb Racing, but they are their lone entrant, focusing on the GT tyres. And of course, they also provided the winning tyres at Le Mans for Audi. So clearly, they still have their place at the very top of sports car heritage, as it were, in terms of tyre performance. Pour avoir encore euh, aux couleurs de la musique, mais aussi euh, de quelques jus, simplement l'impression de dominer encore l'élément et de passer quelques instants avec nous de rêve. Jusqu'à 20h donc, où vous aurez sûrement la chance de côtoyer quelques pilotes qui viendront nous rejoindre. Pour le reste, nous vous souhaitons une très très bonne fin de journée. So now, <laughs> the kids get a little bit of a soaking as well. 
Classification just for the P2 class. Um, the interesting ones being uh, Signatech and Jota Sport, first and second in the championship. For the GTE, well, it is, of course, so once again with Griffin, 9.22 seconds it was in the end. So not much breathing space, but you only have to win by it. a nose and you've still won, so job done. And then again, just confirmation of the GTC SP Racing had a Formula Racing Art Grand Prix. SP again, another couple of AF Corsa cars. The first of the Porsches in seventh ahead of Alex Brundle and his teammates in the uh, in eighth position in class. So we then go off to the final race of the year with a 10 point difference between Panchatichi, Webb, Chatan, and Albuquerque, Tinkle, and Dolan. Further back, just eight points further back is Clean and Hirsch. And then Mayor, another five points behind that. That is the remainder of the drivers uh, who have finished in the points thus far in 2014. Great mixture of drivers and, of course, of um, nationalities, as you can see. James Walker was on the podium today. Of course, as, uh, was on the podium uh, Sorry, was in the points, rather, earlier in the year, driving for the Murphy Prototypes team. So, this is what it looks like. Duncan Cameron, Matt Griffin, lead Regolo by uh, six points. And then a further 15 points is Bertolini. So, 21 points now. It's going to mean that Bertolini is going to have to win with pole position and the... Cameron and Griffin Carr not to finish at all for them to have a chance of winning the championship. So looking very, very good. A solid result. It, all they need. And if they finish ahead of the Bertolini car, then it's definitely job done. So for the final of the uh, categories, of course, it is... The GTC class, let's have a look at how the points look in that particular category to round out the three classes that we've had here at Paul Ricard this weekend. Leading the championship is Anton Ladigan, David Markozov and Olivier Beretta. They lead by uh, 18 and a half points ahead of Lawson and Mikkel Mack. And then Basov, Ladigan and Persiani a further few points behind. And a much, much bigger and more mixed up section of drivers that we've got. Lots of different guys that you'll recognise there. Puccini being one. Cocker another one. Of course, Castellacci. Christophe Bure. Belloc, very well-known driver as well. Olivier Lombard, a former Le Mans winner. And then Mika Sala, of course, didn't finish this race. Maxime Soule has been a race winner in GT Open this year. And uh, as I said, wonderful mixture of drivers. So that gives you an indication of where we're at with the driver's points. Here's the team situation. Ten points in it between Signatech, Alpine and Jota Sport. Uh, with New Blood by Morant a further eight points behind. The GTA, AF Corsa, yeah, that's the Griffin Cameron car and uh, Rigolo. 21 points ahead of the SMP car of uh, Bertolini. And then JMW Motorsport, an excellent third position for Jim McWhorter and the rest of the crew. 
And then SMP by uh, 18 and a half points ahead of Formula Racing and the other SMP car a further five and a half points back from out Grand Prix in fourth and fifth. So from us here at Paul Ricard, from everyone at the ELMS, thank you so much for joining us. We've had a fabulous day's racing and we look forward to seeing you again very soon in a few weeks at SRL for the deciding round of the championship. From me, Simon Hill, and from everyone else here, thanks for joining us and goodbye. <laughs>